Harper Audio presents Marley and Me, written and read by John Grogan. Preface The Perfect Dog. In the summer of 1967, when I was 10 years old, my father caved in to my persistent pleas and took me to get my own dog. Together, we drove in the family station wagon far into the Michigan countryside to a farm run by a rough-hewn woman and her ancient mother. The farm produced just one commodity, dogs. Dogs of every imaginable size and shape and age and temperament. They had only two things in common. Each was a mongrel of unknown and indistinct ancestry, and each was free to a good home. We were at a mutt ranch. I immediately raced to the puppy cage. You want to pick one that's not timid, my father coached. Try rattling the cage and see which ones aren't afraid. I grabbed the chain link gate and yanked on it with a loud clang. The dozen or so puppies reeled backward, collapsing on top of one another in a squiggling heap of fur. Just one remained. He was gold with a white blaze on his chest, and he charged the gate, yapping fearlessly. He jumped up and excitedly licked my fingers through the fencing. It was love at first sight. I brought him home in a cardboard box and named him Sean. He was one of those dogs that give dogs a good name. He effortlessly mastered every command I taught him and was naturally well-behaved. I could drop a crust on the floor, and he would not touch it until I gave the okay. He came when I called him and stayed when I told him to. We could leave him alone in the house, confident he wouldn't have an accident or disturb a thing. He walked beside me without a leash. Perhaps best of all, I trained him to pull me through the neighborhood dog sled style as I sat on my bicycle, making me the hands-down envy of my friends. Never once did he lead me into hazard. He was with me when I smoked my first cigarette, and my last, and when I kissed my first girl. He was right there beside me in the front seat when I snuck out my older brother's Corvair for my first joyride. Born with the curse of uncertain lineage, he was one of the tens of thousands of unwanted dogs in America. Yet by some stroke of almost providential good fortune, he became wanted. He came into my life and I into his, and in the process he gave me the childhood every kid deserves. The love affair lasted fourteen years, and by the time he died I was no longer the little boy who had brought him home on that summer day. I was a man out of college and working across the state in my first real job. My parents, by then retired, called to break the bad news to me. My mother would later tell me, In fifty years of marriage, I've only seen your father cry twice. The first time was when we lost Mary Ann, my sister who was stillborn. The second time was the day Sean died. St. Sean of my childhood. He was a perfect dog. At least that's how I will always remember him. It was Sean who set the standard by which I would judge all other dogs to come. Chapter 1, and Puppy Makes Three. We were young, we were in love, we were rollicking in those sublime early days of marriage when life seemed about as good as life can get. We could not leave well enough alone. And so on a January evening in 1991, my wife of 15 months and I ate a quick dinner together and headed off to answer a classified ad in the Palm Beach Post. Why we were doing this, I wasn't quite sure. A few weeks earlier, I had awoken just after dawn to find Jenny sitting in her bathrobe at the glass table on the screen porch of our little bungalow, bent over the newspaper with a pen in her hand. There was nothing unusual about the scene. Not only was the Palm Beach Post our local paper, it was also the source of half our household income. We were a two-newspaper couple. Jenny worked as a feature writer in the Post Accent section. I was a news reporter at the competing paper in the area, the South Florida Sun Sentinel. 
based an hour south in Fort Lauderdale. We began every morning poring over the newspapers, seeing how our stories were played and how they stacked up to the competition. But on this morning, Jenny's nose was in the classified section. When I stepped closer, I saw she was feverishly circling beneath the heading, Pets, Dogs. Ah, I said in that new husband, still treading gently voice, is there something I should know? It's that dumb plant, the one we killed. The one we killed? I wasn't about to press the point, but for the record, it was the plant that I bought and she killed. I had surprised her with it one night, a lovely large Deffenbachia with emerald and cream variegated leaves. I'd given it to her for no reason other than to say, isn't married life great? She had adored both the gesture and the plant and promptly went on to nurture the poor thing to death. Working on the assumption that all living things require water, but apparently forgetting that they also need air, she began flooding the Deffenbachia on a daily basis. The sicker the plant got, the more she doused it, until finally it just kind of melted into an oozing heap. I looked at its limp skeleton in the pot by the window and thought, man, someone who believes in omens could have a field day with this one. Now here she was, somehow making the cosmic leap of logic, from dead flora in a pot to living fauna in the pet classifieds. Kill a plant, buy a puppy. I looked more closely at the newspaper in front of her and saw that one ad in particular seemed to have caught her fancy. She had drawn three fat red stars beside it. It read, Lab, puppies, yellow, AKC purebred, all shots, parents on premises. So, can you run this plant pet thing by me one more time? You know, I tried so hard and look what happened. I can't even keep a stupid house plan alive. If I can't even keep a plan alive, how am I ever going to keep a baby alive? The baby thing, as I called it, was getting bigger by the day. When we had first met at a small newspaper in western Michigan, she was just a few months out of college, and serious adulthood still seemed a far distant concept. For both of us, it was our first professional job out of school. We ate a lot of pizza, drank a lot of beer, and gave exactly zero thought to the possibility of someday being anything other than young, single, unfettered consumers of pizza and beer. But years passed. We had barely begun dating when various job opportunities and a one-year postgraduate program for me pulled us in different directions across the eastern United States. By the time we both landed together in South Florida and tied the knot, she was nearly 30. Her friends were having babies. That once seemingly eternal window of procreative opportunity was slowly lowering. I leaned over her from behind, wrapped my arms around her shoulders, and kissed the top of her head. It's okay. But I had to admit she raised a good question. Neither of us had ever really nurtured a thing in our lives. A little smile broke out on Jenny's face. I thought maybe a dog would be good practice. As we drove through the darkness, heading northwest out of town where the suburbs of West Palm Beach fade into sprawling country properties, I thought through our decision to bring home a dog. It was a huge responsibility, especially for two people with full-time jobs. Yet we knew what we were in for. We'd both grown up with dogs and loved them immensely. I'd had St. Sean, and Jenny had had St. Winnie, her family's beloved English setter. When we were dating, long before children ever came on our radar, we spent hours discussing our childhood pets, how much we miss them, and how we long someday, once we had a house to call our own and some stability in our lives, to own a dog again. Now we had both. We were together in a place we did not plan to leave any time soon, and we had a house to call our very own. It was a perfect little house on a perfect little quarter-acre fenced lot, just right for a dog, and the location was just right, too, a funky city neighborhood one and a half blocks off the intercoastal waterway separating West Palm Beach from the rarefied mansions of Palm Beach. 
At the foot of our street, Churchill Road, a linear green park and paved trail stretched for miles along the waterfront. It was ideal for jogging and bicycling and rollerblading, and more than anything, for walking a dog. The house was built in the 1950s and had an old Florida charm. A fireplace, rough plaster walls, big airy windows, and French doors leading to our favorite space of all, the screened back porch. The yard was a little tropical haven filled with palms and bromeliads and avocado. Dominating the property was a towering mango tree. Each summer it dropped its heavy fruit with loud thuds that sounded somewhat grotesquely, like bodies being thrown off the roof. We would lie awake in bed and listen. Thud, thud, thud. Once we got the joint just right, of course, it only made sense that we bring home a large four legged roommate with sharp toenails, large teeth, and exceedingly limited English language skills to start tearing it apart again. Slow down, Dingo, or you're going to miss it, Jenny scolded. It should be coming up any second. We were driving through inky blackness across what had once been swampland, drained after World War II for farming, and later colonized by suburbanites seeking a country lifestyle. Our headlights soon illuminated a mailbox marked with the address we were looking for. I turned up a gravel drive that led into a large wooded property with a pond in front of the house and a small barn out back. At the door, a middle aged woman named Lori greeted us. A big, placid, yellow Labrador retriever by her side. This is Lily, the proud mama, Lori said after we introduced ourselves. We both got on our knees and she happily accepted our affection. She was just what we pictured a lab would be sweet natured, affectionate, calm, and breathtakingly beautiful. Where's the father? I asked. Oh, she hesitated for just a fraction of a second. Sammy boy? He's around here somewhere. I imagine you're dying to see the puppies. She led us through the kitchen out to a utility room. In one corner was a low box lined with old beach towels and filled with nine tiny yellow puppies stumbling all over one another as they clamored to check out the latest strangers to drop by. Jenny gasped. Oh, my! I don't think I've ever seen anything so cute in my life. We sat on the floor and let the puppies climb all over us. The deal I had struck with Jenny when I agreed to come was that we would check the pups out, ask some questions, and keep an open mind as to whether we were ready to bring home a dog. Thirty seconds into it, there was no question that before the night was through, one of these puppies would be ours. Lori was a backyard breeder, motivated more by love of the breed than by profit. She owned just one female and one male. They had come from distinct bloodlines, and she had the paper trail to prove it. This would be Lily's second and final litter before she retired to the good life of a countrified family pet. The litter consisted of five females, all but one of which already had deposits on them, and four males. Lori was asking $400 for the remaining female and $375 for the males. One of the males seemed particularly smitten with us. He was the goofiest of the group and charged into us, somersaulting into our laps and clawing his way up our shirts to lick our faces. He gnawed on our fingers with surprisingly sharp baby teeth and stomped clumsy circles around us on giant, tawny paws that were way out of proportion to the rest of his body. That one there, you can have for three fifty. Jenny is a rabid bargain hunter. I saw her eyes brighten. Ah, oh, honey, the little guy's on clearance. I had to admit, he was pretty darn adorable. Frisky, too. Before I realized what he was up to, the rascal had half my watch band chewed off. We have to do the scare test, I said. Many times before, I had recounted for Jenny the story of picking out Sean when I was a boy. I stood up, turned away from the puppies, then swung quickly back around, taking a sudden, exaggerated step toward them. I stopped my foot and barked out, Hey! None seemed too concerned by this stranger's contortions. But only one plunged forward to meet the assault head on. It was Clarence Dog. 
He plowed full steam into me, throwing a cross body block across my ankles and pouncing at my shoelaces as though convinced they were dangerous enemies that needed to be destroyed. I think it's fate, Jenny said. You think? I said, scooping him up and holding him in one hand in front of my face, studying his mug. He looked at me with heart melting brown eyes and then nibbled my nose. I plopped him into Jenny's arms where he did the same to her. He certainly seems to like us, I said. And so it came to be. We wrote Lori a check for $350, and she told us we could return to take Clarence Dog home with us in three weeks when he was eight weeks old and weaned. Just as we were reaching the car, we heard a commotion coming from the woods. Something was crashing through the brush and breathing very heavily. It sounded like what you might hear in a slasher film. And it was coming our way. We froze, staring into the darkness. The sound grew louder and closer. Then, in a flash, the thing burst into the clearing and came charging in our direction a yellow blur. A very big yellow blur. As it galloped past, not stopping, not even seeming to notice us, we could see it was a large Labrador retriever. But it was nothing like the sweet lily we had just cuddled with inside. This one was soaking wet and covered up to its belly in mud and burrs. Its tongue hung out wildly to one side, and froth flew off its jowls as it barreled past. In the split second glimpse I got, I detected an odd, slightly crazed, yet somehow joyous gaze in its eyes. It was as though this animal had just seen a ghost and couldn't possibly be more tickled about it. Then, with the roar of a stampeding herd of buffalo, it was gone, around the back of the house and out of sight. Jenny let out a little gasp. I think, I said, a slight queasiness rising in my gut, we've just met Dad. Chapter 2 Running with the Blue Bloods. Our first official act as dog owners was to have a fight. It began on the drive home from the breeders and continued in fits and snippets through the next week. We could not agree on what to name our clearance dog. Jenny shot down my suggestions and I shot down hers. The battle culminated one morning before we left for work. Chelsea, I said, that is such a chick name. No boy dog would be caught dead with the name Chelsea. Hunter, Hunter is perfect. You're kidding, right? What are you, on some macho sportsman trip? Way too masculine. Besides, you've never hunted a day in your life. What's wrong with Louie? Nothing if you're a gas station attendant. Hey, watch it. That's my grandfather's name. As we fought, Jenny absently walked to the stereo and pushed the play button on the tape deck. It was one of her marital combat strategies. The lilting reggae strains of Bob Marley began to pulse through the speakers, having an almost instant mellowing effect on us both. We had only discovered the late Jamaican singer when we moved to South Florida from Michigan. In the white bread backwaters of the upper Midwest, we'd been fed a steady diet of Bob Seeger and John Cougar Mellencamp. But here in the pulsing ethnic stew that was South Florida, Bob Marley's music, even a decade after his death, was everywhere. We heard it as we sipped Cafes Cubanos in Little Havana and ate Jamaican jerk chicken in little holes in the wall in the dreary immigrant neighborhoods west of Fort Lauderdale. We fell in love with his music for what it was, but also for what it defined, which was that moment in our lives when we ceased being two and became one. Bob Marley was the soundtrack for our new life together in this strange, exotic, rough-and-tumble place. And now, through the speakers, Marley's voice filled the room, repeating the chorus over and over, Is this love that I'm feeling? And at the exact same moment, in perfect unison, as if we had rehearsed it for weeks, we both shouted, Marley! I tried it on for size. Marley, come! Marley, stay! Good boy, Marley. Hey, I think it works, I said. Jenny did too. Our fight was over. We had our new puppy's name.
The next night after dinner, I came into the bedroom where Jenny was reading and said, "I think we need to spice the name up a little." I had been reading the registration papers from the American Kennel Club. As a purebred Labrador Retriever with both parents properly registered, Marley was entitled to AKC registration as well. This was only really needed if you planned to show or breed your dog, in which case there was no more important piece of paper. For a house pet, however, it was superfluous. But I had big plans for our Marley. This dog was the closest to blue blood I would ever get, and I wasn't about to pass up whatever opportunities it offered. Let's say we want to enter him in competition. Have you ever seen a champion dog with just one name? They always have big, long titles, like Sir Dartworth of Cheltenham, and his master, Sir Dorkshire of West Palm Beach. Jenny said, and went back to her reading. The next morning, after a late night of brainstorming, I cornered her at the bathroom sink. I came up with the perfect name. She looked at me skeptically. Hit me. Brogans, majestic, Marley of Churchill. Man, I thought, does that sound regal? Man, Jenny said, does that sound dumb? I didn't care. I was the one handling the paperwork, and I had already written in the name in ink. When Grogan's majestic Marley of Churchill took top honors at the Westminster Kennel Club Dog Show in a few years, and I gloriously trotted him around the ring before an adoring international television audience, we'd see who would be laughing. Chapter Three, Homeward Bound. While we counted down the days until we could bring Marley home, I belatedly began reading up on Labrador retrievers. I say belatedly because virtually everything I read gave the same strong advice: before buying a dog, make sure you thoroughly research the breed so you know what you're getting into. Oops. An apartment dweller, for instance, probably wouldn't do well with a Saint Bernard. A family with young children might want to avoid the sometimes unpredictable Chow Chow. A couch potato looking for a lap dog to idle the hours away in front of the television. Would likely be driven insane by a border collie, which needs to run and work to be happy. I was embarrassed to admit that Jenny and I had done almost no research before settling on a Labrador Retriever. We chose the breed on one criterion alone: curb appeal. We often had admired them with their owners down on the intracoastal waterway bike trail, big, dopey, playful galumphs that seemed to love life with a passion not often seen in this world. Even more embarrassing, our decision was influenced not by the complete dog book, the Bible of dog breeds published by the American Kennel Club, or by any other reputable guide. It was influenced by The Far Side by Gary Larson. We were huge fans of the cartoon. Larson filled his panels with witty, urbane labs doing and saying the darndest things. Labs were immensely amusing animals, at least in Larson's hands. And who couldn't use a little more amusement in life? We were sold. Now, as I poured through more serious works on the Labrador Retriever, I was relieved that the literature was filled with glowing testimonials about the Labrador Retriever's loving, even-keeled personality, its gentleness with children, its lack of aggression, and its desire to please. All this boded well for a pet in a home that would sooner or later likely include children. Quite by accident, we had stumbled upon a breed America could not get enough of. All those happy dog owners couldn't be wrong, could they? And yet the literature was filled with ominous caveats. Labs were bred as working dogs intended to have boundless energy. They were highly social and did not do well left alone for long periods. They could be thick-skulled and difficult to train. They needed rigorous daily exercise, or they could become destructive. Some were wildly excitable and hard for even experienced dog handlers to control. They had what could seem like eternal puppyhood, stretching three years or more. The long, exuberant adolescence required extra patience from owners. And then I came across the sentence that struck fear in my heart: "The parents may be one of the best indications of the future temperament of your new puppy." A surprising amount of behavior is inherited. 
My mind flashed back to the frothing, mud-caked banshee that came charging out of the woods the night we picked out our puppy. The book counseled to insist, whenever possible, on seeing both the dam and the sire. My mind flashed back again, this time to the breeder's ever-so-slight hesitation when I asked where the father was. Oh, he's around here somewhere. And then the way she quickly changed the topic. It was all making sense. I said a silent prayer that Marley had inherited his mother's disposition. A week before we were to bring our dog home, Jenny's sister Susan called from Boston. She, her husband, and their two children planned to be at Disney World the following week. Would Jenny like to drive up and spend a few days with them? A doting aunt who looked for any opportunity to bond with her niece and nephew, Jenny was dying to go. But she was torn. I won't be here to bring little Marley home, she said. You go, I told her. I'll get the dog and have him all settled in and waiting for you when you get back. I tried to sound nonchalant, but secretly I was overjoyed at the prospect of having the new puppy all to myself for a few days of uninterrupted male bonding. He was to be our joint project, both of ours equally, but I never believed a dog could answer to two masters, and if there could be only one alpha leader in the household hierarchy, I wanted it to be me. This little three-day run would give me a head start. A week later, Jenny left for Orlando. That evening after work, a Friday, I returned to the breeder's house to fetch the new addition to our lives. When Lori brought my new dog out from the back of the house, I gasped audibly. The tiny, fuzzy puppy we had picked out three weeks earlier had more than doubled in size. He came barreling at me and ran headfirst into my ankles, collapsing in a pile at my feet and rolling onto his back, paws in the air, in what I could only hope was a sign of supplication. Lori must have sensed my shock. He's a growing boy, isn't he? she said cheerily. You should see him pack away the puppy chow. I leaned down, rubbed his belly, and said, Ready to go home, Marley? It was my first time using his new name for real, and it felt right. In the car, I used beach towels to fashion a cozy nest for him on the passenger seat and set him down in it. But I was barely out of the driveway when he belly crawled in my direction, whimpering as he advanced. At the center console, he wiggled and rocked and swayed, but he was grounded like a freighter on a sandbar, hind legs hanging over the passenger side of the console and front legs hanging over the driver's side. In the middle, his stomach was firmly beached on the emergency brake. Slowly, he began working his hind quarters into the air, his butt rising up, 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 tail furiously going, until the law of gravity finally kicked in. He slalomed headfirst down the other side of the console, somersaulting onto the floor at my feet and flipping onto his back. From there, it was a quick, easy scramble up into my lap. Man, was he happy, desperately happy. He quaked with joy as he burrowed his head into my stomach, his tail slapping the steering wheel like the needle on a metronome. When we got home, I let him inside and unhooked his leash. He began sniffing and didn't stop until he had sniffed every square inch of the place. Then he sat back on his haunches and looked up at me with cocked head as if to say, Great digs, but where are my brothers and sisters? The reality of his new life did not fully set in until bedtime. Before leaving to get him, I had set up his sleeping quarters in the one-car garage attached to the side of our house. We never parked there, using it as a storage and utility room. The washer and dryer were out there, along with our ironing board. The room was dry and comfortable, and with its concrete floor and walls, it was virtually indestructible. Marley, this is your room. I had scattered chew toys around, laid newspapers down in the middle of the floor, filled a bowl with water, and made a bed out of a cardboard box lined with an old bedspread. And here is where you'll be sleeping. I lowered him into the box. He was used to such accommodations, but had always shared them with his siblings. Now he paced the perimeter of the box and looked forlornly up at me. 
As a test, I stepped back into the house and closed the door. I stood and listened. At first, nothing. Then a slight, barely audible whimper. And then, full-fledged crying. It sounded like someone was in there torturing him. I opened the door, and as soon as he saw me, he stopped. I reached in and pet him for a couple of minutes, then left again. We repeated the exercise several times, all with the same result. I was tired and decided it was time for him to cry himself to sleep. I left the garage light on for him, closed the door, walked to the opposite side of the house, and crawled into bed. The concrete walls did little to muffle his pitiful cries. I lay there, trying to ignore them, figuring any minute now he would give up and go to sleep. The crying continued. Even after I wrapped my pillow around my head, I could still hear it. I thought of him out there alone for the first time in his life. His mother was missing in action, and so were all his siblings. The poor little thing, how would I like it? I hung on for another half hour before getting up and going to him. As soon as he spotted me, his face brightened and his tail began to beat the side of the box. It was as if he were saying, Come on, hop in. There's plenty of room. Instead, I lifted the box with him in it and carried it into my bedroom, where I placed it on the floor, tight against the side of the bed. I lay down on the very edge of the mattress, my arm dangling into the box. There, my hand resting on his side, feeling his ribcage rise and fall with his every breath, we both drifted off to sleep. Chapter 4 Mr. Wiggles For the next three days, I threw myself with abandon into our new puppy. I lay on the floor with him and let him scamper all over me. I wrestled with him. I used an old hand towel to play tug-of-war with him and was surprised at how strong he already was. He followed me everywhere and tried to gnaw on anything he could get his teeth around. It took him just one day to discover the best thing about his new home— toilet paper. He disappeared into the bathroom and five seconds later came racing back out, the end of the toilet paper roll clenched in his teeth, a paper ribbon unrolling behind him as he sprinted across the house. The place looked like it had been decorated for Halloween. Every half hour or so I would lead him into the backyard to relieve himself. When he had accidents in the house, I scolded him. When he peed outside, I placed my cheek against his and praised him in my sweetest voice. And when he pooped outside, I carried on as though he had just delivered the winning Florida lotto ticket. When Jenny returned from Disney World, I saw in my young wife a calm, gentle, nurturing side I had not known existed. She held him, she caressed him, she played with him, she fussed over him. She combed through every strand of his fur in search of fleas and ticks. She rose every couple of hours through the night, night after night, to take him outside for bathroom breaks. That, more than anything, was responsible for him becoming fully housebroken in just a few short weeks. Mostly, she fed him. Following the instructions on the bag, we gave Marley three large bowls of puppy chow a day. He woofed down every morsel in a matter of seconds. What went in came out, of course, and soon our backyard was as inviting as a minefield. Marley was growing at a furious pace. Like one of those amazing jungle vines that can cover a house in hours, he was expanding exponentially in all directions. Each day he was a little longer, a little wider, a little taller, a little heavier. He was 21 pounds when I brought him home, and within weeks was up to 50. His paws were enormous, his flanks already rippled with muscle, and his chest almost as broad as a bulldozer. Just as the books promised, his slip of a puppy tail was becoming as thick and powerful as an otter's. What a tail it was! Every last object in our house that was at knee level or below was knocked asunder by Marley's wildly wagging weapon. He cleared coffee tables, scattered magazines, knocked framed photographs off shelves, sent beer bottles and wine glasses flying. 
Every item that was not bolted down migrated to higher ground safely above the sweep of his swinging mallet. Our friends with children would visit and marvel. Your house is already baby-proofed. Marley didn't actually wag his tail. He wagged his whole body, starting with the front shoulders and working backward. He was like the canine version of a slinky. At no time did he wiggle more than when he had something in his mouth. His reaction to any situation was the same. Grab the nearest shoe or pillow or pencil, really, any item would do, and run with it. Some of the objects he grabbed were small enough to conceal, and this especially pleased him. He seemed to think he was getting away with something, but Marley would never have made it as a poker player. When he had something to hide, he could not mask his glee. His body would quiver, his head would bob from side to side, and his entire rear end would swing in a sort of spastic dance. We called it the Marley Mambo. All right, what do you got this time? As I approached, he would begin evasive action, waggling his way around the room, his hips sashaying, head flailing up and down like a whinnying filly, so overjoyed with his forbidden prize, he could not contain himself. When I would finally get him cornered and pry open his jaws, I never came up empty-handed. Paper towels, wadded Kleenex, grocery receipts, wine corks, paper clips, chess pieces, bottle caps. It was like a salvage yard in there. One day I pried open his jaws and peered in to find my paycheck plastered to the roof of his mouth. Within weeks, we had a hard time remembering what life had been like without our new boarder. Quickly, we fell into a routine. I started each morning before the first cup of coffee by taking him for a brisk walk down to the water and back. After breakfast and before my shower, I patrolled the backyard with a shovel, burying his landmines in the sand at the back of the lot. Jenny left for work before nine, and I seldom left the house before ten, first locking Marley out in the concrete bunker with a fresh bowl of water and a host of toys. By 12.30, Jenny was home on her lunch break when she would give Marley his midday meal and throw him a ball in the backyard until he was tuckered out. In the early week, she also made a quick trip home in the middle of the afternoon to let him out. After dinner, most evenings, we walked together with him back down to the waterfront, where we would stroll along the intracoastal as the yachts from Palm Beach idled by in the glow of the sunset. Stroll is probably the wrong word. Marley strolled like a runaway locomotive strolls. He surged ahead, he veered left and right, darting to every mailbox and shrub, sniffing, panting, and peeing without fully stopping. He circled behind us, wrapping the leash around our ankles, before lurching forward again, nearly tripping us. When someone approached with another dog, Marley would bolt at them joyously, rearing up on his hind legs when he reached the end of his leash, dying to make friends. He sure seems to love life, one dog owner commented, and that about said it all. He was still small enough that we could win these leash tug of wars, but with each week the balance of power was shifting. He was growing bigger and stronger. It was obvious that before long he would be more powerful than either of us. We knew we would need to rein him in and teach him to heal properly before he dragged us to humiliating deaths beneath the wheels of a passing car. Our friends who were veteran dog owners told us not to rush the obedience regimen. It's too early, one of them advised. Enjoy his puppyhood while you can. It'll be gone soon enough, and then you can get serious about training him. That is what we did, which is not to say that we let him totally have his way. We set rules and tried to enforce them consistently. Beds and furniture were off-limits. Drinking from the toilet, sniffing crotches, and chewing chair legs were actionable offenses, though apparently worth suffering a scolding for. Still, for all his juvenile antics, Marley was serving an important role in our home and our relationship. Jenny's transformation from cold-hearted plant killer to nurturing dog mom continued to amaze me. I think she amazed herself a little. She was a natural. 
One day, Marley began gagging violently. Before I even fully registered that he was in trouble, Jenny was on her feet. She swooped in, pried his jaws open with one hand, and reached deep into his gullet with the other, pulling out a large saliva-coated wad of cellophane. All in a day's work. Marley let out one last cough, banged his tail against the wall, and looked up at her with an expression that said, Can we do it again? As we grew more comfortable with the new member of our family, we became more comfortable talking about expanding our family in other ways. Within weeks of bringing Marley home, we decided to stop using birth control. That's not to say we decided to get pregnant, which would have been way too bold a gesture for two people who had dedicated their lives to being as indecisive as possible. Rather, we backed into it, merely deciding to stop trying not to get pregnant. The logic was convoluted, we realized, but it somehow made us both feel better. No pressure, none at all. We weren't trying for a baby. We were just going to let whatever happened, happen. Let nature take its course. Que sera, sera. Frankly, we were terrified. We had several sets of friends who had tried for months, years even, to conceive without luck. Also troubling was a little secret from our past. In those blindly passionate early days of our relationship, when desire had a stranglehold on anything resembling common sense, we had thrown caution into the corner with our clothes and had sex with reckless abandon, using no birth control whatsoever, not just once, but many times. It was incredibly dumb, and looking back on it several years later, we should have been kissing the ground in gratitude for miraculously escaping an unwanted pregnancy. Instead, all either of us could think was, what's wrong with us? We were both convinced conceiving was going to be no easy task. So as our friends announced their plans to try to get pregnant, we remained silent. Jenny was simply going to stash her birth control prescription away in the medicine cabinet and forget about it. If she ended up pregnant, fantastic. If she didn't, well, we weren't actually trying anyway now, were we? Winter in West Palm Beach is a glorious time of year, marked by crisp nights and warm, dry, sunny days. We ate all our meals on the back porch, squeezed fresh orange juice from the fruit of the backyard tree each morning, and slept beneath open windows, the gardenia-scented air wafting over us. On one of those gorgeous days in late March, Jenny invited a friend from work to bring her basset hound Buddy over for a dog play date. Buddy was a rescued pound dog with the saddest face I had ever seen. We let the two dogs loose in the backyard, and off they bounded. Old Buddy wasn't quite sure what to make of this hyper-energized yellow juvenile who raced and streaked and ran tight circles around him. But he took it in good humor, and the two of them romped and played together for more than an hour before they both collapsed in the shade of the mango tree, exhausted. A few days later, Marley started scratching and wouldn't stop. He was clawing so hard at himself we were afraid he might draw blood. Jenny dropped to her knees and began one of her routine inspections, working her fingers through his coat, parting his fur as she went to see his skin below. After just a few seconds, Look at this! I peered over her shoulder. Fleas. Swarms of them. Even if they were slow enough to catch, which they were not, there were simply too many of them to even begin picking off. Of course, we blamed Buddy without having any solid proof. Jenny had images of not only the dog being infested, but our entire home, too. She grabbed her car keys and ran out the door. A half hour later, she was back with a bag filled with flea baths and flea powders and flea sprays and flea foams and flea dips. There was a special comb designed to remove insect eggs. She was back in assassin mode, this time to protect her loved ones, and she meant business. She scrubbed Marley in the laundry tub using special soaps. She then mixed up the dip and poured it over him until every inch of him was saturated. As he was drying in the garage, smelling like a miniature Dow chemical plant, Jenny vacuumed furiously. Floors, walls, carpets, curtains, upholstery. And then she sprayed. 
You think we nailed the little buggers? I asked when we were finally finished. I think we did, she said. We checked Marley daily, peering between his toes, under his ears, beneath his tail. We could find no signs of a flea anywhere. We had annihilated the enemy. Chapter 5 The Test Strip A few weeks later, we were in bed reading when Jenny closed her book. It's probably nothing. What's probably nothing? My period's late. She had my attention. Your period? It is? That happens sometimes, but it's been over a week, and I've been feeling weird, too, like I have a low-level stomach flu or something. I wasn't going to mention it, but she also had been rather cranky lately. I almost didn't say anything, just in case, you know, I don't want to jinx us. That's when I realized just how important this was to her, and to me, too. Somehow, parenthood had snuck up on us. We were ready for a baby. We lay there side by side for a long while, saying nothing, looking straight ahead. We're never going to fall asleep, I finally said. The suspense is killing me, she admitted. The pharmacy was open till midnight, and I waited in the car with Marley while Jenny ran in. There are some things guys just are not meant to shop for, and home pregnancy tests come pretty close to the top of the list. A few minutes later, we were back home in the bathroom with the $8.99 kit spread out on the side of the sink. I read the directions aloud. Okay, I said. It says it's accurate 99% of the time. First thing you have to do is pee in this cup. The next step was to dip a skinny plastic test strip into the urine and then into a small vial of a solution that came with the kit. Wait five minutes, I said. Then we put it in the second solution for 15 minutes. If it turns blue, you're officially knocked up, baby. We timed off the first five minutes. Then Jenny dropped the strip into the second vial and said, I can't stand here watching it. We went out into the living room and made small talk, pretending we were waiting for something of no more significance than the tea kettle to boil. So how about them dolphins? I quipped, but my heart was pounding wildly, and a feeling of nervous dread was rising from my stomach. If the test came back positive, whoa, our lives were about to change forever. If it came back negative, Jenny would be crushed. It was beginning to dawn on me, that I might be too. An eternity later, the timer rang. Here we go. Either way, you know I love you. I went to the bathroom and fished the test strip out of the vial. No doubt about it, it was blue, as blue as the deepest ocean, a dark, rich, navy blazer blue, a blue that could be confused with no other shade. Congratulations, honey. Oh, my God! and she threw herself into my arms. As we stood there by the sink, arms around each other, eyes closed, I gradually became aware of a commotion at our feet. I looked down, and there was Marley, wiggling, head bobbing, tail banging the linen closet door so hard, I thought he might dent it. When I reached down to pet him, he dodged away. Uh Uh-oh. It was the Marley Mambo. And that could mean just one thing. What do you have this time? He loped into the living room, weaving just out of my reach. When I finally cornered him and pried open his jaws, at first I saw nothing. Then far back on his tongue, on the brink of no return, ready to slip down the hatch, I spotted something. It was skinny and long and flat, and as blue as the deepest ocean. I reached in and pulled out our positive test strip. Sorry to disappoint you, pal, but this is going in the scrapbook. Jenny and I started laughing and kept laughing for a long time. Then Jenny grabbed Marley by the front paws, lifted him up on his hind legs, and danced around the room with him. You're going to be an uncle! Marley responded in his trademark way by lunging up and planting a big wet tongue squarely on her mouth. The next day, Jenny called me at work. Her voice was bubbling. She had just returned from the doctor, who had officially confirmed the results of our home test. 
The night before, we had counted back on the calendar, trying to pinpoint the date of conception. She was worried that she had already been pregnant when we went on our hysterical flea eradication spree a few weeks earlier. Exposing herself to all those pesticides couldn't be good, could it? She raised her concerns with the doctor, and he told her it was probably not an issue. Just don't use them any more, he advised. He told her he'd see her back in his office in three weeks for a sonogram. He wants us to make sure we bring a videotape, she said, so we can save our own copy for posterity. On my desk calendar, I made a note of it. Chapter 6 Matters of the Heart The natives will tell you South Florida has four seasons, subtle ones, they admit, but four distinct seasons nonetheless. Do not believe them. There are only two, the warm dry season and the hot wet one. It was about the time of this overnight return to tropical swelter when we awoke one day to realize our puppy was a puppy no more. As rapidly as winter had morphed into summer, it seemed, Marley had morphed into a gangly adolescent. At five months old, his body had filled out the baggy wrinkles in its oversized yellow fur coat. His enormous paws no longer looked so comically out of proportion. His needle-sharp baby teeth had given way to imposing fangs that could destroy a frisbee or a brand-new leather shoe in a few quick chomps. The timbre of his bark had deepened to an intimidating boom. When he stood on his hind legs, which he did often, tottering around like a dancing Russian circus bear, he could rest his front paws on my shoulders and look me straight in the eye. The first time the veterinarian saw him, he let out a soft whistle and said, You're going to have a big boy on your hands. We were not the only ones to notice the transformation. We could tell from the wide berth strangers gave him and the way they recoiled when he bounded their way that they no longer viewed him as a harmless puppy. To them, he had grown into something to be feared. Our front door had a small, oblong window at eye level, four inches wide by eight inches long. Marley lived for company, and whenever someone rang the bell, he would streak across the house, going into a full skid as he approached the foyer, careening across the wood floors, tossing up throw rugs as he slid, and not stopping until he crashed into the door with a loud thud. He then would hop up on his hind legs, yelping wildly, his big head filling the tiny window, to stare straight into the face of whoever was on the other side. For Marley, it was a joyous overture. For anyone else who didn't know him, though, it was as if Cujo had just jumped out of the Stephen King novel, and the only thing that stood between them and a merciless mauling was our wooden door. More than one stranger, after ringing the doorbell and seeing Marley's barking face peering out at them, beat a quick retreat to the middle of the driveway, where they stood waiting for one of us to answer. This, we found was not necessarily a bad thing. Ours was what urban planners call a changing neighborhood. Built in the 1940s and 50s and initially populated by snowbirds and retirees, it began to take on a gritty edge as the original homeowners died off and were replaced by a motley group of renters and working-class families. By the time we moved in, the neighborhood was again in transition, this time being gentrified by gays, artists, and young professionals drawn to its location near the water and its funky, deco-style architecture. Our block served as a buffer between hard-bitten South Dixie Highway and the posh estate homes along the water. The neighborhood seemed safe to us, but there were telltales of its rough edge. Tools left out in the yard disappeared and during a rare cold spell, someone stole every stick of firewood I had stacked along the side of the house. One Sunday, we were eating breakfast at our favorite diner, sitting at the table we always sat at, right in the front window, when Jenny pointed to a bullet hole in the plate glass just above our heads. That definitely wasn't there last time we were here. Most unsettling of all was what we learned about the small house kitty corner from ours. A murder had taken place there just a few months before we moved in, and not just a run-of-the-mill murder, but a horribly gruesome one involving an invalid widow and a chainsaw. 
The victim was a retired school teacher named Ruth Ann Niedermeyer, who had lived in the house alone and was one of the original settlers of the neighborhood. After hip replacement surgery, she had hired a day nurse to help care for her, which was a fatal decision. The nurse, police later ascertained, had been stealing checks out of Mrs. Niedermeyer's checkbook and forging her signature. The old woman had been frail but mentally sharp, and she confronted the nurse about the missing checks and the unexplained charges to her bank account. The panicked nurse bludgeoned the poor woman to death, then called her boyfriend, who arrived with a chainsaw, and helped her dismember the body in the bathtub. Together, they packed the body parts in a large trunk, rinsed the woman's blood down the drain, and drove away. For several days, Mrs. Niedermeyer's disappearance remained a mystery, our neighbors later told us. The mystery was solved when a man called the police to report a horrible stench coming from his garage. Officers discovered the trunk and its ghastly contents. When they asked the homeowner how it got there, he told them the truth. His daughter had asked if she could store it there for safekeeping. Although the grisly murder of Mrs. Niedermeyer was the most talked about event in the history of our block, no one had mentioned a word about it to us as we prepared to buy the house. Our first week in the house, the neighbors came over with cookies and a casserole and broke the news to us. As we lay in our bed at night, it was hard not to think that just a hundred feet from our bedroom window, a defenseless widow had been sawn into pieces. Somehow, having Marley aboard with us, and seeing how strangers eyed him so warily, gave us a sense of peace we might not have had otherwise. He was a big, loving dope of a dog whose defense strategy against intruders would surely have been to lick them to death but the prowlers and predators out there didn't need to know that. To them, he was big, he was powerful, and he was unpredictably crazy. And that is how we liked it. Pregnancy suited Jenny well. She began rising at dawn to exercise and walk Marley. She prepared wholesome, healthy meals loaded with fresh vegetables and fruits. She swore off caffeine and diet sodas and, of course, all alcohol, not even allowing me to stir a tablespoon of cooking sherry into the pot. We had sworn to keep the pregnancy a secret until we were confident the fetus was viable, but on this front, neither of us did well. We were so excited that we dribbled out our news to one confidant after another, swearing each to silence, until our secret was no longer a secret at all. Jenny's stomach at ten weeks was starting to round slightly. By the time the day arrived for Jenny's examination and sonogram, we might as well have plastered it on a billboard. John and Jenny are expecting. I took off work the morning of the doctor's appointment and, as instructed, brought a blank videotape so I could capture the first grainy images of our baby. The appointment was to be part checkup, part informational meeting. We arrived at 9 a.m., brimming with anticipation. The nurse midwife, a gentle middle-aged woman with a British accent, led us into a small exam room and immediately asked, Would you like to hear your baby's heartbeat? Would we ever, we told her. We listened intently as she ran a sort of microphone hooked to a speaker over Jenny's abdomen. We sat in silence, smiles frozen on our faces, straining to hear the tiny heartbeat. But only static came through the speaker. The nurse said that was not unusual. It depends on how the baby is lying. Sometimes you can't hear anything. It might still be a little early. She offered to go right to the sonogram. Our first glimpse of baby Grogi, Jenny said, beaming at me. The nurse midwife led us into the sonogram room and had Jenny lie back on a table with a monitor screen beside it. I brought a tape, I said, waving it in front of her. Just hold on to it for now, the nurse said, as she pulled up Jenny's shirt and began running an instrument the size and shape of a hockey puck over her stomach. We peered at the computer monitor. She zoomed in on what looked like a tiny sack in the middle of the sea of gray, and with the click of a mouse magnified it, then magnified it again. But despite the great detail, the sack just looked like an empty, shapeless sock to us. Where were the little arms and legs the pregnancy book said would be formed by ten weeks? 
Where was the tiny head? Where was the beating heart? Jenny, her neck craned sideways to see the screen, was still brimming with anticipation, and asked the nurse with a little nervous laugh, Is there anything in there? I looked up to catch Essie's face, and I knew the answer was the one we did not want to hear. Suddenly I realized why she hadn't been saying anything as she kept clicking up the magnification. She answered Jenny in a controlled voice, Not what you'd expect to see at ten weeks. I put my hand on Jenny's knee. We both continued staring at the blob on the screen as though we could will it to life. Jenny, I think we have a problem here, Essie said. Let me get Dr. Sherman. As we waited in silence, I learned what people mean when they describe the swarm of locusts that descends just before they faint. I felt the blood rushing out of my head and heard buzzing in my ears. If I don't sit down, I thought, I'm going to collapse. How embarrassing would that be? My strong wife bearing the news stoically as her husband lay unconscious on the floor, the nurses trying to revive him with smelling salts. I half sat on the edge of the examining bench, holding Jenny's hand with one of mine and stroking her neck with the other. Tears welled in her eyes, but she didn't cry. Dr. Sherman, a tall, distinguished-looking man with a gruff but affable demeanor, confirmed that the fetus was dead. We'd be able to see a heartbeat, no question, he said. He gently told us what we already knew from the books we had been reading, that one in six pregnancies ends in miscarriages, that this was nature's way of sorting out the weak, the retarded, the grossly deformed. Apparently remembering Jenny's worry about the flea sprays, he told us it was nothing we did or did not do. He placed his hand on Jenny's cheek and leaned in close as if to kiss her. I'm sorry, he said. You can try again in a couple of months. We both just sat there in silence. The blank videotape sitting on the bench beside us suddenly seemed like an incredible embarrassment. I wanted to hide it. I asked the doctor, where do we go from here? We had to remove the placenta, he said. Years ago, you wouldn't have even known you had miscarried yet, and you would have waited until you started hemorrhaging. He gave us the option of waiting over the weekend and returning on Monday for the procedure, which was the same as an abortion, with the fetus and placenta being vacuumed from the uterus. But Jenny wanted to get it behind her, and so did I. Okay, then, Dr. Sherman said. He gave her something to force her to dilate and was gone. Down the hall, we could hear him enter another exam room and boisterously greet an expectant mother with jolly banter. Alone in the room, Jenny and I fell heavily into each other's arms and stayed that way until a light knock came at the door. It was an older woman we had never seen before. She carried a sheaf of papers. I'm sorry, sweetie, she said to Jenny. I'm so sorry. And then she showed her where to sign the waiver acknowledging the risks of uterine suction. Afterwards, in the car, Jenny maintained a detached silence, pressing herself against the passenger door, gazing out the window. Her eyes were red, but she would not cry. I searched for comforting words without success. Really, what could be said? We had lost our baby. Yes, I could tell her we could try again. I could tell her that many couples go through the same thing. But she didn't want to hear it, and I didn't want to say it. Someday we would be able to see it all in perspective. But not today. When we arrived at the house, I helped Jenny inside and onto the couch, then went into the garage where Marley, as always, awaited our return with breathless anticipation. As soon as he saw me, he dove for his oversized rawhide bone and proudly paraded it around the room, his body wagging, tail whacking the washing machine like a mallet on a kettle drum. He begged me to try to snatch it from him. Not today, pal, I said, and let him out the back door into the yard. He took a long pee and then came barreling back inside and careened down the hall searching for Jenny. It took me just a few seconds to follow him into the living room. When I turned the corner, I stopped short. I would have bet a week's pay that what I was looking at couldn't possibly happen. 
Our rambunctious, wired dog stood with his shoulders between Jenny's knees, his big, blocky head resting quietly in her lap. His tail hung flat between his legs, the first time I could remember it not wagging whenever he was touching one of us. His eyes were turned up at her, and he whimpered softly. She stroked his head a few times, and then, with no warning, buried her face in the thick fur of his neck and began sobbing. Hard, unrestrained, from the gut, sobbing. They stayed like that for a long time, Marley statue still, Jenny clutching him to her like an oversized doll. I stood off to the side, feeling like a voyeur, intruding on this private moment, not quite knowing what to do with myself. And then, without lifting her face, she raised one arm up toward me, and I joined her on the couch and wrapped my arms around her. There the three of us stayed, locked in our embrace of shared grief. Chapter 7 Master and Beast The next morning, a Saturday, I awoke before dawn to the sounds of Jenny softly sobbing beside me. Hey, I said, and wrapped my arms around her. She nestled her face against my chest, and I could feel her tears soaking through my T-shirt. I'm fine, she said, really. I'm just, you know. I did know. I was trying to be the brave soldier, but I felt it too, the dull sense of loss and failure. It was odd. Less than 48 hours earlier, we had been bubbling with anticipation over our new baby. And now it was as if there had never been a pregnancy at all. As if the whole episode was just a dream from which we were having trouble waking. Later that day, I took Marley with me in the car to pick up a few groceries and some things Jenny needed at the pharmacy. On the way back, I stopped at a florist shop and bought a giant bouquet of spring flowers arranged in a vase, hoping they would cheer her up. I strapped them into the seat belt in the back seat beside Marley so they wouldn't spill. When we got home a few minutes later, Jenny came out to meet us, and Marley tumbled out of the car to greet her. We have a little surprise for you, I said, but when I reached in the back seat for the flowers, the surprise was on me. The bouquet was a mix of white daisies, yellow mums, assorted lilies, and bright red carnations. Now, however, the carnations were nowhere to be found. I looked more closely and found the decapitated stems that minutes earlier had held blossoms. Nothing else in the bouquet was disturbed. I glared at Marley, and he was dancing around like he was auditioning for Soul Train. When I finally caught him and pried open his jaws, I found the incontrovertible evidence of his guilt. Deep in his cavernous mouth, tucked up in one jowl like a wad of chewing tobacco, was a single red carnation. The others, presumably, were already down the hatch. I was ready to murder him. I looked up at Jenny and tears were streaming down her cheeks. But this time, they were tears of laughter. There was nothing left for me to do but laugh, too. That dog! I've never been crazy about carnations anyway. Marley was so thrilled to see everyone happy and laughing again that he jumped up on his hind legs and did a break dance for us. Chapter 8 A Battle of Wills When Marley was not quite six months old, we signed him up for obedience classes. God knew he needed it. He was proving himself a challenging student, dense, wild, constantly distracted, a victim of his boundless nervous energy. As my father put it shortly after Marley attempted marital relations with his knee, that dog's got a screw loose. We needed professional help. Our veterinarian told us about a local dog training club that offered basic obedience classes on Tuesday nights in the parking lot behind the armory. The teachers were unpaid volunteers from the club, serious amateurs who presumably had already taken their own dogs to the heights of advanced behavior modification. The course ran eight lessons and cost $50, which we thought was a bargain, especially considering that Marley could destroy $50 worth of shoes in 30 seconds. 
and the club all but guaranteed we'd be marching home after graduation with the next great lassie. At registration, we met the woman who would be teaching our class. She was a stern, no-nonsense dog trainer who subscribed to the theory that there are no incorrigible dogs, just weak-willed and hapless owners. The first lesson seemed to prove her point. Before we were fully out of the car, Marley spotted the other dogs gathering with their owners across the tarmac. A party! He leaped over us and out of the car and was off in a tear, his leash dragging behind him. He darted from one dog to the next, sniffing private parts, dribbling pee, and flinging huge wads of spit through the air. For Marley, it was a festival of smells. So many genitals, so little time. I finally got within striking distance and took a giant leap, landing hard with both feet on his leash. He jerked backward, landed on his back, flipped around, and gazed up at me with the serene expression of a heroin addict who had just gotten his fix. Meanwhile, the instructor was staring at us with a look that could not have been more withering had I decided to throw off my clothes and dance naked right there on the blacktop. Take your place, please. When she saw both Jenny and me tugging Marley into position, she added, You are going to have to decide which of you is going to be trainer. A dog can only answer to one master. I began to protest, but she silenced me with that glare of hers. I suppose the same glare she used to intimidate her dogs into submission. And I slinked off to the sidelines with my tail between my legs, leaving Master Jenny in command. This was probably a mistake. Marley was already considerably stronger than Jenny and knew it. Miss Dominatrix was only a few sentences into her introduction on the importance of establishing dominance over our pets when Marley decided the standard poodle on the opposite side of the class deserved a closer look. He lunged off with Jenny in tow. All the other dogs were sitting placidly beside their masters at tidy ten-foot intervals, awaiting further instructions. Jenny was fighting valiantly to plant her feet and bring Marley to a halt, but he lumbered on in pursuit of hot poodle butt-sniffing action. My wife looked amazingly like a water skier being towed behind a powerboat. Everyone stared. Some snickered. I covered my eyes. Marley wasn't one for formal introductions. He crashed into the poodle and immediately crammed his nose between her legs. After Marley had given the poodle a full gynecological examination, Jenny was able to drag him back into place. Miss Dominatrix announced calmly, That class is an example of a dog that has been allowed to think he is the alpha male of his pack. Right now, he's in charge. As if to drive home the point, Marley attacked his tail, spinning wildly, his jaws snapping at thin air, and in the process he wrapped the leash around Jenny's ankles until she was fully immobilized. I winced for her and gave thanks that it wasn't me out there. The instructor began running the class through the sit and down commands. Jenny would firmly order, sit, and Marley would jump up on her and put his paws on her shoulders. She would press his butt to the ground, and he would roll over for a belly rub. She would try to tug him into place, and he would grab the leash in his teeth, shaking his head from side to side as if he were wrestling a python. It was too painful to watch. At one point, I opened my eyes to see Jenny lying on the pavement face down and Marley standing over her, panting happily. Later, she told me she was trying to show him the down command. As class ended and Jenny and Marley rejoined me, Miss Dominatrix intercepted us. You really need to get control over that animal, she said with a sneer. Well, thank you for that valuable advice. And to think, we had signed up simply to provide comic relief for the rest of the class. Neither of us breathed a word. We just retreated to the car in humiliation. Finally, I said, One thing you can say for him... He sure loves school.
The next week, Marley and I were back, this time without Jenny. When I suggested to her that I was probably the closest thing to an alpha dog we were going to find in our home, she gladly relinquished her brief title as master and commander and vowed to never show her face in public again. Before leaving the house, I flipped Marley over on his back, towered over him, and growled in my most intimidating voice, I'm the boss. You're not the boss. I'm the boss. Got it, alpha dog? He thumped his tail on the floor and tried to gnaw on my wrists. The night's lesson was walking on heel, one I was especially keen on mastering. I was tired of fighting Marley every step of every walk. He already had yanked Jenny off her feet once when he took off after a cat, leaving her with bloody knees. It was time he learned to trot placidly along by our sides. I wrestled him to our spot on the tarmac. Miss Dominatrix handed each of us a short length of chain with a steel ring welded to each end. These, she told us, were choker collars and would be our secret weapons for teaching our dogs to heal effortlessly at our sides. The choker chain was brilliantly simple in design. When the dog behaved and walked beside its master as it was supposed to, with slack in its lead, the chain hung limply around its neck. But if the dog lunged forward or veered off course, the chain tightened like a noose, choking the errant hound into gasping submission. It didn't take long, our instructor promised, before dogs learned to submit or die of asphyxia. Wickedly delicious, I thought. I started to slip the choker chain over Marley's head, but he saw it coming and grabbed it in his teeth. I pried his jaws open to pull it out and try it again. He grabbed it again. All the other dogs had their chains on. Everyone was waiting. I grabbed his muzzle with one hand and with the other tried to lasso the chain over his snout. He was pulling backward, trying to get his mouth open so he could attack the mysterious coiled silver snake again. I finally forced the chain over his head, and he dropped to the ground, thrashing and snapping, his paws in the air, his head jerking from side to side, until he managed to get the chain in his teeth again. I looked up at the teacher. He likes it, I said. As instructed, I got Marley to his feet and got the chain out of his mouth. Then, as instructed, I pushed his butt down into a sit position and stood beside him, my left leg brushing his right shoulder. On the count of three, I was to say, Marley, heel, and step off with my left, never my right, foot. If he began to wander off course, a series of minor corrections, sharp little tugs on the leash, would bring him back in the line. Class, on the count of three, Miss Dominatrix called out. Marley, Heel, I commanded. As soon as I took my first step, he took off like a fighter jet from an aircraft carrier. I yanked back hard on the leash, and he made an awful, coughing gasp as the chain tightened around his airway. He sprang back for an instant, but as soon as the chain loosened, he lunged forward again. I yanked back, and he gasped once more. We continued like this the entire length of the parking lot, Marley yanking ahead, me yanking back, each time with increasing vigor. He was coughing and panting. I was grunting and sweating. Rain that dog in, Miss Dominatrix yelled. I tried to with all my might, but the lesson wasn't sinking in. The instructor had the class queue up and try it again. Once again, Marley lurched his way manically across the blacktop, eyes bulging, strangling himself as he went. At the other end, Miss Dominatrix held Marley and me up to the class as an example of how not to heal a dog. Here, she said impatiently, holding out her hand, let me show you. I handed the leash to her, and she efficiently tugged Marley around into position, pulling up on the choker as she ordered him to sit. Sure enough, he sank back on his haunches, eagerly looking up at her. Damn! With a smart yank of the lead, Miss Dominatrix set off with him, but almost instantly he barreled ahead as if he were pulling the lead sled in the Iditarod. The instructor corrected hard, pulling him off balance. He stumbled, wheezed, then lunged forward again. It looked like he was going to pull her arm out of its socket. I should have been embarrassed, 
but I felt an odd sort of satisfaction that often comes with vindication. She wasn't having any more success than I was. My classmates snickered, and I beamed with perverse pride. See, my dog is awful for everyone, not just me. Now that I wasn't the one being made the fool, I had to admit, the scene was pretty hilarious. The two of them, having reached the end of the parking lot, turned and came lurching back toward us in fits and starts, Miss Dominatrix scowling with what clearly was apoplectic rage, Marley joyous beyond words. She yanked furiously at the leash, and Marley, frothing at the mouth, yanked back harder still, clearly enjoying this excellent new tug-of-war game his teacher had called on him to demonstrate. When he caught sight of me, he hit the gas. With a near supernatural burst of adrenaline, he made a dash for me, forcing Miss Dominatrix to break into a sprint to keep from being pulled off her feet. Marley didn't stop until he slammed into me with his usual joie de vivre. Miss Dominatrix shot me a look that told me I had crossed some invisible line. Marley had made a mockery of everything she preached about dogs and discipline. He had publicly humiliated her. She handed the leash back to me, and turning to the class, as if this unfortunate little episode had never occurred, said, Okay, class, on the count of three. When the lesson was over, she asked if I could stay after for a minute. I waited with Marley as she patiently fielded questions from other students in the class. When the last one had left, she turned to me and, in a newly conciliatory voice, said, I think your dog is still a little young for structured obedience training. He's a handful, isn't he? I said, feeling a new camaraderie with her now that we'd shared the same humiliating experience. He's simply not ready for this. It was beginning to dawn on me what she was getting at. Are you trying to tell me he's a distraction to the other dogs? That you're... he's just too excitable. Kicking us out of class? You can always bring him back in another six or eight months. So you're kicking us out. I'll happily give you a full refund. You're kicking us out. Yes, I'm kicking you out. Marley, as if on cue, lifted his leg and let loose a raging stream of urine, missing his beloved instructor's foot by mere centimeters. Sometimes a man needs to get angry to get serious. First thing the next morning, I had Marley out in the backyard with me. Nobody kicks the Grogan boys out of obedience school, I told him. Untrainable? We'll see who's untrainable. Right? He bounced up and down. Can we do it, Marley? I can't hear you. Can we do it? He yelped. That's better. Now let's get to work. We started with the sit command, which I had been practicing with him since he was a small puppy, and which he already was quite good at. Next we moved to the down command, another one I had been practicing with him. I slowly raised my hand in the air and held it there as he waited for the word. With a sharp downward motion, I snapped my fingers and pointed at the ground and said, Down! Marley collapsed in a heap, hitting the ground with a thud. He could not possibly have gone down with more gusto had a mortar shell just exploded behind him. Jenny, sitting on the porch with her coffee, noticed it too and yelled out, Incoming! After several rounds of hit the deck, I decided to move up to the next challenge, Come on Command. This was a tough one for Marley. The coming part was not the problem. It was waiting in place until we summoned him. I put him in the sit position, facing me, and fixed my eyes on his. As we stared at each other, I raised my palm, holding it out in front of me like a crossing guard. Stay, I said, and took a step backward. He froze, staring anxiously, waiting for the slightest sign that he could join me. On my fourth step backward, he could take it no longer and broke free, racing up and tumbling against me. I admonished him and tried it again, and again, and again. Each time he allowed me to get a little farther away before charging. Eventually, I stood fifty feet across the yard, my palm out toward him. I could see the nervous energy building in him, 
He was like a volcano ready to blow. But he held fast. Okay, enough torture, I thought. I dropped my hand and yelled, Marley, come! As he catapulted forward, I squatted and clapped my hands to encourage him. Come on, boy, I coached. Come on! And come he did. He was barreling right at me. Slow it down, boy, I said. He just kept coming. Slow down! He had this vacant, crazed look on his face, and in the instant before impact, I realized the pilot had left the wheelhouse. It was a one-dog stampede. I had time for one final command. Stop! I screamed. Blam! He plowed into me without breaking stride, and I pitched backward, slamming hard to the ground. When I opened my eyes a few seconds later, he was straddling me with all four paws, lying on my chest and desperately licking my face. How did I do, boss? Technically speaking, he had followed orders exactly. After all, I had failed to mention anything about stopping once he got to me. Jenny peered out the kitchen window at us and shouted, I'm off to work. When you two are done making out, don't forget to close the windows. It's supposed to rain this afternoon. I gave linebacker dog a snack, then showered and headed off to work myself. When I arrived home that night, Jenny was waiting for me at the front door, and I could tell she was upset. Go look in the garage, she said. I opened the door into the garage, and the first thing I spotted was Marley, lying on his carpet, looking dejected. In that instant snapshot image, I could see that his snout and front paws were not right. They were dark brown, not their usual light yellow, caked in dried blood. Then my focus zoomed out, and I sucked in my breath. The garage, our indestructible bunker, was a shambles. Throw rugs were shredded, paint was clawed off the concrete walls. Worst of all, the doorway in which I stood looked like it had been attacked with a chipper shredder. Bits of wood were sprayed in a ten-foot semicircle around the door, which was gouged halfway through to the other side. The bottom three feet of the door jamb were missing entirely and nowhere to be found. Blood streaked the walls from where Marley had shredded his paws and muzzle. My mind flashed to poor Mrs. Niedermeyer and the chainsaw murder across the street. I felt like I was standing in the middle of a crime scene. Jenny's voice came from behind me. When I came home for lunch, everything was fine, but I could tell it was getting ready to rain. After she was back at work, an intense storm moved through, bringing with it sheets of rain, dazzling flashes of lightning, and thunder so powerful you could almost feel it thump against your chest. When she arrived home a couple hours later, Marley, standing amid the carnage of his desperate escape attempt, was in a complete panic-stricken lather. He was so pathetic she couldn't bring herself to yell at him. Besides, the incident was over. He would have no idea what he was being punished for. Over dinner, we tried to put what we were now calling the wilding in perspective. All we could figure was that, alone and terrified as the storm descended on the neighborhood, Marley decided his best chance at survival was to begin digging his way into the house. He was probably listening to some ancient denning instinct handed down from his ancestor, the wolf and he pursued his goal with a zealous efficiency I wouldn't have thought possible without the aid of heavy machinery. When the dishes were done, Jenny and I went out into the garage where Marley, back to his old self, grabbed a chew toy and bounced around us, looking for a little tug-of-war action. I held him still while Jenny sponged the blood off his fur. Then he watched us, tail wagging, as we cleaned up his handiwork, and made a list of materials we would need from the hardware store to repair the damage, the first of countless such repairs I would end up making over the course of his life. Marley seemed positively ebullient to have us out there lending a hand with his remodeling efforts. You don't have to look so happy about it, I scowled, and brought him inside for the night. Chapter 9 The Stuff Males Are Made Of Every dog needs a good veterinarian. 
Every new dog owner needs one too, mostly for the advice and reassurance. J. Butan, Dr. J. to all who knew him, was young, smart, hip, and extraordinarily kind. Now on this afternoon, Jenny and I stood in an exam room with him, discussing Marley's deepening neurosis over thunderstorms. We had hoped the chipper shredder incident in the garage was an isolated aberration, but it turned out to be just the beginning of what would become a lifelong pattern of phobic, irrational behavior. Even the hint of a storm would throw Marley into a meltdown. If we were home, he would press against us, shaking and drooling uncontrollably, his eyes darting nervously, ears folded back, tail tucked between his legs. When he was alone, he turned destructive, gouging away at whatever stood between him and perceived safety. Dr. J pressed a vial of small yellow pills into my hand and said, Don't hesitate to use these. They were sedatives that would, as he put it, take the edge off Marley's anxiety. The hope, he said, was that aided by the calming effect of the drug, Marley would be able to more rationally cope with storms and eventually realize they were nothing but a lot of harmless noise. Dr. J scruffed Marley's neck. And you probably want to start thinking seriously about having him neutered. Neutered? I repeated. You mean as in... I looked down at the enormous set of testicles, comically huge orbs, swinging between Marley's hind legs. Dr. J gazed down at them, too, and nodded. Lately, Marley, who was seven months old, had begun humping anything that moved, including our dinner guest. It'll just remove all that nervous sexual energy and make him a happier, calmer dog, he said. He promised it wouldn't dampen Marley's sunny exuberance. I don't know. What about siring a litter? Again, Dr. J seemed to be choosing his words carefully. I think you need to be realistic about that, he said. Marley's a great family pet, but I'm not sure he's got the credentials he would need to be in demand for stud. He was being as diplomatic as possible, but the expression on his face gave him away. It almost screamed out, Good God, man! For the sake of future generations, we must contain this genetic mistake at all costs. I told him we would think about it, and with our new supply of mood-altering drugs in hand, we headed home. It was at the same time as we debated slicing away Marley's manhood that Jenny was placing unprecedented demands on mine. Dr. Sherman had cleared her to try to get pregnant again, the days of simply putting away the birth control pills and letting whatever might happen happen were behind us. In the insemination wars, Jenny was going on the offensive. For that, she needed me, a key ally, who controlled the flow of ammunition. Like most males, I had spent every waking moment from the age of 15 trying to convince the opposite sex that I was a worthy mating partner. Finally, I had someone who agreed. I should have been thrilled. For the first time in my life, a woman wanted me more than I wanted her. But suddenly, it was not a rollicking good romp that Jenny craved from me. It was a baby. That most joyous of acts overnight became a clinical drill involving basal temperature checks, menstrual calendars, and ovulation charts. It was all about as arousing as a tax audit. I would be, let's say, fixing the garbage disposal, and she would walk in with her calendar in hand and say, I had my last period on the 17th, which means... And she would pause to count ahead from that date. That we need to do it now! One morning when I was working in my newspaper's West Palm Beach Bureau, just ten minutes from home, Jenny called from work. Did I want to meet her at home for lunch? Then she added, Today's a good day. I think I'm ovulating. A wave of dread washed over me. Oh, God, no. Not the O word. The pressure was on. It was time to perform or perish. To quite literally rise or fall. Please don't make me, I wanted to plead into the phone. 
Instead, I said as coolly as I could, Sure. Does 12.30 work? When I opened the front door, Marley, as always, was there to greet me, but Jenny was nowhere to be found. I called out to her. In the bathroom, she answered. Out in a sec. I sorted through the mail, killing time, a general sense of doom hovering over me, the way I imagined it hovered over people waiting for their biopsy results. Hey there, sailor, a voice behind me said, and when I turned around, Jenny was standing there in a little silky two-piece thing. Her flat stomach peeked out from below the top, which hung precariously from her shoulders by two impossibly thin straps. Her legs had never looked longer. How do I look, she said, holding her hands out at her sides. She looked incredible. That's how she looked. I could tell she felt silly in this seductive getup, but it was having the intended effect. She scampered into the bedroom with me in pursuit. Soon we were on top of the sheets in each other's arms. I closed my eyes and could feel that old lost friend of mine stirring. The magic was returning. My fingers fumbled for those flimsy shoulder straps. I could feel her breath now, hot and moist on my face, and heavy, hot, moist, heavy breath. Mmm, sexy. But wait, what was that smell? Something on her breath. Something at once familiar and foreign, not exactly unpleasant, but not quite enticing either. I almost had it. It was... Milk bones? Yes, milk bones. That was it. But why has Jenny been eating milk bones? And besides, I could feel her lips on my neck. How could she be kissing my neck and breathing in my face all at once? It didn't make any... Oh. My. God. I opened my eyes. There, inches from my face filling my entire frame of vision, loomed Marley's huge head. He was panning up a storm, drool soaking into the sheets. His eyes were half-closed, and he looked entirely too in love. Bad dog! I shrieked, recoiling across the bed. No! No! Go to bed! It was too late. The magic was gone. The next morning, I made an appointment to take Marley in to have his balls cut off. I figured if I wasn't going to have sex for the rest of my life, he wasn't either. Dr. J said we could drop Marley off before we went to work and pick him up on our way home. A week later, that's just what we did. As Jenny and I got ready, Marley caromed happily off the walls, sensing an impending outing. For Marley, any trip was a good trip. It didn't matter where we were going or for how long. Take out the trash? No problem. Walk to the corner for a gallon of milk? Count me in. I began to feel pangs of guilt. He trusted us to do the right thing, and here we were, secretly plotting to emasculate him. And I felt even worse when I whistled for him and he bounded out the door and into the car with utter blind faith that I would not steer him wrong. Jenny drove, and I sat in the passenger seat. Marley was riding shotgun with his two best friends. Did life get any better than this? I cracked my window, and soon he had squirmed his way fully onto my lap and pressed his nose firmly into the narrow crack of the window. Oh, why not, I thought. This was his last ride as a fully equipped member of the male gender. He was enjoying the sensation so much, I opened the window farther and soon his entire head was out. His ears flapped behind him in the wind, and his tongue hung out like he was drunk on the ether of the city. God, was he happy. As we drove down Dixie Highway, I noticed, more with curiosity than alarm, that Marley had hooked both of his front paws over the edge of the half-open window. And now his neck and upper shoulders were hanging out of the car, too, he just needed a pair of goggles and a silk scarf to look like one of those World War I flying aces. John, he's making me nervous. He's fine. He just wants a little fresh. 
At that instant, he slid his front legs out the window until his armpits were resting on the edge of the glass. John, grab him! Grab him! Before I could do anything, Marley was off my lap and scrambling out the window of our moving car. His butt was up in the air, his hind legs clawing for a foothold. He was making his break. As his body slithered past me, I lunged for him and managed to grab the end of his tail with my left hand. Jenny was braking hard in heavy traffic. Marley dangled fully outside the moving car, suspended upside down by his tail, which I had by the most tenuous of grips. My body was twisted around in a position that didn't allow me to get my other hand on him. Marley was frantically trotting along with his front paws on the pavement. Jenny got the car stopped in the outside lane with cars lining up behind us, horns blaring. Now what? I yelled. I was stuck. I couldn't pull him back in the window. I couldn't open the door. I couldn't get my other arm out. And I didn't dare let go of him, or he would surely dash in the path of one of the angry drivers swerving around us. I held on for dear life, my face scrunched against the glass, just inches from his giant, flapping scrotum. Jenny put the flashers on and ran around to my side, where she grabbed him and held him by the collar until I could get out and help her wrestle him back into the car. Our little drama had unfolded directly in front of a gas station, and as Jenny got the car back into gear, I looked over to see that all the mechanics had come out to take in the show. I thought they were going to wet themselves, they were laughing so hard. Thanks, guys, I called out. Glad we could brighten your morning. When we got to the clinic, I walked Marley in on a tight leash, just in case he tried any more smart moves. My guilt was gone. My resolve hardened. In the waiting area, he was able to terrorize a couple of cats and tip over a stand filled with pamphlets. I turned him over to Dr. J's assistant and said, Give him the works. That night, when I picked him up, Marley was a changed dog. He was sore from the surgery and moved gingerly. His eyes were bloodshot and droopy from the anesthesia, and he was still groggy. And where those magnificent crown jewels of his had swung so proudly, there was nothing. Just a small, shriveled flap of skin. The irrepressible Marley bloodline had officially and forever come to an end. Chapter 10. The Luck of the Irish. Our lives increasingly were being defined by work. Work at the newspapers, work on the house, work trying to get pregnant, and, nearly a full-time vocation in itself, work raising Marley. We hadn't even reached our second wedding anniversary, and already we were feeling the grind of responsible, grown-up, married life. We needed to get away. We needed a vacation, just the two of us. I surprised Jenny one evening with two tickets to Ireland. We would be gone for three weeks. There would be no itineraries, no guided tours, no must-see destinations. Only a rental car, a road map, and a guide to bed and breakfast inns along the way. Just having the tickets in hand lifted a yoke from our shoulders. First, we had a few duties to dull out, and at the top of the list was Marley. We quickly ruled out a boarding kennel. He was too young, too wired, too rambunctious to be cooped up in a pen 23 hours a day. As Dr. J had predicted, neutering had not diminished Marley's exuberance one bit. We made a list of every friend, neighbor, and co-worker we could think of, then one by one crossed off names. Eventually, we were left with just one. Kathy worked in my office and was single and unattached. She grew up in the rural Midwest, loved animals, and longed to someday trade in her small apartment for a house with a yard. Best of all, she said yes. Ireland was everything we dreamed it would be, beautiful, bucolic, lazy. We simply wandered, bumping our way along the coast. All of our duties and obligations back home were just distant memories. 
As evening approached each day, we would begin looking for a place to spend the night. Invariably, these were rooms in private homes run by sweet Irish widows who doted on us, served us tea, turned down our sheets, and always seemed to ask us the same questions. So, would you two be planning to start a family soon? Jenny and I became convinced there was a national law in Ireland that required all guest beds to face a large wall-mounted likeness of either the Pope or the Virgin Mary. Some places provided both. The Irish celibate traveler law also dictated that all guest beds be extremely creaky, sounding a rousing alarm every time one of its occupants so much as rolled over. Suddenly, sex seemed so... so... Illicit. To risk sex in these surroundings was to risk shameful humiliation at the communal breakfast table the next morning. It was to risk Mrs. O'Flaherty's raised eyebrow as she served up eggs and fried tomatoes, asking with a leering grin, So, was the bed comfortable for you, too? Ireland was a coast-to-coast no-sex zone, and that was all the invitation I needed. We spent the trip bopping like bunnies. Still, Jenny couldn't stop fretting about her big baby back home. Every few days, she would feed a fistful of coins into a payphone and call home for a progress report from Kathy. I would stand outside the booth and listen to Jenny's end of the conversation. He did? Seriously? Right into traffic? You weren't hurt, were you? Oh, thank God. I would have screamed, too. What? Your shoes? Oh, no. And your purse? And he what? Wet cement, you say? What's the chance of that happening? And so it would go. Each call was a litany of transgressions, one worse than the next, many of which surprised even us, hardened survivors of the puppy wars. When we arrived home, Marley raced outside to greet us. Kathy stood in the doorway, looking tired and strained. She had the faraway gaze of a shell-shocked soldier after a particularly unrelenting battle. Her bag was packed and sitting on the front porch, ready to go. She held her car key in her hand, as if she could not wait to escape. We gave her gifts and thanked her profusely. She excused herself politely and was gone. As best as we could figure... Kathy had been unable to exert any authority at all over Marley, and even less control. With each victory, he grew bolder. He forgot all about healing, dragging her behind him wherever he wished to go. He grabbed whatever suited him, shoes, purses, pillows, and would not let go. He stole food off her plate. He even tried taking over her bed. Poor Kathy, Jenny said. She looked kind of broken, don't you think? Shattered is more like it. We probably shouldn't ask her to dog-sit for us again. No, I answered. That probably wouldn't be a good idea. The next morning, Jenny and I both started back to work. But first, I slipped the choker chain around Marley's neck and took him for a walk. He immediately lunged forward, not even pretending to try to heal. A little rusty, are we? Okay, let's try this again. Marley, heal, I ordered. By the end of the walk, my grip on the leash so tight that my knuckles had turned white, I finally managed to convince him I wasn't fooling around. If he wanted to lurch, I would choke him. If he wanted to cooperate and walk by my side, I would loosen my grip, and he would barely feel the chain around his neck. Lurch, choke, heal, breathe. It was simple enough for even Marley to grasp. As we turned into the driveway, my recalcitrant dog trotted along beside me, not perfectly, but respectably. For the first time in his life, he was actually healing, or at least attempting a close proximity of it. I would take it as a victory. Oh, yes, I sang joyously. The boss is back. Several days later, Jenny called me at the office. She had just been to see Dr. Sherman. Luck of the Irish, she said. Here we go again.
Chapter 11 The Things He Ate This pregnancy was different. Our miscarriage had taught us some important lessons, and this time we had no intention of repeating our mistakes. Most important, we kept our news the most closely guarded secret since D-Day. Except for Jenny's doctors and nurses, no one, not even our parents, was brought into our confidence. In addition to the secrecy, we were simply more measured in our excitement, even when we were alone. We began sentences with conditional clauses, such as, If everything works out. We didn't dare let our joy out of check, lest it turn and bite us. Jenny rose at dawn each morning and took Marley for a brisk walk along the water. My wife was the picture of robust health in all ways but one. She spent most days, all day long, on the verge of throwing up. But she wasn't complaining. She greeted each wave of nausea with what can only be described as gleeful acceptance, for it was a sign that the tiny experiment inside her was chugging along just fine. Indeed, it was. This time around, Essie took my videotape and recorded the first faint, grainy images of our baby. We could hear the heart beating, see its four tiny chambers pulsing. We could trace the outline of the head and count all four limbs. Dr. Sherman popped his head into the sonogram room to pronounce everything perfect, and then looked at Jenny and said in that booming voice of his, "'What are you crying for, kid?' You're supposed to be happy. Essie whacked him with her clipboard and scolded, You go away and leave her alone. Then rolled her eyes at Jenny as if to say, Men, they are so clueless. When it came to dealing with pregnant wives, clueless would describe me. I gave Jenny her space, sympathized with her in her nausea and pain. I even tried my best to indulge her increasingly bizarre and irrational behavior. I was soon on a first-name basis with the overnight clerk at the 24-hour market as I stopped in at all hours for ice cream or apples or celery or chewing gum and flavors I never knew existed. Are you sure this is clove? She says it has to be clove. As the pregnancy progressed, so did Marley's training. I worked with him every day, and now I was able to entertain our friends by yelling, Incoming! and watching him crash to the floor, all four limbs splayed. He came consistently on command, unless there was something riveting his attention, such as another dog, cat, squirrel, butterfly, mailman, or floating weed seed. He sat consistently, unless he felt strongly like standing and healed reliably, unless there was something so tempting it was worth strangling himself over. See dogs, cats, squirrels, etc. He was coming along, but that's not to say he was mellowing into a calm, well-behaved dog. If I towered over him and barked stern orders, he would obey, sometimes even eagerly. But his default setting was stuck on eternal incorrigibility. Jenny and I had the foolish notion that it would be nice to have a dog we could trust to be alone in the house for short periods. Locking him in the bunker every time we stepped out was becoming tedious, and as Jenny said, what's the point of having a dog if he can't greet you at the door when you get home? We knew full well we didn't dare leave him in the house unaccompanied if there was any possibility of a rainstorm. Even with his doggy downers, he still proved himself capable of digging quite energetically for China. When the weather was clear, though, we didn't want to have to lock him in the garage every time we stepped out for a few minutes. We began leaving him briefly while we ran to the store or dropped by a neighbor's house. Sometimes he did just fine, and we would return to find the house unscathed. On these days, we would spot his black nose pushing through the mini-blinds as he stared out the living room window waiting for us. Other days, he didn't do quite so well, and we usually knew trouble awaited us before we even opened the door, because he was not at the window, but off hiding somewhere. In Jenny's sixth month of pregnancy, we returned after being away for less than an hour to find Marley under the bed. At his size, he really had to work to get under there looking like he'd just murdered the mailman, 
guilt radiated off him. The house seemed fine, but we knew he was hiding some dark secret, and we walked from room to room trying to ascertain just what he had done wrong. Then I noticed that the foam cover to one of the stereo speakers was missing. We looked everywhere for it. Gone without a trace. Marley just might have gotten away with it had I not found incontrovertible evidence of his guilt when I went on poop patrol the next morning. Remnants of the speaker cover surfaced for days. During our next outing, Marley surgically removed the woofer cone from the same speaker. The speaker wasn't knocked over or in any way amiss. The paper cone was simply gone, as if someone had sliced it out with a razor blade. Eventually, he got around to doing the same thing to the other speaker. Another time, we came home to find that our four-legged footstool was now three-legged, and there was no sign whatsoever, not a single splinter of the missing limb. For the most part, we were philosophical about the damage. In every dog owner's life, a few cherished family heirlooms must fall. Only once was I ready to slice them open to retrieve what was rightfully mine. For her birthday, I bought Jenny an 18-karat gold necklace, a delicate chain with a tiny clasp, and she immediately put it on. But a few hours later, she pressed her hand to her throat and screamed, My necklace! It's gone! The clasp must have given out or never been fully secured. Don't panic, I told her. We haven't left the house. It's got to be right here somewhere. We began scouring the house, room by room. As we searched, I gradually became aware that Marley was more rambunctious than usual. I straightened up and looked at him. He was squirming like a centipede. When he noticed I had him in my sights, he began evasive action. Oh no, I thought. The Marley Mambo. It could mean only one thing. What's that? Jenny asked, panic rising in her voice. Hanging out of his mouth. It was thin and delicate and gold. No sudden moves, she ordered, her voice dropping to a whisper. We both froze. Okay, boy, it's all right, I coaxed like a hostage negotiator. Instinctively, Jenny and I began to circle him from opposite directions, moving with glacial slowness. It was as if he were wired with high explosives, and one false move could set him off. Easy, Marley, Jenny said in her calmest voice. Easy now. Drop the necklace and nobody gets hurt. Marley eyed us suspiciously, his head darting back and forth between us. We had him cornered, but he knew he had something we wanted. Drop it, Marley, I whispered, taking another small step forward. His whole body began to wag. I crept forward by degrees. Almost imperceptibly, Jenny closed in on his flank. We were within striking distance. We glanced at each other and knew, without speaking, what to do. We were less than two feet away from him. I nodded to Jenny and silently mouthed, On three. But before we could make our move, he threw his head back and made a loud smacking sound. The tail end of the chain, which had been dangling out of his mouth, disappeared. We dove. I forced his jaws open and pushed my whole hand into his mouth and down his throat. I probed every flap and crevice and came up empty. It's too late. He swallowed it. Jenny began slapping him on the back. Cough it up, damn it! But it was no use. The best she got out of him was a loud, satisfied burp. Marley may have won the battle, but we knew it was just a matter of time before we won the war. Nature's call was on our side. Sooner or later, what went in had to come out. As disgusting as the thought was, I knew if I poked through his excrement long enough, I would find it. Had it been, say, a silver chain or a gold-plated chain, something of any less value, my queasiness might have won out. But this chain was solid gold and had set me back a decent chunk of pay. Grossed out or not, I was going in.
For three days, instead of tossing his piles over the fence, I carefully placed each on a wide board in the grass and poked it with a tree branch while I sprayed with a garden hose, gradually washing the digested material away into the grass and leaving behind any foreign objects. I felt like a gold miner working a sluice and coming up with a treasure trove of swallowed junk, from shoelaces to guitar picks, but no necklace. Shouldn't it have come out by now? On the fourth day, I was about to give up when I spotted something odd a small brown lump about the size of a lima bean. It wasn't even close to being large enough to be the missing jewelry, yet clearly it did not belong there. As the water washed it clean, I got a glimmer of something exceptionally bright and shiny. Eureka! I had struck gold. The necklace was impossibly compressed, many times smaller than I would have guessed possible. It was as though some unknown alien power had sucked it into a mysterious dimension of space and time before spitting it out again, good as new. No, actually, better than new. Marley's stomach acids had done an amazing job. It was the most brilliant gold I had ever seen. Man, I said with a whistle, we should open a jewelry cleaning business. We can make a killing with the dowagers in Palm Beach, Jenny agreed, and went off to disinfect her recovered birthday present. She wore that gold chain for years, and every time I looked at it, I had the same vivid flashback to my brief and ultimately successful career in gold speculation. Chapter 12 Welcome to the Indigent Ward. You don't give birth to your first child every day, and so when St. Mary's Hospital in West Palm Beach offered us the option of paying extra for a luxury birthing suite, we jumped at the chance. The suites looked like upper-end hotel rooms, spacious, bright, and well-appointed with wood grain furniture, floral wallpaper, curtains, a whirlpool bath, and just for Dad, a comfy couch that folded out into a bed. Instead of standard-issue hospital food, Guests were offered a choice of gourmet dinners. When Jenny's big day came and we arrived at the hospital, overnight bag in hand, we were told there was a little problem. It must be a good day for having babies, the receptionist said cheerfully. All the birthing suites are already taken. Now wait a second, I complained. We made our reservation weeks ago. I'm sorry, the woman said with a noticeable lack of sympathy. We don't exactly have a lot of control over when mothers go into labor. She made a valid point. It wasn't like she could hurry someone along. She directed us to another floor where we would be issued a standard hospital room. But when we arrived in the maternity ward, the nurse at the counter had more bad news. Would you believe every last room is filled? What do you suggest, the parking lot? The nurse smiled calmly at me. Don't you worry, we'll find a spot for you. After a flurry of phone calls, she sent us down a long hallway and through a set of double doors where we found ourselves in a mirror image of the maternity ward we had just left, except for one obvious difference. Welcome to the indigent ward, Dr. Sherman said brightly when he breezed in a few minutes later. Don't be fooled by the bare-bones rooms. They were outfitted with some of the most sophisticated medical equipment in the hospital and the nurses were some of the best trained. Because poor women often lacked access to prenatal care, theirs were some of the highest risk pregnancies. We were in good hands, he assured us, as he broke Jenny's water. Then, as quickly as he had appeared, he was gone. Indeed, as the morning progressed and Jenny fought her way through ferocious contractions, we discovered we were in very good hands. The nurses were seasoned professionals who exuded confidence and warmth, attentively hovering over her, checking the baby's heartbeat and coaching Jenny along. I stood helplessly by, trying my best to be supportive. I began slipping out of the room to join the other men waiting in the hallway. Each of us leaned against the wall beside our respective doors as our wives screamed and moaned away. They couldn't speak English, and I couldn't speak Spanish. But that didn't matter. We were in this together. Or almost together. 
I learned that day that in America, pain relief is a luxury, not a necessity. For those who could afford it, or whose insurance covered it as ours did, the hospital provided epidurals. The Mexican women nearby were not so lucky. They were left to tough it out the old-fashioned way, and their shrieks continued to punctuate the air. As night fell, I stepped out into the hall, bearing a tiny swaddled football. I lifted my newborn son above my head for my new friends to see and called out, Es el niño! The other dads flashed big smiles and held up their thumbs in the international sign of approval. Unlike our heated struggle to name our dog, we would easily and almost instantly settle on a name for our firstborn son. He would be named Patrick for the first of my line of Grogan's to arrive in the United States from County Limerick, Ireland. A nurse came into our cubicle and told us a birthing suite was now available. It seemed rather beside the point to change rooms now, but she helped Jenny into a wheelchair, placed our son in her arms, and whisked us away. The gourmet dinner wasn't all it was cracked up to be. During the weeks leading up to her due date, Jenny and I had had long strategy talks about how best to acclimate Marley to the new arrival who would instantly knock him off his, until now, undisputed perch as most favored dependent. We had heard stories of dogs becoming terribly jealous of infants and acting out in unacceptable ways. In the 36 hours that Jenny remained hospitalized recuperating after birth, I made frequent trips home to visit Marley, armed with receiving blankets and anything else that carried the baby's scent. On one of my visits, I even brought home a tiny used disposable diaper, which Marley sniffed with such vigor I feared he might suck it up his nostril. When I finally brought mother and child home, Marley was oblivious. Jenny placed baby Patrick, asleep in his car carrier, in the middle of our bed and then joined me in greeting Marley. Marley followed Jenny into the bedroom, jamming his nose deep into her overnight bag as she unpacked. He clearly had no idea there was a living thing sitting on our bed. Then Patrick stirred and let out a small bird-like chirp. Marley's ears pulled up and he froze. Where did that come from? Patrick chirped again, and Marley lifted one paw in the air, pointing like a bird dog. My God! He was pointing at our baby boy like a hunting dog would point at prey. Then he lunged. It was not a ferocious kill-the-enemy lunge. There were no bared teeth or growls. But it wasn't a welcome-to-the-neighborhood-little-buddy lunge either. His chest hit the mattress with such force that the entire bed jolted across the floor. Patrick was wide awake now, eyes wide. Marley recoiled and lunged again, this time bringing his mouth within inches of our newborn's toes. Jenny dove for the baby, and I dove for the dog, pulling him back by the collar with both hands. Marley was beside himself, straining to get at this new creature that somehow had snuck into our inner sanctum. Jenny unbuckled Patrick from his car seat. I pinned Marley between my legs and held him tightly by the collar with both fists. Marley meant no harm. He was panning with that dopey grin of his. His eyes were bright and his tail was wagging. As I held tight, Jenny gradually came closer, allowing Marley to sniff first the baby's toes, then his feet and calves and thighs. When Marley reached the diaper, he seemed to enter an altered state of consciousness, a sort of pampers-induced trance. He had reached the Holy Land, the dog looked positively euphoric. One false move, Marley, and you're toast, Jenny warned. But we soon learned our problem was not keeping Marley from hurting our precious baby boy. Our problem was keeping him out of the diaper pail. As the days turned into weeks and the weeks into months, Marley came to accept Patrick as his new best friend. One night, early on, as I was turning off the lights to go to bed, I couldn't find Marley anywhere. Finally, I thought to look in the nursery, and there he was, stretched out on the floor beside Patrick's crib, 
the two of them snoring away in stereophonic, fraternal bliss. Marley, our wild, crashing bronco, seemed to understand that this was a fragile, defenseless little human, and he moved gingerly when he was near him, licking his face and ears delicately. As Patrick began crawling, Marley would lie quietly on the floor and let the baby scale him like a mountain, tugging on his ears, poking his eyes, and pulling out little fistfuls of fur. None of it fazed him. Marley just sat like a statue. He was a gentle giant around Patrick, and he accepted his second fiddle status with bonhomie and good-natured resignation. Jenny and I settled into a routine. At nighttime, she would get up with Patrick every few hours to nurse him, and I would take the 6 a.m. feeding so she could sleep in. Half asleep, I would pluck him from his crib, change his diaper, and make a bottle of formula for him. Then the payoff. I would sit on the back porch with his tiny warm body nestled against my stomach as he sucked on the bottle. Sometimes I would let my face rest against the top of his head and doze off as he ate lustily. Sometimes I would listen to national public radio and watch the dawn sky turn from purple to pink to blue. When he was fed and I had gotten a good burp out of him, I would get us both dressed, whistle for Marley, and take a morning walk along the water. Parenthood, we found, suited us well. We settled into its rhythms, celebrated its simple joys, and grinned our way through its frustrations, knowing even the bad days, soon enough, would be cherished memories. We had everything we could ask for. We had our precious baby. We had our numbskull dog. We had our little house by the water. Of course, we also had each other. That November, my newspaper promoted me to columnist, a coveted position that gave me my own space on the section front three times a week to spout off about whatever I wanted. Life was good. When Patrick was nine months old, Jenny wondered aloud when we might want to start thinking about having another baby. Oh, gee, I don't know, I said. We always knew we wanted more than one, but I hadn't really thought about a time frame. Repeating everything we had just gone through seemed like something best not rushed into. I guess we could just go back off birth control and see what happens. Ah, the old case sera sera school of family planning. So that is what we did. We figured if we conceived any time in the next year, the timing would be about right. Jenny did the math. Let's say six months to get pregnant and then nine more months to deliver. That would put two full years between them. It sounded good to me. Two years was next to an eternity. A week later, Jenny was knocked up. Chapter 13 A Scream in the Night When Patrick was not quite a year old, murder came again to our block. Like Mrs. Niedermeyer, the victim was an elderly woman who lived alone. Hers was the first house as she turned onto Churchill Road off Dixie Highway, directly behind the all-night open-air laundromat, and I only knew her to wave to as I passed. The attacker was a stranger who snuck into her house while she was in the backyard hanging her laundry on a Saturday afternoon. When she returned, he bound her wrist with telephone cord and shoved her beneath a mattress as he ransacked the house for money. He fled with his plunder as my frail neighbor slowly suffocated beneath the weight of the mattress. Police quickly arrested a drifter who had been seen hanging around the coin laundry. When they emptied his pockets, they found his total haul had been $16 and change, the price of a human life. The crime swirling around us made us grateful for Marley's bigger-than-life presence in our house. When strangers came to our door, we no longer locked Marley away before answering. We stopped assuring them how harmless he was. We had a baby now, and another on the way. Jenny and I often speculated about just what, if anything, Marley would do if someone ever tried to hurt the baby or us. I tended to think he would merely grow frantic. Jenny placed more faith in him. 
She was convinced his special loyalty to us, especially to his new Cheerios pusher Patrick, would translate in a crisis to a fierce primal protectiveness that would rise up from deep within him. Then one night he settled the dispute once and for all. It was October, and the weather still had not turned. The night was sweltering. I was just drifting off when I heard it, a shrill, sustained, piercing noise. I was instantly wide awake, and Marley was too. He stood frozen beside the bed in the dark, ears cocked. It came again, penetrating the sealed windows, rising above the hum of the air conditioner. A woman's scream, loud and unmistakable. There was desperation in it, real terror, and it was dawning on me that someone was in terrible trouble. Come on, boy. I slipped out of bed. Don't go out there. I hadn't realized Jenny was awake, too. Call the police. I'll be careful. Holding Marley by the end of his choker chain, I stepped out onto the front porch in my boxer shorts, just in time to glimpse a figure sprinting down the street toward the water. The scream came again from the opposite direction. Outside, without the walls and glass to buffet it, the woman's voice filled the night air with an amazing, piercing velocity, the likes of which I had heard only in horror movies. Other porch lights were flicking on. The two young men who shared a rental house across the street from me burst outside wearing nothing but cutoffs and ran toward the screams. I followed, Marley tight by my side. I saw them run up on a lawn a few houses away and then, seconds later, come dashing back toward me. Go to the girl, one of them shouted, pointing. She's been stabbed. We're going after him, the other one yelled, and they sprinted off barefoot down the street in the direction the figure had fled. My neighbor Barry, a fearless single woman, jumped into her car and joined the chase. I let go of Marley's collar and ran toward the scream. Three doors down, I found my 17-year-old neighbor standing alone in her driveway, bent over, sobbing in jagged, raspy gasps. She clasped her ribs, and beneath her hands I could see a circle of blood spreading across her blouse. She was a thin, pretty girl with sand-colored hair that fell over her shoulders. She lived in the house with her divorced mother, a pleasant woman who worked as a night nurse. I had chatted a few times with the mother, but I only knew her daughter to wave to. I didn't even know her name. He said not to scream or he'd stab me, she said, sobbing. Her words gushed out in heaving, hyperventilated gulps. But I screamed, I screamed, and he stabbed me. As if I might not believe her, she lifted her shirt to show me the puckered wound that had punctured her ribcage. I was sitting in my car with the radio on. He just came out of nowhere. I put my hand on her arm to calm her, and as I did, I saw her knees buckling. She collapsed into my arms, her legs folding fawn-like beneath her. I eased her down to the pavement and sat cradling her. Her words came softer, calmer now, and she fought to keep her eyes open. He told me not to scream she kept saying. You did the right thing, I said. You scared him away. It occurred to me that she was going into shock, and I had not the first idea what to do about it. Come on, ambulance, where are you? I comforted her in the only way I knew how, as I would comfort my own child, stroking her hair, holding my palm against her cheek, wiping her tears away. As she grew weaker, I kept telling her to hang on. Help was on the way. You're going to be okay. I wasn't sure I believed it. Her skin was ashen. We sat alone on the pavement like that for what seemed hours, but was in actuality, the police report later showed, about three minutes. Only gradually did I think to check on what had become of Marley. When I looked up, there he stood, ten feet from us, facing the street, in a determined, bull-like crouch I had never seen before. It was a fighter's stance. His muscles bulged at the neck, his jaw was clenched, the fur between his shoulder blades bristled. He was intensely focused on the street and appeared poised to lunge. 
I realized in that instant that Jenny had been right. If the armed assailant returned, he would have to get past my dog first. At that moment, I absolutely knew, without doubt, that Marley would fight him to the death before he would let him at us. I was emotional anyway as I held this young girl, wondering if she was dying in my arms. The sight of Marley so uncharacteristically guarding us like that, so majestically fierce, brought tears to my eyes. Man's best friend? Damn straight he was. I've got you, I told the girl. But what I meant to say, what I should have said, was that we had her, Marley and me. The police are coming. Hold on. Please, just hold on. Before she closed her eyes, she whispered, My name is Lisa. I'm John. It seemed ridiculous introducing ourselves in these circumstances as though we were at a neighborhood potluck. I almost laughed. Instead, I tucked a strand of her hair behind her ear and said, You're safe now, Lisa. Like an archangel sent from heaven, a police officer came charging up the sidewalk. I whistled to Marley and called, It's okay, boy. He's okay. And it was as if, with that whistle, I had broken some kind of trance. My goofy, good-natured pal was back. Soon an ambulance crew arrived with a stretcher and wads of sterile gauze. I stepped out of the way, told the police what I could, and walked home, Marley loping ahead of me. Jenny met me at the door, and together we stood in the front window watching the drama unfold on the street. You would have been proud of Marley. He felt the danger, and he was like a completely different dog. I told you so, and she had. It said something about South Florida's numbness to crime that the stabbing of a teenage girl as she sat in her car in front of her home would merit just six sentences in the morning newspaper. The story made no mention of me or Marley or the guys across the street who set out half-naked after the assailant. It didn't mention Barry, who gave chase in her car, or all the neighbors up and down the block who turned on porch lights and dialed 911. The knife had punctured Lisa's lung, and she spent five days in the hospital and several weeks recuperating at home. Her mother kept the neighbors apprised of her recovery, but the girl remained inside and out of sight. I worried about the emotional wounds the attack might leave. Would she ever again be comfortable leaving the safety of her home? Our lives had come together for just three minutes, but I felt invested in her as a brother might be in a kid's sister. Then as I washed the cars in the driveway on a Saturday, Marley chained up beside me. I looked up, and there she stood. Prettier than I had remembered. Tan, strong, athletic-looking, whole again. She smiled. Remember me? Let's see. Weren't you the one in front of me at the Tom Petty concert who wouldn't sit down? She laughed. So how are you doing, Lisa? I'm good, just about back to normal. You look great, a little better than the last time I saw you. Yeah, well, what a night. What a night, I repeated. That was all we said about it. She told me about the hospital, the doctors, the detectives who interviewed her, the endless fruit baskets, the boredom of sitting at home as she healed. But she steered clear of the attack, and so did I. Some things were best left behind. Lisa stayed a long time that afternoon, following me around the yard as I did chores, playing with Marley, making small talk. I sensed there was something she wanted to say but could not bring herself to. She was seventeen. I didn't expect her to find the words. Our lives had collided without plan or warning. In a heartbeat, there we were, intimately locked together in crisis, a dad in boxer shorts and a teenage girl in a blood-soaked blouse, clinging to each other and to hope. There was a closeness there now. How could there not be? There was also awkwardness, a slight embarrassment, for in that moment we had caught each other with our guards down. We had shared something that night on the pavement, one of those brief, fleeting moments of clarity that define all the others in a life that neither of us would soon forget. 
By the time she left, I had a good feeling about this girl. She was strong. She would move forward. And indeed, I found out years later when I learned she had built a career for herself as a television broadcaster that she had. Chapter 14 An Early Arrival John? Through the fog of sleep, I gradually registered my name being called. It was Jenny. She was shaking me. John, I think the baby might be coming. I propped myself up on an elbow and rubbed my eyes. Jenny was lying on her side, knees pulled to her chest. The baby what? I'm having bad cramps, she said. I've been lying here timing them. We need to call Dr. Sherman. I was wide awake now. Jenny was 21 weeks into the pregnancy, barely halfway through the 40-week gestation period. Among her motherhood books was a collection of high-definition in vitro photographs showing a fetus at each week of development. At 21 weeks, a fetus can fit in the palm of a hand. It weighs less than a pound. Its eyes are fused shut, its fingers like fragile little twigs, its lungs not yet developed enough to distill oxygen from air. At 21 weeks, a baby is barely viable. The chance of surviving outside the womb is small, and the chance of surviving without serious long-term health problems, smaller yet. It's probably nothing, I said but I could feel my heart pounding as I speed-dialed the OBGYN answering service. Two minutes later, Dr. Sherman called back, sounding groggy himself. It might just be gas, but we better have a look. He told me to get Jenny to the hospital immediately. Sorry, Mar, I told him as I led him out to the garage, grave disappointment on his face. You've got to hold down the fort. I scooped Patrick out of his crib, buckled him into his car seat without waking him, and into the night we went. At St. Mary's Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, the nurses quickly went to work. They got Jenny into a hospital gown and hooked her to a monitor that measured contractions and the baby's heartbeat. Sure enough, Jenny was having a contraction every six minutes. "'Your baby wants to come out,' one of the nurses said." We're going to do everything we can to make sure he doesn't just yet. Dr. Sherman ordered an intravenous saline drip and an injection of the labor inhibitor breathing. The contractions leveled out, but less than two hours later, they were back again. For the next 12 days, Jenny remained hospitalized. Poor Marley's status dropped precipitously from second fiddle to not even in the orchestra. Even as I ignored him, he faithfully followed me as I careened through the house with Patrick in one arm, vacuuming or toting laundry or fixing a meal with the other. One night, after I finally got Patrick to sleep, I fell back on the couch exhausted. Marley pranced over and dropped his rope tug toy in my lap and looked up at me with those giant brown eyes of his. Sorry, pal, not tonight. He crinkled his brow and cocked his head. His mistress was mysteriously absent, his master no fun, and nothing the same. He let out a little whine, and I could see he was trying to figure it out. Life wasn't completely bleak for Marley. On the bright side, I had quickly reverted to my pre-marriage, read slovenly, lifestyle. I suspended the married couple domesticity act and proclaimed the once banished bachelor rules to be the law of the land. While Jenny was in the hospital, shirts would be worn twice, even three times, barring obvious mustard stains, between washes. Milk could be drunk directly from the carton, and toilet seats would remain in the upright position unless being sat on. Much to Marley's delight, I instituted a 24-7 open-door policy for the bathroom. From there, it only made sense to let him start drinking from the bathtub tap. Now that the seat-up policy was firmly in place, 
I needed to offer Marley a viable alternative to that attractive porcelain pool. I got into the habit of turning the bathtub faucet on at a trickle while I was in the bathroom so Marley could lap up some cool, fresh water. The dog could not have been more thrilled had I built him an exact replica of Splash Mountain. He would twist his head up under the faucet and lap away, tail banging the sink behind him. I soon realized I had created a bathtub monster. Pretty soon, Marley began going into the bathroom alone without me and standing there, staring forlornly at the faucet, licking at it for any lingering drop, flicking the drain knob with his nose until I couldn't stand it any longer and would come in and turn it on for him. The next step on our descent into barbarity came when I was showering. I'd be lathering up, and without warning, his big tawny head would pop in, and he'd begin lapping at the shower spray. Just don't tell Mom. I tried to fool Jenny into thinking I had everything effortlessly under control. Oh, we're totally fine. Turning to Patrick, aren't we, partner? To which he would give his standard reply, Da-da! and then pointing at the ceiling fan. Fan! She knew better. One day when I arrived with Patrick for our daily visit, she stared at us in disbelief. What in God's name did you do to him? What do you mean? He's great. You're great, aren't you? Da-da! Fan! His outfit! How on earth? Only then did I see. Something was amiss with Patrick's onesie. His chubby thighs were squeezed into the armholes, which were so tight they must have been cutting off his circulation. The collared neck hung between his legs like an udder. Up top, Patrick's head stuck out through the unsnapped crotch, and his arms were lost somewhere in the billowing pant legs. It was quite a look. You goof! You've got it on him upside down! That's your opinion, I said. But the game was up. Jenny began working the phone from her hospital bed, and a couple of days later, my sweet dear Anna Nita, a retired nurse who had come to America from Ireland as a teenager and now lived across the state from us, magically appeared, suitcase in hand, and cheerfully went about restoring order. The bachelor rules were history. When her doctors finally let Jenny come home, it was with the strictest of orders— if she wanted to deliver a healthy baby, she was to remain in bed as still as possible. The only time she was allowed on her feet was to go to the bathroom. Complete bed rest, no cheating, for the next 12 weeks. A hospital technician came to our home and attached a small battery-powered pump to Jenny's leg that delivered a continuous trickle of labor-inhibiting drugs into her bloodstream. Jenny was trying to keep her spirits up, but the boredom, the tedium, the hourly uncertainty about the health of her unborn child were conspiring to drag her down. Worst of all, she was a mother with a 15-month-old son whom she was not allowed to lift, feed, or scoop up and kiss. I would drop him on top of her on the bed where he would pull her hair and stick his fingers into her mouth. He'd point to the whirling paddles above the bed and say, Mama, fan. It made her smile, but it wasn't the same. She was slowly going stir-crazy. Her constant companion through it all, of course, was Marley. He set up camp on the floor beside her and held vigil, day and night. I tried to be encouraging, saying things like, A year from now, we're going to look back on this and laugh but I could tell part of her was slipping from me. Some days her eyes were very far away. When Jenny had a full month of bed rest still to go, Anna Nita packed her suitcase and kissed us goodbye. She had stayed as long as she could, in fact, extending her visit several times. Once again, we were on our own. I did my best to keep the ship afloat, but the grass went uncut, the laundry unwashed, and the screen on the back porch remained unrepaired after Marley crashed through it, cartoon-style, in pursuit of a squirrel. For weeks, the shredded screen door flapped in the breeze, becoming a de facto doggy door 
that allowed Marley to come and go as he pleased between the backyard and house during the long hours home alone with the bedridden Jenny. I could see dismay in Jenny's eyes. It took all of her self-control not to jump out of bed and whip her home back into shape. Then one day, as we approached Jenny's 35th week of pregnancy, the hospital technician arrived at her door and said, Congratulations, girl. You've made it. You're free again. She unhooked the medicine pump, packed up the fetal monitor, and went over the doctor's written orders. Jenny was free to return to her regular lifestyle. The baby was fully viable now. Have fun, she said. You deserve it. Jenny tossed Patrick over her head, romped with Marley in the backyard, tore into the housework. That night we celebrated by going out for Indian food and catching a show at a local comedy club. The next day the three of us continued the festivities by having lunch at a Greek restaurant. Before the gyros ever made it to our table, however, Jenny was in full-blown labor. The cramps had begun the night before as she ate curried lamb, but she wasn't going to let a few contractions interrupt her hard-earned night on the town. By the time we got to the hospital and checked into a room, Jenny was dilated to seven centimeters. Less than an hour later, I held our new son in my arms. You did it, Dr. Sherman declared. He's perfect. Connor Richard Grogan, five pounds and 13 ounces, was born October 10, 1993. I was so happy I barely gave a second thought to the cruel irony that for this pregnancy we had raided one of the luxury suites but had hardly a moment to enjoy it. If the delivery had been any quicker, Jenny would have given birth in the parking lot of the Texaco station. I hadn't even had time to stretch out on the dad couch. Considering what we had been through to bring him safely into this world, we thought the birth of our son was big news, but not so big that the local news media would turn out for it. Below our window, though, a crush of television news trucks gathered in the parking lot, their satellite dishes poking into the sky. I could see reporters with microphones doing their stand-ups in front of the cameras. Hey, honey, I said, the paparazzi have turned out for you. A nurse who was in the room attending to the baby said, Can you believe it? Donald Trump is right down the hall. The real estate tycoon had caused quite a stir when he moved to Palm Beach several years earlier. I flicked on the TV and learned that the Donald and girlfriend Marla Maples were the proud parents of a girl appropriately named Tiffany, who was born not long after Jenny delivered Connor. We'll have to invite them over for a play date, Jenny said. We watched from the window as the television crews swarmed in to catch the Trumps leaving the hospital with their new baby to return to their estate. Marla smiled demurely as she held her newborn for the cameras to capture. Donald waved and gave a jaunty wink. I feel great, he told the cameras. Then they were off in a chauffeured limousine. The next morning, when our turn came to leave for home, a pleasant retiree who volunteered at the hospital guided Jenny and baby Connor through the lobby in a wheelchair and out the automatic doors into the sunshine. There were no camera crews, no satellite trucks, no sound bites, no live reports. It was just us and our senior volunteer. Not that anyone was asking, but I felt great too. Before buckling my newborn son into his car seat, I lifted him high above my head for the whole world to see, had anyone been looking, and said, Connor Grogan, you are every bit as special as Tiffany Trump. And don't you ever forget it. Chapter 15 A Postpartum Ultimatum These should have been the happiest days of our lives, and in many ways they were. We had two sons now, a toddler and a newborn, just 17 months apart. The joy they brought us was profound. Yet the darkness that had descended over Jenny while she was on forced bed rest persisted. Some weeks she was fine, cheerfully tackling the challenges of being responsible for two lives completely dependent on her for every need. Other weeks, without warning, she would turn glum and defeated, 
locked in a blue fog that sometimes would not lift for days. We were both exhausted and sleep-deprived. Patrick was still waking us at least once in the night, and Connor was up several more times, crying to be nursed or changed. Seldom did we get more than two hours of uninterrupted sleep at a stretch. Some nights we were like zombies, moving silently past each other with glazed eyes, Jenny to one baby and I to the other. We were up at midnight and at two and at 3.30 and again at five. Then the sun would rise and with it another day, bringing renewed hope and a bone-aching weariness as we began the cycle over again. From down the hall would come Patrick's sweet, cheery, wide-awake voice, Mama, Dada, Than! And as much as we tried to will it otherwise, we knew sleep, what there had been of it, was behind us for another day. I began making the coffee stronger and showing up at work with shirts wrinkled and baby spit up on my ties. One morning in my newsroom, I caught the young, attractive editorial assistant staring intently at me. Flattered, I smiled at her. Hey, I might be a dad twice over now, but the women still noticed me. Then she said, Do you know you have a Barney sticker in your hair? Complicating the sleep-deprived chaos that was our lives, our new baby had us terribly worried. Already underweight, Connor was unable to keep nourishment down. Jenny would offer him her breast, and he would oblige her, suckling hungrily. Then in one quick heave, he would throw it all up. Over and over, the routine repeated itself, each time Jenny becoming more frantic. The doctors diagnosed reflux and referred us to a specialist. For four long months, we were consumed with worry over him. Jenny was a basket case of fear and stress and frustration, all exacerbated by lack of sleep, as she nursed him nearly nonstop and then watched helpless as he tossed her milk back at her. Her fuse was as short as I had seen it, and the smallest infractions, a cupboard door left open, crumbs on the counter, would set her off. The good news was Jenny never once took out her anxiety on either baby. In fact, she nurtured both of them with almost obsessive care and patience. She poured every ounce of herself into them. The bad news was that she directed her frustration and anger at me, and even more at Marley. She had lost all patience with him. He was squarely in her crosshairs and could do no right. Each transgression, and there continued to be many, pushed Jenny a little closer to the edge. Oblivious, Marley stayed the course with his antics and misdeeds and boundless ebullience. I bought a flowering shrub and planted it in the garden to commemorate Connor's birth. Marley pulled it out by the roots the same day and chewed it into mulch. I finally got around to replacing the ripped porch screen, and Marley, by now quite accustomed to his self-made doggy door, promptly dove through it again. He escaped one day, and when he finally returned, he had a pair of women's panties in his teeth. I didn't want to know. I started covering for him. When he crashed through our small home, the bowl in our china closet, I followed behind him, straightening throw rugs, writing coffee tables, and wiping up the spittle he flung on the walls. Before Jenny discovered them, I would race to vacuum up the wood chips in the garage where he had gouged the door once again. It was into this volatile environment that I walked one evening. I opened the front door to find Jenny beating Marley with her fists. She was crying uncontrollably and flailing wildly at him, more like she was pounding a kettle drum than imposing a beating, landing glancing blows on his back and shoulders and neck. Why? Why do you wreck everything? In that instant, I saw what he had done. The couch cushion was gouged open, the fabric shredded, and the stuffing pulled out. Marley didn't try to flee or dodge the blows. He just stood there and took each one without whimper or complaint. Hey! 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 I shouted, grabbing her wrist. Come on! Stop! Stop! She was sobbing and gasping for breath. It was like a stranger was staring back at me. I did not recognize the look in her eyes. Get him out of here, she said, 
her voice flat and tinged with a quiet burn. Get him out of here now. I opened the front door and he bounded outside. And when I turned back to grab his leash off the table, Jenny said, I mean it. I'm done with that dog. You find him a new home or I will. She couldn't mean it. She loved this dog. She adored him despite his laundry list of shortcomings. She was upset. She was stressed to the breaking point. She would reconsider. For the moment, I thought it was best to give her time to cool down. I walked out the door without another word. In the front yard, Marley raced around, his old jolly self. Out in the street, I hooked him to his leash and ordered, Sit! He sat. I pulled the choker chain up high on his throat in preparation for our walk. Before I stepped off, I ran my hand over his head and massaged his neck. He flipped his nose in the air and looked up at me, his tongue hanging halfway down his neck. The incident with Jenny appeared to be behind him. Now I hoped it would be behind her as well. Marley and I walked for miles that evening, and when I finally opened the front door, he was exhausted and ready to collapse quietly in the corner. Jenny was feeding Patrick a jar of baby food as she cradled Connor in her lap. She was calm and appeared back to her old self. I unleashed Marley and he took a huge drink, lapping lustily at the water, sloshing little tidal waves over the side of his bowl. I toweled up the floor and stole a glance in Jenny's direction. She appeared unperturbed. Maybe the horrible moment had passed. Maybe she had reconsidered. As I walked past her, Marley close at my heels, she said in a calm, quiet voice without looking at me, I'm dead serious. I want him out of here. Over the next several days, she repeated the ultimatum enough times that I finally accepted that this was not an idle threat. She wasn't just blowing off steam, and the issue was not going away. I was sick about it. As pathetic as it sounds, Marley had become my male-bonding soulmate, my near-constant companion, my friend. He was the undisciplined, recalcitrant, nonconformist, politically incorrect free spirit I had always wanted to be, had I been brave enough. The thought of giving him up seared my soul. But I had two children to worry about now, and a wife whom we needed. Our household was being held together by the most tenuous of threads. If losing Marley made the difference between meltdown and stability, how could I not honor Jenny's wishes? Each morning I opened the newspaper to the classifieds as if I might find some miracle ad. Seeking, wildly energetic, out-of-control Labrador retriever with multiple phobias. Destructive qualities a plus. Will pay top dollar. What I found instead was a booming trade in young adult dogs that, for whatever reason, had not worked out. Many were purebreds that their owners had spent several hundred dollars for just months earlier. An alarming number of the unwanted dogs were male labs. The ads were at once heartbreaking and hilarious, full of sunny euphemisms for the types of behavior I knew all too well. Lively, loves people, needs big yard, needs room to run, energetic, spirited, powerful, one of a kind. When I read fiercely loyal, I knew the seller really meant known to bite. Constant companion meant suffer separation anxiety. And good watchdog translated to incessant barker. And when I saw best offer, I knew too well that the desperate owner really was asking, how much do I need to pay you to take this thing off my hands? Part of me ached with sadness. I was not a quitter. I did not believe Jenny was a quitter either. Marley was nothing like the stately dogs both of us had grown up with. He had a host of bad habits and behaviors. He also had come a great distance from the spastic puppy we had brought home two years earlier. In his own flawed way, he was trying. Part of our journey as his owners was to mold him to our needs. 
but part also was to accept him for what he was. He was a part of our family, and for all his flaws, devotion such as his could not be bought for any price. I was not ready to give up on him. Even as I continued to make half-hearted inquiries about finding Marley a new home, I began working with him in earnest. I began rising at dawn, buckling Patrick into the jogging stroller, and heading down to the water to put Marley through the paces. Sit, stay, down, heel. Over and over we practiced. There was a desperation to my mission, and Marley seemed to sense it. The stakes were different now. This was for real. By the time I re-enrolled Marley in obedience school, he was a different dog from the juvenile delinquent I had first shown up with. Yes, still wild as a boar, but this time he knew I was the boss and he was the underling. This time there would be no lunges toward other dogs, or at least not many. No out-of-control surges across the tarmac, no crashing into strangers' crotches. Through eight weekly sessions, I marched him through the commands on a tight leash. At our final meeting, the trainer, a relaxed woman who was the antithesis of Miss Dominatrix, called us forward. Okay, she said. Show us what you got. I ordered Marley into a sit position, and he dropped neatly to his haunches. I raised the choker chain high around his throat, and with a crisp tug of the lead, ordered him to heel. We trotted across the parking lot and back, Marley at my side, his shoulder brushing my cap, just as the book said it should. I ordered him to sit again, and I stood directly in front of him and pointed my finger at his forehead. Stay, I said calmly, and with the other hand I dropped his leash. I stepped backward several paces. His big brown eyes fixed on me. I walked in a 360-degree circle around him. He quivered with excitement, but he did not budge. When I was back in front of him, just for kicks, I snapped my finger and yelled, Incoming! He hit the deck like he was storming Iwo Jima. The teacher burst out laughing, a good sign. I turned my back on him and walked 30 feet away. The volcano was getting ready to blow. Then, spreading my feet into a wide boxer's stance in anticipation of what was coming, I said, Marley? I let his name hang in the air for a few seconds. Come! He shot at me with everything he had, and I braced for impact. At the last instant, I deftly sidestepped him with a bullfighter's grace, and he blasted past me, then circled back and goosed me from behind with his nose. Good boy, Marley! I gushed, dropping to my knees. Good boy! Good boy! He danced around me like we had just conquered Mount Everest together. At the end of the evening, the instructor called us up and handed us our diploma. Marley had passed basic obedience training, ranking seventh in his class. So what if it was a class of eight and the eighth dog was a psychopathic pit bull? I would take it. Marley, my incorrigible, untrainable, undisciplined dog, had passed. I was so proud, I could have cried. There was still one piece of unfinished business between Marley and me. I needed to break him of his worst habit of all, jumping on people. It didn't matter if it was a friend or a stranger, a child or an adult, the meter reader or the UPS driver. Marley greeted them the same way, by charging at them full speed, sliding across the floor, leaping up and planting his two front paws on the person's chest or shoulders as he licked their face. What had been cute when he was a cuddly puppy had turned obnoxious, even terrifying for some recipients of his uninvited advances. I had tried without success to break him of jumping up, using standard dog obedience techniques. The message was not getting through. Then a veteran dog owner I respected said, You want to break him of that? Give him a swift knee in the chest next time he jumps up on you. I don't want to hurt him, I said. You won't hurt him. A few good jabs with your knee, and I guarantee you he'll be done jumping. It was tough love time. Marley had to reform or relocate. The next night when I arrived home from work, 
I stepped in the front door and yelled, I'm home! As usual, Marley came barreling across the wood floors to greet me. He slid the last ten feet as though on ice, then lifted off to smash his paws into my chest and slurp at my face. Just as his paws made contact with me, I gave one swift pump of my knee, connecting in the soft spot just below his ribcage. He gasped slightly and slid down to the floor, looking up at me with a wounded expression, trying to figure out what had gotten into me. He had been jumping on me his whole life. What was with the sudden sneak attack? The next night I repeated the punishment. He leapt, I need. He dropped to the floor, coughing. I felt a little cruel, but if I were going to save him from the classifieds, I knew I had to drive home the point. Sorry, guy, I said, leaning down so he could lick me with all four paws on the ground. It's for your own good. The third night when I walked in, he came charging around the corner, going into his typical high-speed skid as he approached. This time, however, he altered the routine. Instead of leaping, he kept his paws on the ground and crashed headfirst into my knees, nearly knocking me over. I'd take that as a victory. You did it, Marley! You did it! Good boy! You didn't jump up! And I got on my knees so he could slobber me without risking a sucker punch. I was impressed. Marley had bent to the power of persuasion. The problem was not exactly solved, however. He may have been cured of jumping on me, but he was not cured of jumping on anyone else. The dog was smart enough to figure out that only I posed a threat, and he could still jump on the rest of the human race with impunity. I needed to widen my offensive, and to do that I recruited a good friend of mine from work, a reporter named Jim Tolpin. Jim was a mild-mannered, bookish sort, balding, bespectacled, and of slight build. If there was anyone Marley thought he could jump up on without consequence, it was Jim. That night, Jim rang the bell and walked in the door. Sure enough, Marley took the bait and raced at him, ears flying back. When Marley left the ground to leap up on him, Jim dealt a withering blow with his knee to Marley's solar plexus, knocking the wind out of him. The thud was audible across the room. Marley let out a loud groan, went bug-eyed, and sprawled on the floor. Marley got to his feet, caught his breath, and greeted Jim the way a dog should, on all four paws. If he could have talked, I swear he would have cried uncle. Marley never again jumped up on anyone, at least not in my presence, and no one ever need him in the chest or anywhere else again. One morning, shortly thereafter, I woke up and my wife was back. My Jenny, the woman I loved who had disappeared into that unyielding blue fog, had returned to me. As suddenly as the postpartum depression had swept over her, it swept away again. She was strong, she was upbeat, she was not only coping as a young mother of two, but thriving. Marley was back in her good graces, safely on solid ground. With a baby in each arm, she leaned to kiss him. She threw him sticks and made him gravy from hamburger drippings. She danced him around the room when a good song came on the stereo. Sometimes at night, when he was calm, I would find her lying on the floor with him, her head resting on his neck. Jenny was back. Thank God she was back. Chapter 16 the audition. Jenny's supervisor at the Palm Beach Post had a friend who needed to ask a favor of us. The friend was a local photographer named Colleen McGar, who had been hired by a New York City film production company called The Shooting Gallery to help with a movie they planned to make in Lake Worth, the town just south of us. Colleen's job was to find a quintessential South Florida household and photograph it top to bottom the bookshelves, the refrigerator magnets, the closets, you name it, to help the directors bring realism to the film. The whole set crew is gay, Jenny's boss told her. They're trying to figure out how married couples with kids live around here. Colleen came over and started photographing, not just our possessions, but us too, 
the way we dressed, the way we wore our hair, the way we slouched on the couch. She photographed toothbrushes on the sink. She photographed the babies in their cribs. She photographed the quintessentially heterosexual couple's eunuch dog, too, or at least what she could catch of him on film. As she observed, he's a bit of a blur. Marley could not have been more thrilled to participate. Ever since babies had invaded, Marley took his affection where he could find it. Colleen, being a lover of large animals and not intimidated by saliva showers, gave him plenty, dropping to her knees to wrestle with him. As Colleen clicked away, I couldn't help thinking of the possibilities. Not only were we supplying raw anthropological data to the filmmakers, we were essentially being given our own personal casting call. I could just picture the director freezing over a single snapshot. In it, a rugged yet sensitive, quintessentially heterosexual male goes about his family man business. The director stubs his finger heavily into the photo and shouts to his assistants, Get me this man! I must have him for my film! When they finally track me down, I at first humbly demur before finally agreeing to take the starring role. Colleen thanked us for opening our home to her and left. Our duty was now fulfilled. But a few days later, when Jenny called me at work to say, I just got off the phone with Colleen McGar, and you are not going to believe it, I had no doubt whatsoever that I had just been discovered. My heart leapt. Go on. She says the director wants Marley to try out. Marley? She didn't seem to notice the dismay in my voice. Apparently, he's looking for a big, dumb, loopy dog to play the role of the family pet, and Marley caught his eye. Loopy? I asked. Big, dumb, and loopy. Well, he had certainly come to the right place. Uh, did Colleen mention if he said anything about me? I asked. No, Jenny said. Why would he? Colleen picked Marley up the next day. Knowing the importance of a good entrance, he came racing through the living room to greet her at full bore, pausing only long enough to grab the nearest pillow in his teeth, because you never knew when a busy film director might need a quick nap, and if he did, Marley wanted to be ready. Two hours later, Colleen and company were back, and the verdict was in. Marley had passed the audition. Oh, shut up! Jenny shrieked. No way! Our relation was not dampened a bit when Colleen told us Marley was the only one up for the part, nor when she broke the news that his would be the only non-paying role in the movie. The movie was called The Last Home Run, a baseball fantasy in which a 79-year-old nursing home resident becomes a 12-year-old for five days to live his dream of playing Little League ball. Marley was cast as the hyperactive family dog of the Little League coach, played by retired Major League catcher Gary Carter. As the first day of filming approached, Jenny became stage mom extraordinaire. She bathed him, she brushed him, she clipped his nails, and swabbed out his ears. On the morning shooting was to begin, I walked out of the bedroom to find Jenny and Marley tangled together as if locked in mortal combat, bouncing across the room. She was straddling him with her knees tightly hugging his ribs and one hand grasping the end of his choker chain as he bucked and lurched. What in God's name are you doing? I asked. What's it look like? She shot back, brushing his teeth. An hour later, we left for the Gulfstream Hotel, the boys in their car seats and Marley between them, panning away with uncharacteristically fresh breath. Our instructions were to arrive by 9 a.m., but a block away, traffic came to a standstill. Up ahead, the road was barricaded, and a police officer was diverting traffic away from the hotel. The filming was the biggest event to hit Sleepy Lake Worth since Body Heat was filmed there 15 years earlier, and a crowd of spectators had turned out to gawk. The police were keeping everyone away. We inched forward in traffic, and when we finally got up to the officer, I leaned out the window. We need to get through. No one gets through, he said. Keep moving. Let's go. We're with the cast, I said. He eyed us skeptically, a couple in a minivan with two toddlers and family pet in tow. 
I said, "Move it." Our dog is in the film. I said. Suddenly, he looked at me with new respect. You have the dog? He asked. The dog was on his checklist. I have the dog. I said, "Marley, the dog." He turned around and blew his whistle with great fanfare. He's got the dog! He shouted to a cop a half block down. Marley the dog! And that cop in turn yelled to someone else. He's got the dog! Marley the dog's here! The officer moved the barricade and waved us through. Right this way, he said politely. I felt like royalty. As we rolled past him, he said once again, as if he couldn't quite believe it. He's got the dog. In the parking lot outside the hotel, the film crew was ready for action. Cables crisscrossed the pavement. Camera tripods and microphone booms were set up. Lights hung from scaffolding. Trailers held racks of costumes. Two large tables of food and drinks were set up in the shade for cast and crew. Director Bob Gossi greeted us and gave us a quick rundown of the scene to come. It was simple enough. A minivan pulls up to the curb. Marley's make-believe owner, played by the actress Lisa Harris, is at the wheel. Her daughter, played by a cute teenager named Danielle from the local performing arts school, and son, another local budding actor not older than nine, are in the back with their family dog, played by Marley. The daughter opens the sliding door and hops out. Her brother follows with Marley on a leash. They walk off camera. End of scene. Okay, people, listen up. Gossy told the crew, "The dog's a little nutty, all right, but unless he completely hijacks the scene, we're going to keep rolling." He explained his thinking. Marley was the real thing, a typical family dog, and the goal was to capture him behaving as a typical family dog would behave on a typical family outing. No acting or coaching, pure cinema verite. Just let him do his thing," he coached, and work around him. When everyone was set to go, I loaded Marley into the van and handed his nylon leash to the little boy, who looked terrified. He's friendly. He'll just want to lick you. Take one. The van pulls to the curb. The instant the daughter slides open the side door, a yellow streak shoots out like a giant furball being fired from a cannon, and blurs past the cameras, trailing a red leash. Cut. I chased Marley down in the parking lot and hauled him back. Okay, folks, we're going to try that again. Gossie said. Then to the boy, he coached gently. The dog's pretty wild. Try to hold on tighter this time. Take two. The van pulls to the curb. The door slides open. The daughter is just beginning to exit when Marley huffs into view and leaps out past her. This time, dragging the white-knuckled boy behind him. Caught. Take three. The van pulls up. The door slides open. The daughter exits. The boy exits, holding the leash. As he steps away from the van, the leash pulls taut, stretching back inside. But no dog follows. The boy begins to tug, heave, and pull. He leans into it and gives it everything he has. Not a budge. Long, painfully empty seconds pass. The boy grimaces and looks back at the camera. Caught. I peered into the van to find Marley bent over, licking himself where no male was ever meant to lick. He looked up at me as if to say, "Can't you see I'm busy?" Take four. I load Marley into the back of the van with the boy and shut the door. Before Gossie calls action, he breaks for a few minutes to confer with his assistants. Finally, the scene rolls. The van pulls to the curb. The door slides open. The daughter steps out. The boy steps out, but with a bewildered look on his face. He peers directly into the camera and holds up his hand. Dangling from it is half the leash. Its end jagged and wet with saliva. Cut! 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 The boy explained that as he waited in the van, Marley began gnawing on the leash and wouldn't stop. The crew and cast were staring at the severed leash in disbelief, a mix of awe and horror on their faces, as though they had just witnessed some great and mysterious force of nature. I, on the other hand, was not surprised in the least. Marley had sent more leashes and ropes to their graves than I could count. 
He even managed to chew his way through a rubber-coated steel cable that was advertised as used in the airline industry. Okay, everybody, let's take a break, Gossie called out. Turning to me, he asked, in an amazingly calm voice, How quickly can you find a new leash? He didn't have to tell me how much each lost minute cost him as his union-scale actors and crew sat idle. There's a pet store a half mile from here. I can be back in 15 minutes. This time, get something he can't chew through? I returned with a heavy chain leash that looked like something a lion trainer might use, and the filming continued, take after failed take. Each scene was worse than the one before. At one point, Danielle, the teenage actress, let out a desperate shriek mid-scene and screamed with true horror in her voice, Oh my God! His thing is out! Caught! In another scene, Marley was panning so loudly at Danielle's feet as she spoke on the telephone to her love interest that the sound engineer flipped off his headphones in disgust and complained loudly, I can't hear a word she's saying. All I hear is heavy breathing. It sounds like a porn flick. Cut. So went day one of shooting. Marley was a disaster, unmitigated and without redemption. Part of me was defensive. Well, what did they expect for free, Benji? And part was mortified. I self-consciously stole glances at the cast and crew and could see it plainly on their faces. Where did this animal come from, and how can we send him back? At the end of the day, one of the assistants, clipboard in hand, told us the shooting lineup was still undecided for the next morning. Don't bother coming in tomorrow he said, and to ensure there was no confusion, he repeated, So unless you hear from us, don't show up. Got it? Yeah, I got it. Marley's fledgling acting career was over. Not that I could blame them, with the possible exception of that scene in The Ten Commandments where Charlton Heston parts the Red Sea, Marley had presented the biggest logistical nightmare in the history of cinema. He had caused who knows how many thousands of dollars in needless delays and wasted film. He had slimed countless costumes, raided the snack table, and nearly toppled a $30,000 camera. They were cutting their losses, writing us out. The next morning, I was still fretting over our dashed dreams of stardom when the phone rang. It was the assistant telling us to get Marley to the hotel as soon as possible. You mean you want him back? Right away, he said. Bob wants him in the next scene. I arrived 30 minutes later, not quite believing they had invited us back. Gossie was ebullient. He had watched the raw footage from the day before and couldn't have been happier. The dog was hysterical, pure madcap genius. Shooting continued for several more days, and Marley was lapping up stardom. The crew, especially the women, fawned over him. The weather was brutally hot, and one assistant was assigned the exclusive duty of following Marley around with a bowl and a bottle of spring water, pouring him drinks at will. Everyone, it seemed, was feeding him snacks off the buffet table. I left him with the crew for a couple of hours while I checked in at work, and when I returned, I found him sprawled out like King Tut, paws in the air, accepting a leisurely belly rub from the strikingly gorgeous makeup artist. He's such a lover, she cooed. Stardom was starting to go to my head, too. I began introducing myself as Marley the Dog's Handler and dropping lines such as, For his next movie, we're hoping for a barking part. We remained on the set for four straight days, and by the time we were told Marley's scenes were all completed and his services no longer needed, Jenny and I both felt we were part of the shooting gallery family. Granted, the only unpaid members of the family, but members nonetheless. We love you guys, Jenny blurted out to all within earshot as we herded Marley into the minivan. Can't wait to see the final cut. But wait, we did. One of the producers told us to give them eight months and then call and they'd mail us an advance copy. After eight months when I called, however, a front desk person put me on hold and returned several minutes later to say, Why don't you try in another couple months? I waited and tried, 
waited and tried, but each time was put off. Eventually, I stopped calling, resigned that we would never see the last home run, convinced that no one ever would, that the project had been abandoned on the editing room floor on account of the overwhelming challenges of trying to edit that damn dog out of every scene. I was in Blockbuster a full two years later when on a whim I asked the clerk if he knew anything about a movie called The Last Home Run. Not only did he know about it, he had it in stock. In fact, as luck would have it, not a single copy was checked out. Only later would I learn that, unable to attract a national distributor, the shooting gallery had no choice but to release Marley's movie debut straight to video. I didn't care. I raced home with a copy and yelled to Jenny and the kids to gather around the VCR. All told, Marley was on screen for less than two minutes, but I had to say they were two of the livelier minutes in the film. We laughed, we cried, we cheered. Marley, never one to get hung up on pretenses, seemed unimpressed. By the time the end credits rolled, he was sound asleep. We waited with breath held as the names of all the actors of the two-legged variety had scrolled by. For a minute, I thought our dog was not going to merit a credit, but then there it was, listed in big letters across the screen for all to see. Marley the dog as himself. Chapter 17 In the Land of Bocahontas One month after filming ended for the last home run, we said goodbye to West Palm Beach. There had been two more murders within a block of our home, but in the end, it was clutter, not crime, that drove us from our little bungalow on Churchill Road. With two children and all the accoutrements that went with them, we were packed to the rafters. Besides, Jenny was now working half-time for the post-feature section, and mostly from home, as she attempted to juggle children and career. It only made sense for us to relocate closer to my office. Life is full of little ironies, and one of them was the fact that after months of searching, we settled on a house in the one South Florida city I took the greatest glee in publicly ridiculing. That place was Boca Raton, which translated from the Spanish means mouth of the rat. Boca Raton was a wealthy Republican bastion largely populated with recent arrivals from New Jersey and New York. Most of the money in town was new money, and most of those who had it didn't know how to enjoy it without making fools of themselves. Boca Raton was a land of luxury sedans, red sports cars, pink stucco mansions crammed onto postage stamp lots. The city crawled with plastic surgeons, and they had the biggest homes and most radiant smiles of all. The younger women all had magnificent boob jobs. The older women all had magnificent boob jobs and facelifts. Butt sculpting, nose jobs, tummy tucks, and tattooed mascara rounded out the cosmetic lineup, giving the city's female population the odd appearance of being foot soldiers in an army of anatomically correct inflatable dolls. In my column, I had been poking fun at the Boca lifestyle. The Disney movie Pocahontas was in the theaters then, and I launched a running spoof on the Indian princess theme, which I titled Pocahontas. My gold draped protagonist was an indigenous suburban princess who drove a pink BMW, her rock-hard, surgically enhanced breast jutting into the steering wheel, allowing her to drive hands-free, talking on her cell phone and teasing her frosted hair in the rear-view mirror as she raced to the tanning salon. Bocahannes spent her afternoon stalking wild furs, trusty Amex card in hand, at the ceremonial hunting grounds known as Town Center Mall. So it only made sense that when Jenny and I finally settled on a house, it was located midway between the waterfront estates of East Boca Raton and the snooty gated communities of West Boca Raton. Our new neighborhood was in one of the few middle-class sections in the city, and its residents liked to joke with a certain reverse snobbery that they were on the wrong side of both sets of tracks. Sure enough, there were two sets of railroad tracks, one defining the eastern boundary of the neighborhood and one the western. 
My paper, The Sun Sentinel, was the dominant newspaper in Boca Raton, and because my photograph appeared above my column, I was frequently recognized. We can't move to Boca. I'll be run out of town on a rail. They'll serve my head up on a bed of organic mescaline greens. But we had been looking for months, and this was the first house that met all our criteria. It was the right size at the right price and in the right place, strategically located between the two offices where I split my time. The public schools were about as good as public schools got in South Florida. The barbarian was about to slip inside the gate. When we first arrived, I slinked around town self-consciously, convinced all eyes were on me. My ears burned, imagining people were whispering as I passed. After I wrote a column welcoming myself to the neighborhood and eating a fair amount of crow in the process, I received a number of letters saying things like, "You trash our city, and now you want to live here? What a shameless hypocrite!" I had to admit, they made a point. I soon discovered, however, that most of my neighbors here on the wrong side of both sets of tracks were sympathetic to my written assaults on what one of them called the gauche and vulgar among us. Pretty soon, I felt right at home. Our house was a 1970s vintage four-bedroom ranch with twice the square footage of our first home and none of the charm. The place had potential, though, and gradually we put our mark on it. I slowly turned the bereft front yard into a tropical garden teeming with gingers and heliconias and passion vines that butterflies and passersby alike stopped to drink in. The two best features of our new home had nothing to do with the house itself. Visible from our living room window was a small city park filled with playground equipment beneath towering pines. The children adored it, and in the backyard, right off the new French doors, was an in-ground swimming pool. We hadn't wanted a pool, worrying about the risk to our two toddlers. Our first act on the day we moved in. Was to surround the pool with a four-foot-high fence worthy of a maximum security prison. The boys, Patrick had just turned three and Connor eighteen months when we arrived, took to the water like a pair of dolphins. A swimming pool in Florida, we soon learned, made the difference between barely enduring the withering summer months and actually enjoying them. No one loved the backyard pool more than our water dog, that proud descendant of fishermen's retrievers plying the ocean swells off the coast of Newfoundland. If the pool gate was open, Marley would charge for the water, getting a running start from the family room, going airborne out the open French doors, and with one bounce off the brick patio, landing in the pool on his belly with a giant flop that sent a geyser into the air and waves over the edge. One thing our new house did not have was a Marley-proof bunker. The garage had no windows and was stiflingly hot. Besides, it was finished in drywall, not concrete, which Marley had already proved himself quite adept at pulverizing. His thunder-induced panic attacks were only getting worse, despite the tranquilizers. The first time we left him alone in our new house, we shut him in the laundry room just off the kitchen, with a blanket and a big bowl of water. When we returned a few hours later, he had scratched up the door. The damage was minor, but we knew it didn't bode well. There's not even a cloud in the sky, Jenny observed skeptically. What's going to happen the first time a storm hits? The next time we left him alone, we found out. As thunderheads rolled in, we cut our outing short and hurried home, but it was too late. Jenny was a few steps ahead of me, and when she opened the laundry room door, she stopped short and uttered, "Oh my God!" She said it the way you would if you had just discovered a body hanging from the chandelier. I peeked in over her shoulder, and it was uglier than I had feared. Marley was standing there, panting frantically, his paws and mouth bleeding. Loose fur was everywhere, as though the thunder had scared the hair right out of his coat. An entire wall was gouged open, obliterated clear down to the studs. Plaster and wood chips and bent nails were everywhere. Electric wiring lay exposed. Blood smeared the floor and the walls. It looked literally like the scene of a shotgun homicide. Oh my God!
it was all either of us could say. After several seconds of just standing there mute, staring at the carnage, I finally said, Okay, we can handle this. It's all fixable. Jenny shot me her luck. She had seen my repairs. I'll call a drywall guy and have it professionally repaired, I said. A few hundred bucks and we'll be good as new, she chirped. Within a few minutes, Marley was beginning to mellow. His eyelids grew heavy and his eyes deeply bloodshot, as they always did when he was doped up. I always resisted sedating him, but the pills helped him move past the terror, past the deadly threat that existed only in his mind. If he were human, I would call him certifiably psychotic. He was delusional, paranoid, convinced a dark evil force was coming from the heavens to take him. He curled up on the rug in front of the kitchen sink and let out a deep sigh. I knelt beside him and stroked his blood-caked fur. Without lifting his head, he looked up at me with those bloodshot, stoner eyes of his, the saddest, most mournful eyes I have ever seen. It was as if he were trying to tell me something, something important he needed me to understand. I know, I said. I know you can't help it. The next day, Jenny and I took the boys with us to the pet store and bought a giant cage. They came in all different sizes, and when I described Marley to the clerk, he led us to the largest of them all. It was enormous, big enough for a lion to stand up and turn around in. Made out of heavy steel grating, it had two bolt-action barrel locks to hold the door securely shut and a heavy steel pan for a floor. This was our answer, our own portable Alcatraz. Connor and Patrick both crawled inside, and I slid the bolts shut, locking them in for a moment. What do you guys think, I asked. Will this hold our super dog? Waddy's going to be our prisoner, Patrick shrieked, delighted at the prospect. Back home, we set up the crate next to the washing machine. Portable Alcatraz took up nearly half the laundry room. Come here, Marley, I called. I tossed a milk bone in, and he happily pranced in after it. I closed and bolted the door behind him, and he stood there chewing his treat, unfazed by the new life experience he was about to enter, the one known in mental health circles as involuntary commitment. This is going to be your new home when we're away, I said cheerfully. Marley stood there panning contentedly, not a trace of concern on his face, and then he lay down and let out a sigh, a good sign, a very good sign. That evening, we decided to give the maximum security dog containment unit a test run. This time, I didn't even need a milk bone to lure Marley in. I simply opened the gate, gave a whistle, and in he walked, tail banging the metal sides. As we loaded the boys into the minivan to go out to dinner, Jenny said, You know something? This is the first time since we got him that I don't have a pit in my stomach leaving Marley alone in the house. Yeah, it was always a guessing game. What will our dog destroy this time? I think that crate is going to be the best money we ever spent. We had a great dinner out, followed by a sunset stroll on the beach. The boys splashed in the surf. Just knowing Marley was safely secured inside Alcatraz, unable to hurt himself or anything else, was a bomb. What a nice outing this has been, Jenny said, as we walked up the front sidewalk to our house. I was about to agree with her when I noticed something in my peripheral vision, something up ahead that wasn't quite right. I turned my head and stared at the window beside the front door. The mini blinds were shut, as they always were when we left the house. But about a foot up from the bottom of the window, the meadow slats were bent apart and something was sticking through them. Something black and wet and pressed up against the glass. What the? Marley? When I opened the front door, sure enough, there was our one dog welcoming committee, wiggling all over the foyer, pleased as punch to have us home again. We converged on the laundry room. The crate's door stood wide open, swung back like the stone to Jesus' tomb on Easter morning. I squatted down beside the cage to have a closer look. 
the two bolt-action barrel locks were slid back in the open position, and, a significant clue, they were dripping with saliva. It looks like an inside job. I can't believe it, Jenny said. Then she uttered a word I was glad the children were not close enough to hear. We always fancied Marley to be as dumb as Algy, but he had been clever enough to figure out how to use his long, strong tongue through the bars to slowly work the barrels free from their slots. We took to wiring both locks in place with heavy electrical cable. That worked for a while, but one day, with distant rumbles on the horizon, we came home to find that the bottom corner of the cage's gate had been peeled back as though with a giant can opener, and a panicky Marley, his paws again bloodied, was firmly stuck around the ribcage, half in and half out of the tight opening. I bent the steel gate back in place as best I could, and we began wiring not only the slide bolts in place, but all four corners of the door as well. Pretty soon, we were reinforcing the corners of the cage itself as Marley continued to put his brawn into busting out. Within three months, the gleaming steel cage we had thought so impregnable looked like it had taken a direct hit from a howitzer. The bars were twisted and bent, the frame pried apart, the door an ill-fitting mess, the sides bulging outward. I continued to reinforce it as best I could, and it continued to hold tenuously against Marley's full-bodied assaults. Whatever false sense of security the contraption had once offered us was gone. Each time we left, even for a half hour, we wondered whether this would be the time that our manic inmate would bust out and go on another couch-shredding, wall-gouging, door-eating rampage. So much for peace of mind. Chapter 18 Alfresco Dining Marley didn't fit into the Boca Raton scene any better than I did. Boca has a disproportionate share of the world's smallest, yappiest, most pampered dogs. They were precious little things, often with bows in their fur and cologne spritzed on their necks, some even with painted toenails, and you would spot them peeking out of a designer handbag at you as you waited in line at the bagel shop snoozing on their mistress's towels at the beach, leading the charge on a rhinestone-studded leash into an antique store. They were petite, sophisticated, and of discriminating taste. Marley was big, clunky, and a sniffer of genitalia. He wanted so much to have them invite him into their circle. They so much were not about to. When we took strolls around town, the high-rent pooches were always worth getting all choked up over. Each time Marley spotted one, he would break into a gallop, barreling up to it. Each time Marley would be roundly snubbed, not only by the Boca mini-dog, but by the Boca mini-dog's owner, who would snatch up young Fifi or Susie or Cherie as if rescuing her from the jaws of an alligator. Marley didn't seem to mind. Outside dining was a big part of the Boca experience, and many restaurants in town offered alfresco seating beneath palm trees, whose trunks and fronds were studded with strings of tiny white lights. The Boca mini-dog was an important part of the alfresco ambiance. Couples brought their dogs with them and hooked their leashes to the wrought iron tables, where the dogs would contentedly curl up at their feet, or sometimes even sit up at the table beside their masters, holding their heads up in an imperious manner, as if miffed by the waiter's inattentiveness. One Sunday afternoon, Jenny and I thought it would be fun to take the whole family for an outside meal at one of the popular meeting places. We loaded the boys and the dog into the minivan and headed to Meisner Park, the downtown shopping plaza modeled after an Italian piazza with wide sidewalks and endless dining possibilities. We settled on a restaurant with one of the more affordable menus on the strip and hovered nearby until a sidewalk table opened up. The table was perfect, shaded with a view of the piazza's central fountain and heavy enough, we were sure, to secure an excitable hundred-pound lab. I hooked the end of Marley's leash to one of the legs and we ordered drinks all around, two beers and two apple juices. To a beautiful day with my beautiful family, Jenny held her glass for a toast. We clicked our beer bottles. The boys smashed their sippy cups together. 
That's when it happened. So fast, in fact, that we didn't even realize it had happened. All we knew was that one instant we were sitting at a lovely outdoor table toasting the beautiful day, and the next our table was on the move, crashing its way through the sea of other tables, banging into innocent bystanders and making a horrible, ear-piercing, industrial-grade shriek as it scraped over the concrete pavers. In that first split second, before either of us realized exactly what bad fate had befallen us, it seemed distinctly possible that our table was possessed, fleeing our family of unwashed Boca invaders, which most certainly did not belong here. In the next split second, I saw that it wasn't our table that was haunted, but our dog. Marley was out in front, chugging forward with every ounce of rippling muscle he had, the leash stretched tight as piano wire. In the fraction of a second after that, I saw just where Marley was heading, table in tow. Fifty feet down the sidewalk, a delicate French poodle lingered at her owner's side, nose in the air. I remember thinking, what is his thing for poodles? Jenny and I both sat there for a moment longer, drinks in hand, the boys between us in their stroller, our perfect little Sunday afternoon, unblemished, except for the fact that our table was now motoring its way through the crowd. An instant later, we were on our feet, screaming, running, apologizing to the customers around us as we went. I was the first to reach the runaway table as it surged and scraped down the piazza. I grabbed on, planted my feet, and leaned back with everything I had. Soon Jenny was beside me, pulling back too. In the middle of all the bedlam, Jenny actually turned and called over her shoulder. Be right back, boys. Be right back. She made it sound so ordinary, so expected, so planned, as if we often did this sort of thing, deciding on the spur of the moment that, oh, why not? It might just be fun to let Marley lead us on a little table stroll around town, maybe doing a bit of window shopping along the way before we circled back in time for appetizers. When we finally got the table stopped and Marley reeled in, just feet from the poodle and her mortified owner, I turned back to check on the boys, and that's when I got my first good look at the faces of my fellow alfresco diners. It was like a scene out of one of those E.F. Hutton commercials, where an entire bustling crowd freezes in silence, waiting to hear a whispered word of investment advice. Men stopped in mid-conversation, cell phones in their hands. Women stared with open mouths. The Boca lights were aghast. It was finally Connor who broke the silence. Waddy, go walk! He screamed with delight. A waiter rushed up and helped me drag the table back into place as Jenny held Marley, still fixated on the object of his desire, in a death grip. Let me get some new place settings. Oh, that won't be necessary, Jenny said nonchalantly. We'll just be paying for our drinks and going. It wasn't long after our excellent excursion into the Boca al Fresco dining scene that I found a book in the library titled No Bad Dogs by the acclaimed British dog trainer Barbara Woodhouse, which advanced the same belief that Marley's first instructor, Miss Dominatrix, held so dear, that the only thing standing between an incorrigible canine and greatness was a befuddled, indecisive, weak-willed human master. As I read, I began to feel better about our flawed retriever. We had gradually come to the firm conclusion that Marley was indeed the world's worst dog. Now I was buoyed to read that there were all sorts of horrid behaviors he did not have. Then I got to Chapter 24, Living with the Mentally Unstable Dog. As I read, I swallowed loudly. Woodhouse was describing Marley with an understanding so intimate I could swear she had been bunking with him in his battered crate. She addressed the manic, bizarre behavior patterns, the destructiveness when left alone, the gouged floors and chewed rugs, 
She described the attempts by owners of such beasts to make some place either in the house or yard dog-proof. She even addressed the use of tranquilizers as a desperate and largely ineffective last measure to try to return these mentally broken mutts to the land of the sane. Some are born unstable, some are made unstable by their living conditions, but the result is the same. The dogs, instead of being a joy to their owners, are a worry, an expense, and often bring complete despair to an entire family, Woodhouse wrote. I looked down at Marley snoozing at my feet and said, Sound familiar? In a subsequent chapter, Woodhouse wrote with a sense of resignation, I cannot stress often enough that if you wish to keep a dog that is not normal, you must face up to living a slightly restricted existence. You mean like living in mortal fear of going out for a gallon of milk? Although you may love a subnormal dog, she continued, other people must not be inconvenienced by it. Other people such as, hypothetically speaking, Sunday diners at a sidewalk cafe in Boca Raton, Florida? I was expecting Woodhouse to offer a cheery solution for the owners of such defective merchandise, a few helpful tips that, when properly executed, could turn even the most manic of pets into Westminster-worthy show dogs. But she ended her book on a much darker note. Only the owners of unbalanced dogs can really know where the line can be drawn between a dog that is sane and one that is mentally unsound. No one can make up the owner's mind as to what to do with the last kind. I, as a great dog lover, feel it is kinder to put them to sleep. Gulp. Don't worry, big guy, I said, leaning down to scratch Marley's belly. The only sleep we're going to be doing around this house is the kind you get to wake up from. He sighed dramatically and drifted back to his dreams of French poodles in heat. It was around the same time that we also learned not all labs are created equal. The breed has two distinct subgroups, English and American. As the brochure for a Pennsylvania retriever breeder, Endless Mountain Labradors, explains it, so many people ask us, what's the difference between the English and the American, or field, labs? There is such a big difference that the AKC is considering splitting the breed. There is a difference in build as well as temperament. If you are looking for strictly a field dog for field trial competition, go for the American field dog. They are athletic, tall, lanky, thin, but have very hyper, high-strung personalities, which do not lend themselves to being the best family dogs. On the other hand, the English labs are very blocky, stocky, shorter in their build, very sweet, quiet, mellow, lovely dogs. It didn't take me long to figure out which line Marley belonged to. If that weren't enough, our specific choice just happened to be mentally unbalanced, unwound, and beyond the reach of training, tranquilizers, or canine psychiatry. The kind of subnormal specimen an experienced dog trainer like Barbara Woodhouse might just consider better off dead. Great, I thought. Now we find out. Chapter 19 Lightning Strikes after Connor's arrival, everyone we knew, with the exception of my very Catholic parents, who were praying for dozens of little grogans, assumed we were done having children. In the two-income professional crowd in which we ran, one child was the norm, two were considered a bit of an extravagance, and three were simply unheard of. But our two boys brought us more joy than we ever thought anyone or anything possibly could. They defined our life now, and while parts of us missed the leisurely vacations, lazy Saturdays reading novels, and romantic dinners that lingered late into the night, we had come to find our pleasures in new ways, in spilled applesauce and tiny nose prints on window panes, and the soft symphony of bare feet padding down the hallway at dawn. The boys were growing up fast, and each week ended another little chapter that could never again be revisited. One week Patrick was sucking his thumb, the next he had weaned himself of it forever. One week Connor was our baby in a crib, 
The next, he was a little boy using a toddler bed for a trampoline. Patrick was unable to pronounce the L sound, and when women would coo over him, as they often did, he would put his fists on his hips, stick out his lip, and say, Those Yadies are yaffing at me! I always meant to get it on videotape, but one day the L's came out perfectly, and that was that. About a year after moving to our new house in Boca, we began trying for our third. Two tries was all it took. Neither of us would admit we wanted a girl, but of course we did, desperately so, despite our many pronouncements during the pregnancy that having three boys would be just great. When on January 9, 1997, Jenny delivered a pink-cheeked, seven-pound baby girl whom we named Colleen, our family only now felt like it was complete. If the pregnancy for Connor had been a litany of stress and worry, this pregnancy was textbook perfect, and delivering at Boca Raton Community Hospital introduced us to a whole new level of pampered customer satisfaction. Just down the hall from our room was a lounge with a free all-you-can-drink cappuccino station, so very Boca. By the time the baby finally came, I was so jacked up on frothy caffeine, I could barely hold my hand still to snip the umbilical cord. When Colleen was one week old, Jenny brought her outside for the first time. The day was crisp and beautiful, and the boys and I were in the front yard planting flowers. Marley was chained to a tree nearby, happy to lie in the shade and watch the world go by. Jenny sat in the grass beside him and placed the sleeping Colleen in a portable bassinet on the ground between them. After several minutes, the boys beckoned for Mom to come closer to see their handiwork, and they led Jenny and me around the garden beds. We wandered behind some large shrubbery from where we could still see the baby, but passers-by on the street could not see us. As we turned back, I stopped and motioned for Jenny to look out through the shrubs. Out on the street, an older couple walking by had stopped and were gawking at the scene in our front yard with bewildered expressions. Then it hit me. From their vantage point, all they could see was a fragile newborn, alone with a large yellow dog, who appeared to be babysitting single-handedly. The poor couple must have thought they had stumbled on a case of felony child neglect. No doubt the parents were out drinking at a bar somewhere, having left the infant alone in the care of the neighborhood Labrador Retriever. As if he were in on the ruse, Marley, without prompting, shifted positions and rested his chin across the baby's stomach, his head bigger than her whole body, and let out a long sigh as if he were saying, When are those two going to get home? We finally stepped out of the bushes and waved to the couple and watched the relief wash over their faces. Thank God that baby hadn't been thrown to the dogs after all. You must really trust your dog, the woman said somewhat cautiously, betraying a belief that dogs were fierce and unpredictable and had no place that close to a defenseless newborn. He hasn't eaten one yet, I said. Two months after Colleen arrived home, I celebrated my 40th birthday in a most inauspicious manner, namely, by myself. The big 4-0 is supposed to be a major turning point. If any birthday merited a blowout celebration, it was the 40th, but not for me. We were now responsible parents with three children. Jenny had a new baby pressed to her breast. There were more important things to worry about. I arrived home from work, and Jenny was tired and worn down. After a quick meal of leftovers, I bathed the boys and put them to bed while Jenny nursed Colleen. By 8.30, all three children were asleep, and so was my wife. I popped a beer and sat out on the patio, staring into the iridescent blue water of the lit swimming pool. As always, Marley was faithfully at my side, and as I scratched his ears, it occurred to me that he was at about the same turning point in life. We had brought him home six years earlier. In dog years, that would put him somewhere in his early forties now. He had crossed unnoticed into middle age, but still acted every bit the puppy. 
Except for a string of stubborn ear infections that required Dr. J's repeated intervention, he was healthy. I had never thought of Marley as any kind of role model, but sitting there sipping my beer, I was aware that maybe he held the secret for a good life. Never slow down, never look back, live each day with adolescent verve and spunk and curiosity and playfulness. Well, big guy, I said, pressing my beer bottle against his cheek in a kind of interspecies toast. It's just you and me tonight. Here's to forty. Here's to middle age. Here's to running with the big dogs right up until the end. And then he too curled up and went to sleep. I was still moping about my solitary birthday a few days later when Jim Tolpin, my old colleague who had broken Marley of his jumping habit. Called unexpectedly and asked if I wanted to grab a beer the next night, a Saturday. Jim picked me up at six and took me to an English pub where we quaffed bass ale and caught up on each other's lives. We were having a grand old time until the bartender called out, "Is there a John Grogan here? Phone for John Grogan." It was Jenny, and she sounded very upset and stressed out. The baby's crying. The boys are out of control, and I just ripped my contact lens. She wailed into the phone. Can you come home right away? Try to calm down, I said. Sit tight. I'll be right home. Come on, Jim said. I'll drive you. When we turned onto my block, both sides of the street were lined with cars. Somebody's having a party, I said. I invited Jim inside. When the front door swung open, Jenny didn't look upset at all. In fact, she had a big grin on her face. Behind her stood a bagpipe player in kilts. Good God! What have I walked in on? Then I looked beyond the bagpipe player and saw that someone had taken down the kiddie fence around the pool and launched floating candles on the water. The deck was crammed with several dozen of my friends, neighbors, and coworkers. Just as I was making the connection that all those cars on the street belonged to all these people in my house, they shouted in unison, "Happy birthday, old man!" My wife had not forgotten after all. When I was finally able to snap my jaw shut, I took Jenny in my arms, kissed her on the cheek, and whispered in her ear, "I'll get you later for this." Someone opened the laundry room door, looking for the trash can, and out bounded Marley in prime party mode. He swept through the crowd, stole a mozzarella and basil appetizer off a tray, lifted a couple of women's miniskirts with his snout, and made a break for the unfenced swimming pool. I tackled him just as he was launching into his signature running belly flop, and dragged him back to solitary confinement. Don't worry, I said. I'll save you the leftovers. It wasn't long after the surprise party that Marley finally was able to find validation for his intense fear of thunder. I was in the backyard on a Sunday afternoon under brooding, darkening skies, digging up a rectangle of grass to plant yet another vegetable garden. As I worked, Marley paced nervously around me, his internal barometer sensing an impending storm. I sensed it too, but I wanted to get the project done, and I figured I would work until I felt the first drops of rain. As I dug, I kept glancing at the sky, watching an ominous black thunderhead forming several miles to the east, out over the ocean. Marley was whining softly, beckoning me to put down the shovel and head inside. Relax, I told him. It's still miles away. The words had barely left my lips when I felt a previously unknown sensation, a kind of quivering tingle on the back of my neck. The sky had turned an odd shade of olive gray, and the air seemed to go suddenly dead, as though some heavenly force had grabbed the winds and frozen them in its grip. Weird, I thought, as I paused, leaning on my shovel to study the sky. That's when I heard it. A buzzing, popping, crackling surge of energy, similar to what you sometimes can hear standing beneath high-tension power lines. A sort of "tss" sound filled the air around me, followed by a brief instant of utter silence. In that instant, I knew trouble was coming, but I had no time to react. 
In the next fraction of a second, the sky went pure, blindingly white, and an explosion the likes of which I had never heard before. Not in any storm, at any fireworks display, at any demolition site, boomed in my ears. A wall of energy hit me in the chest like an invisible linebacker. When I opened my eyes, who knows how many seconds later, I was lying face down on the ground, sand in my mouth, my shovel ten feet away, rain pelting me. Marley was down too, in his hit the deck stance, and when he saw me raise my head, he wiggled desperately toward me on his belly, like a soldier trying to slide beneath barbed wire. When he reached me, he climbed right on my back and buried his snout in my neck, frantically licking me. I looked around for just a second, trying to get my bearings, and I could see where the lightning had struck the power line pole in the corner of the yard and followed the wire down to the house, about twenty feet from where I had been standing. The electrical meter on the wall was in charred ruins. Come on! I yelled. And then Marley and I were on our feet, sprinting through the downpour toward the back door as new bolts of lightning flashed around us. We did not stop until we were safely inside. I knelt on the floor, soaking wet, catching my breath, and Marley clambered on me, licking my face. He was beside himself with fear, shaking uncontrollably, drool hanging off his chin. I hugged him, tried to calm him down. That was close, I said. And realized that I was shaking too. He looked up at me with those big, empathetic eyes that I swore could almost talk. I was sure I knew what he was trying to tell me. I've been trying to warn you for years that this stuff can kill you, but would anyone listen? Now will you take me seriously? The dog had a point. Maybe his fear of thunder had not been so irrational after all. Maybe his panic attacks at the first distant rumblings had been his way of telling us that Florida's violent thunderstorms, the deadliest in the country, were not to be dismissed with a shrug. Our house was dark. The air conditioning, ceiling fans, televisions, and several appliances all blown out. The circuit breaker was fused into a melted mess. We were about to make some electrician a very happy man. But I was alive, and so was my trusty sidekick. Jenny and the kids, tucked safely away in the family room, didn't even know the house had been hit. We were all present and accounted for. What else mattered? I pulled Marley into my lap, all ninety-seven nervous pounds of him, and made him a promise right then and there: never again would I dismiss his fear of this deadly force of nature. Chapter Twenty, Dog Beach. As a newspaper columnist, I was always looking for interesting and quirky stories I could grab onto. I wrote three columns each week, which meant that one of the biggest challenges of the job was coming up with a constant stream of fresh topics. Each morning, I began my day by scouring the four South Florida daily newspapers, circling and clipping anything that might be worth weighing in on. Then it was a matter of finding an approach or angle that would be mine. The job would take me to a migrant camp one day, a millionaire's mansion the next, and an inner city street corner the day after that. I loved the variety. I loved the people I met, and more than anything, I loved the near total freedom I was afforded to go wherever I wanted, whenever I wanted, in pursuit of whatever topic tickled my curiosity. What my bosses did not know was that behind my journalistic wanderings was a secret agenda: to use my position as a columnist to engineer as many shamelessly transparent working holidays as I possibly could. My motto was: "When the columnist has fun, the reader has fun." Someone had to do the dirty work of telling the story of the lost shakers of salt in Margaritaville. It might as well be me. It was in this vein of journalistic inquiry that I got the idea to take Marley for a day at the beach. Up and down South Florida's heavily used shoreline, various municipalities had banned pets, and for good reason. The last thing beachgoers wanted was a wet, sandy dog pooping and peeing and shaking all over them as they worked on their tans. No pets signs bristled along nearly every stretch of sand. 
There was one place, though, one small, little-known sliver of beach, where there were no signs, no restrictions, no bans on four-legged water lovers. The beach was tucked away in an unincorporated pocket of Palm Beach County, about halfway between West Palm Beach and Boca Raton, stretching for a few hundred yards and hidden behind a grassy dune at the end of a dead-end street. Over the years, its reputation spread by word of mouth among pet owners as one of South Florida's last safe havens for dogs to come and frolic in the surf. Unofficially, everyone knew it as Dog Beach. Dog Beach operated on its own set of unwritten rules that had evolved over time, put in place by consensus of the dog owners who frequented it, and enforced by peer pressure and a sort of silent moral code. The rules were simple and few. Aggressive dogs had to stay leashed. All others could run free. Owners were to bring plastic bags with them to pick up any droppings their animal might deposit. All trash, including bag dog waste, was to be carted out. Each dog should arrive with a supply of fresh drinking water. Above all else, there would be absolutely no fouling of the water. The etiquette called for owners, upon arriving, to walk their dogs along the dune line, far from the ocean's edge, until their pets relieved themselves. Then they could bag the waste and safely proceed to the water. I had heard about Dog Beach, but had never visited. Now I had my excuse. A pro-development county commissioner had begun squawking about this unregulated stretch of beach and asking why the same rules that apply to other county beaches should not apply here. She made her intent clear, outlaw the furry critters, improve public access, and open this valuable resource to the masses. On a drop-dead perfect June morning, I headed with Marley across the intracoastal waterway. I filled the car with as many beach towels as I could find, and that was just for the drive over. As always, Marley's tongue was hanging out, spit flying everywhere. I felt like I was on a road trip with Old Faithful. Following Dog Beach protocol, I parked several blocks away where I wouldn't get a ticket and began the long hike in through a sleepy neighborhood of 60s vintage bungalows, Marley leading the charge. About halfway there, a gruff voice called out, Hey, dog guy! I froze, convinced I was about to be busted by an angry neighbor who wanted me to keep my damn dog off his beach. But the voice belonged to another pet owner who approached me with his own large dog on a leash and handed me a petition to sign, urging county commissioners to let Dog Beach stand. Speaking of standing, we would have stood and chatted, but the way Marley and the other dog were circling each other, I knew it was just a matter of seconds before they, A, lunged at each other in mortal combat, or B, began a family. I yanked Marley away and continued on. Just as we reached the path to the beach, Marley squatted in the weeds and emptied his bowels. Perfect. At least that little social nicety was out of the way. I bagged up the evidence. To the beach. When we crested the dune, I was surprised to see several people wading in the shallows with their dogs securely tethered to leashes. What was this all about? I expected the dogs to be running free in unbridled communal harmony. A sheriff's deputy was just here, one glum dog owner explained. He said from now on they're enforcing the county leash ordinance and we'll be fined if our dogs are loose. It appeared I had arrived too late to fully enjoy the simple pleasures of Dog Beach. The police, no doubt at the urging of the politically connected anti-Dog Beach forces, were tightening the noose. I obediently walked Marley along the water's edge with the other dog owners, feeling more like I was in a prison exercise yard than on South Florida's last unregulated spit of sand. I returned with him to my towel and was just pouring Marley a bowl of water from the canteen I had lugged along when over the dune came a shirtless, tattooed man in cut-off blue jeans and work boots, a muscular and fierce-looking pit bull terrier on a heavy chain at his side. The owner must have noticed me recoiling because he called out, Don't you worry, killer's friendly. He don't never fight other dogs. I was just beginning to exhale with relief when he added with obvious pride, 
but you should see him rip open a wild hog. I'll tell you, he can get it down and gutted in about 15 seconds. I told him the cops had just been here and were going to ticket people who didn't obey the leash ordinance. I guess they're cracking down. That's bullshit, he yelled and spit in the sand. I've been bringing my dogs to this beach for years. You don't need no leash at Dog Beach. With that, he unclipped the heavy chain, and Killer galloped across the sand and into the water. Marley reared back on his hind legs, bouncing up and down. He looked at Killer and then up at me. He looked back at Killer and back at me. His paws patted nervously on the sand, and he let out a soft, sustained whimper. I scanned the dune line. No cops anywhere in sight. I looked at Marley. Please, please, pretty please. Go ahead, let him loose, Killer's owner said. A dog ain't meant to spend his life on the end of a rope. Oh, what the hell, I said, and unsnapped the leash. Marley dashed for the water, kicking sand all over us as he blasted off. He crashed into the surf just as a breaker rolled in, tossing him under the water. A second later, his head reappeared, and the instant he regained his footing, he threw a cross-body block at Killer, the pig-slaying pit bull, knocking both of them off their feet. Together, they rolled beneath a wave, and I held my breath, wondering if Marley had just crossed the line that would throw Killer into a homicidal, lab-butchering fury. But when they popped back up again, their tails were wagging, their mouths grinning. Killer jumped on Marley's back, and Marley on Killer's. They chased each other up the water line and back again, sending plumes of spray flying on either side of them. They pranced, they danced, they wrestled, they dove. I don't think I had ever before, or have ever since, witnessed such unadulterated joy. The other dog owners took our cue, and pretty soon all the dogs, about a dozen in total, were running free. The dogs all got along splendidly. The owners all followed the rules. It was Dog Beach as it was meant to be. This was the real Florida, unblemished and unchecked, the Florida of a forgotten, simpler time and place. There was only one small problem. As the morning progressed, Marley kept lapping up salt water. I followed behind him with a bowl of fresh water, but he was too distracted to drink. Several times I led him right up to the bowl and stuck his nose into it, but he spurned the fresh water as if it were vinegar, wanting only to return to his new best friend, Killer, and the other dogs. Out in the shallows, he paused from his play to lap up even more salt water. Stop that, you dummy! You're going to make yourself... Before I could finish my thought, it happened. A strange glaze settled over his eyes, and a horrible churning sound began to erupt from his gut. He arched his back high and opened and shut his mouth several times, as if trying to clear something from his craw. His shoulders heaved, his abdomen contorted. Sick! The instant the word left my lips, Marley fulfilled the prophecy, committing the ultimate Dog Beach heresy. Gah! I raced to pull him out of the water, but it was too late. Everything was coming up. Gah! I could see last night's dog chow floating on the water's surface, looking surprisingly like it had before it went in. Bobbing among the nuggets were undigested corn kernels he had swiped off the kids' plates, a milk jug cap, and the severed head of a tiny plastic soldier. The entire evacuation took no more than three seconds, and the instant his stomach was emptied, he looked up brightly, apparently fully recovered with no lingering after-effects, as if to say... Now that I've got that taken care of, who wants to body surf? I glanced nervously around, but no one had seemed to notice. The other dog owners were occupied with their own dogs farther down the beach. Thank God, I thought, as I waded into Marley's puke zone, roiling the water with my feet as nonchalantly as I could to disperse the evidence. Listen, you, I grabbed Marley and forced him to look me in the eye. Stop drinking salt water! What kind of a dog doesn't know enough to not drink salt water? I considered janking him off the beach and cutting our adventure short, but he seemed fine now. 
What I had failed to consider was that while Marley's stomach may have been completely emptied, his bowels were not. The sun was reflecting blindingly off the water, and I squinted to see Marley frolicking among the other dogs. As I watched, he abruptly disengaged from the play and began turning in tight circles in the shallow water. I knew the circling maneuver well. It was what he did every morning in the backyard as he prepared to defecate. And now he was circling in the shallows of Dog Beach, on that brave frontier where no dog had dared to poop before. He was entering his squatting position, and this time he had an audience. Killer's dad and several other dog owners were standing within a few yards of him. Hey! someone yelled out. Get your dog! Stop him! someone else shouted. As alarmed voices cried out, the sunbathers propped themselves up to see what all the commotion was about. I burst into a full sprint, racing to get to him before it was too late. If I could just reach him and yank him out of his squat before his bowels began to move, I might be able to interrupt the whole awful humiliation, at least long enough to get him safely up on the dune. As I raced toward him, I had what can only be described as an out-of-body experience. Even as I ran, I was looking down from above, the scene unfolding one frozen frame at a time. Each step seemed to last an eternity. My arms swung through the air, my face contorted in a sort of agonized grimace. Marley was done circling now, and in full squat position. I was almost there, just feet from him. Marley, no, 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 no! It was no use. Just as I reached him, he exploded in a burst of watery diarrhea. Everyone was jumping back now, recoiling, fleeing to higher ground. Owners were grabbing their dogs. Sunbathers scooped up their towels. Then it was over. Marley trotted out of the water onto the beach, shook off with gusto, and turned to look at me, panting happily. I pulled a plastic bag out of my pocket and held it helplessly in the air. I could see immediately it would do no good. The waves crashed in, spreading Marley's mess across the water and up onto the beach. Dude, Killer's dad said, in a voice that made me appreciate how the wild hogs must feel at the instant of Killer's final fatal lunge. That was not cool. No, it wasn't cool at all. Marley and I had violated the sacred rule of Dog Beach. We had fouled the water, not once, but twice, and ruined the morning for everyone. It was time to beat a quick retreat. Back at the car, I threw a towel over Marley and vigorously rubbed him down. The more I rubbed, the more he shook, and soon I was covered in sand and spray and fur. I wanted to be mad at him. I wanted to strangle him. But it was too late now. Besides, who wouldn't get sick drinking a half gallon of salt water? As with so many of his misdeeds, this one was not malicious or premeditated. It wasn't as though he had disobeyed a command or set out to intentionally humiliate me. He simply had to go, and he went. Well, salty dog, you've done it this time. If dogs are banned from Dog Beach, we'll know why. It would take several more years, but in the end, that's exactly what happened. Chapter 21 A Northbound Plane Shortly after Colleen turned two, I wrapped up my column early for the day and found myself with a half hour to kill as I waited for my editor. On a whim, I decided to check out the website of a magazine I had been subscribing to since not long after we bought our West Palm Beach house. The magazine was Organic Gardening, which was launched in 1942 by the eccentric J.I. Rodale and went on to become the Bible of the Back to Earth movement that blossomed in the 1960s and 1970s. Rodale had been a New York City businessman specializing in electrical switches when his health began to fail. 
Instead of turning to modern medicine to solve his problems, he moved from the city to a small farm outside the tiny borough of Emmaus, Pennsylvania, and began playing in the dirt. He had a deep distrust of technology and believed the modern farming and gardening methods sweeping the country, nearly all of them relying on chemical pesticides and fertilizers, were not the saviors of American agriculture they purported to be. He began experimenting with farming techniques that mimicked nature. His garden flourished, and so did his health, and he trumpeted his successes in the pages of his magazine. By the time I started reading organic gardening, J.I. Rodale was long dead, and so was his son Robert, who had built his father's business, Rodale Press, into a multi-million dollar publishing company. The organic philosophy increasingly made sense to me, especially after Jenny's miscarriage and our suspicion that it might have had something to do with the pesticides we had used. By the time Colleen was born, our yard was a little organic oasis. Passers-by often stopped to admire our thriving front garden, which I tended with increasing passion, and they almost always asked the same question, What do you put on it to make it look so good? When I answered, I don't, they looked at me uncomfortably, as though they had just stumbled upon something unspeakably subversive going on. That afternoon in my office, I clicked through the screens at organicgardening.com and eventually found my way to a button that said, Career Opportunities. I clicked on it. Why? I'm still not sure. I loved my job as a columnist, loved the daily interaction I had with readers, loved the freedom to pick my own topics and be as serious or as flippant as I wanted to be. I loved the newsroom and the quirky, brainy, neurotic, idealistic people it attracted. I had no desire to leave newspapers for a sleepy publishing company in the middle of nowhere. Still, I began scrolling through the Rodale job postings. Midway down the list, I stopped cold. Organic Gardening, the company's flagship magazine, was seeking a new managing editor. I had often daydreamed about the huge difference a decent journalist could make at the magazine, and now here was my chance. But a career editing stories about cauliflower and compost? Why would I want to do that? That night I told Jenny about the opening, fully expecting her to tell me I was insane for even considering it. Instead, she surprised me by encouraging me to send a resume. The idea of leaving the heat and humidity and congestion and crime of South Florida for a simpler life in the country appealed to her. She missed falling leaves and spring daffodils. She missed icicles and apple cider. She wanted our kids, and, as ridiculous as it sounds, our dog, to experience the wonders of a winter blizzard. Now there's a good reason for changing careers, I said. You should do it, just to see what happens. If they offer it to you, you can always turn them down. I had to admit, I shared her dream about moving north again. Even as I grew to love Florida with its mild winters, spicy food, and comically irascible mix of people, I did not stop dreaming of someday escaping to my own private paradise. Not a posted stamp sized lot in the heart of hyper-precious Boca Raton, but a real piece of land where I could dig in the dirt, chop my own firewood, and tromp through the forest, my dog at my side. I applied, fully convincing myself it was just a lark. Two weeks later, the phone rang, and it was J.I. Rodale's granddaughter, Maria Rodale. Maria had taken a personal interest in the magazine her grandfather had founded, and she was convinced she needed a professional journalist, not another earnest organic gardener, to reinvigorate it, someone who could execute more challenging and important stories about the environment, genetic engineering, factory farming, and the burgeoning organic movement. I arrived for the job interview fully intending to play hard to get, but I was hooked the moment I drove out of the airport and onto the first curving two-lane country road. At every turn was another postcard. A stone farmhouse here, a covered bridge there. It didn't help that it was spring and every last tree in the Lehigh Valley was in full, glorious bloom. 
At a lonely country stop sign, I stepped out of my rental car and stood in the middle of the pavement. For as far as I could see in any direction, there was nothing but woods and meadows. Not a car, not a person, not a building. At the first payphone I could find, I called Jenny. You're not going to believe this place, I said. Two months later, the movers had the entire contents of our Boca house loaded into a gigantic truck. Chapter 22 In the Land of Pencils We settled into a rambling house on two acres perched on the side of a steep hill. Or perhaps it was a small mountain. The locals seemed to disagree on this point. Our property had a meadow where we could pick wild raspberries, a woods where I could chop logs to my heart's content, and a small spring-fed creek where the kids and Marley soon found they could get exceptionally muddy. There was a fireplace and endless garden possibilities, and a white steepled church on the next hill, visible from our kitchen window when the leaves dropped in the fall. There was only one thing missing from our bucolic existence. Minutes after we pulled into the driveway of our new house, Connor looked up at me, big tears rolling out of his eyes, and declared, I thought there were going to be pencils in Pennsylvania. For our boys, now ages seven and five, this was a near deal breaker. Given the name of the state we were adopting, both of them arrived fully expecting to see bright yellow writing implements hanging like berries from every tree and shrub, there for the plucking. What our property lacked in school supplies, it made up for in skunks, opossums, woodchucks, and poison ivy, which flourished along the edge of our woods and snaked up the trees, giving me hives just to look at it. One morning I glanced out the kitchen window as I fumbled with the coffee maker, and there, staring back at me, was a magnificent eight-point buck. Another morning a family of wild turkeys gobbled its way across the backyard. Living in the country was at once peaceful, charming, and just a little lonely. The Pennsylvania Dutch were polite but cautious of outsiders, and we were definitely outsiders. After South Florida's legion crowds and lines, I should have been ecstatic about the solitude. Instead, at least in the early months, I found myself darkly ruminating over our decision to move to a place where so few others apparently wanted to live. Marley, on the other hand, had no such misgivings. For a dog with more energy than sense, what wasn't to like? He raced across the lawn, crashed through the brambles, splashed through the creek. His life mission was to catch one of the countless rabbits that considered my garden their own personal salad bar. He would spot a rabbit munching the lettuce and barrel off down the hill in hot pursuit, ears flapping behind him, paws pounding the ground, his bark filling the air. He was about as stealthy as a marching band and never got closer than a dozen feet before his intended prey scampered off into the woods to safety. Autumn came and with it a whole new mischievous game. Attack the leaf pile. In Florida, trees did not shed their leaves in the fall and Marley was positively convinced the foliage drifting down from the skies now was a gift meant just for him. Only after I had gathered a mighty towering pile would he lunge, charging across the lawn in a series of bounding leaps, flying for the last several feet, and landing in a giant belly flop in the middle of the pile, where he growled and rolled and flailed and scratched and snapped, and, for reasons not clear to me, fiercely chased his tail, not stopping until my neat leaf pile was scattered across the lawn again. Our first Christmas in Pennsylvania was supposed to be white. Jenny and I had had to do a sales job on Patrick and Connor to convince them that leaving their home and friends in Florida was for the best, and one of the big selling points was the promise of snow. We wantonly spun a Courier and Ives image for them of waking up on Christmas morning to a starkly white landscape, unblemished except for the solitary tracks of Santa's sleigh outside our front door. In the week leading up to the big day, the three of them sat in the window together for hours, their eyes glued on the leaden sky, as if they could will it to open up and discharge its load, 
Come on, Snow! The kids chanted. A few days before Christmas, the whole family piled into the minivan and drove to a farm a half mile away, where we cut a spruce tree and enjoyed a free hayride and hot apple cider around a bonfire. It was the kind of classic northern holiday moment we had missed in Florida, but one thing was absent. As we hauled our fresh-cut tree home, the sweet scent of its sap filling the van, the kids complained about getting gypped. First, no pencils. Now no snow. What else did their parents lie to them about? Christmas morning found a brand new toboggan beneath the tree, and enough snow gear to outfit an excursion to Antarctica. But the view out our window remained all bare branches. Then, three weeks into the new year, Patrick ran into our bedroom at dawn and yanked open the blinds. Look! Look! He squealed. It's here! Jenny and I sat up in bed to behold our vindication. A white blanket covered the hillsides and cornfields and pine trees and rooftops, stretching to the horizon. The snow was nearly a foot deep and still coming down. Soon, Connor and Colleen came chugging down the hall, thumbs and mouths, blankies trailing behind them. Marley was up and stretching, banging his tail into everything, sensing the excitement. I turned to the kids and shouted, "Okay, snow bunnies, let's suit up." For the next half hour, we wrestled with zippers and leggings and buckles and hoods and gloves. By the time we were done, the kids looked like mummies, and our kitchen like the staging area for the Winter Olympics. And competing in the goof on ice downhill competition, large canine division was Marley the dog. I opened the front door, and before anyone else could step out. Marley blasted past us, knocking the well-bundled Colleen over in the process. The instant his paws hit the strange white stuff, ah, wet, ah, cold, he had second thoughts and attempted an abrupt about face. As anyone who has ever driven a car in snow knows, sudden braking coupled with tight U-turns is never a good idea. Marley went into a full skid, his rear end spinning out in front of him. He dropped down on one flank briefly before bouncing upright again, just in time to somersault down the front porch steps and head first into a snowdrift. When he popped back up a second later, he looked like a giant powdered donut, except for a black nose and two brown eyes. He was completely dusted in white, the abominable snow dog. Marley did not know what to make of this foreign substance. He snapped at it and rubbed his face in it. Then, as if an invisible hand reached down from the heavens and jabbed him with a giant shot of adrenaline, he took off at full throttle, racing around the yard in a series of giant loping leaps, interrupted every several feet by a random somersault or nose dive. Soon, the kids were taking his lead, spinning and rolling and frolicking, snow packing into every crease and crevice of their outerwear. Jenny came out with buttered toast, mugs of hot cocoa, and an announcement: school was canceled. I knew there was no way I was getting my little two-wheel drive Nissan out the driveway any time soon, let alone up and down the unplowed mountain roads. And I declared an official snow day for me too. I scraped the snow away from the stone circle I had built that fall for backyard campfires, and soon had a crackling blaze going. The kids glided screaming down the hill in the toboggan, past the campfire, and to the edge of the woods. Marley chasing behind them. I looked at Jenny and asked, "If someone had told you a year ago that your kids would be sledding right out their back door, would you have believed them?" "Not a chance," she said. Then wound up and unleashed a snowball that thumped me in the chest. The snow was in her hair, a blush in her cheeks. Her breath rising in a cloud above her. Come here and kiss me, I said. Later, as the kids warmed themselves by the fire, I decided to try a run on the toboggan. I positioned the toboggan at the top of the hill and lay back on it, propped up on my elbows, my feet tucked inside its nose. I began rocking to get moving. Not often did Marley have the opportunity to look down at me. And having me prone like that was tantamount to an invitation. He sidled up to me and sniffed my face. "What do you want?" I asked, 
and that was all the welcome he needed. He clambered aboard, straddling me and dropping onto my chest. Get off me, you big lug! But it was too late. Off we went, snow flying, Marley plastered on top of me, licking me lustily all over my face as we careened down the slope. With our combined weight, we had considerably more momentum than the kids had, and we barreled past the point where their tracks petered out. Hold on, Marley, we're going into the woods! We shot past a large walnut tree, then between two wild cherry trees, miraculously avoiding all unyielding objects as we crashed through the underbrush. It suddenly occurred to me that just up ahead was the bank leading down several feet to the creek, still unfrozen. I tried to kick my feet out to use as brakes, but they were stuck. The bank was steep, nearly a sheer drop-off, and we were going over. I had time only to wrap my arms around Marley, squeeze my eyes shut, and yell, Whoa! Our toboggan shot over the bank and dropped out from beneath us. I felt like I was in one of those classic cartoon moments, suspended in midair for an endless second before falling to ruinous injury. Only in this cartoon, I was welded to a madly salivating Labrador retriever. We clung to each other as we crash-landed into a snowbank with a soft poof and, hanging half off the toboggan, slid to the water's edge. I opened my eyes and took stock of my condition. I could wiggle my toes and fingers and rotate my neck. Nothing was broken. Marley was up and prancing around me, eager to do it all over again. I stood up with a groan and, brushing myself off, said, I'm getting too old for this stuff. In the months ahead, it would become increasingly obvious that Marley was, too. Sometime toward the end of that first winter in Pennsylvania, I began to notice Marley had moved quietly out of middle age and into retirement. He had turned nine that December, and ever so slightly he was slowing down. He still had his burst of unbridled, adrenaline-pumped energy, as he did on the day of the first snowfall but they were briefer now and farther apart. He was content to snooze most of the day, and on walks he tired before I did, a first in our relationship. One late winter day, the temperature above freezing and the scent of spring thaw in the air, I walked him down our hill and up the next one, even steeper than ours, where the white church perched on the crest beside an old cemetery filled with Civil War veterans. It was a walk I took often, and one that the previous fall Marley had made without visible effort. This time, though, he was falling behind. I coaxed him along, calling out words of encouragement, but Marley just did not have the oomph needed to make it to the top. I stopped to let him rest before continuing, something I had never had to do before. The sun bathed over him, and I noticed just how much gray had crept into his tawny face. Because his fur was so light, the effect was subtle but undeniable. His whole muzzle and a good part of his brow had turned from buff to white. Without us quite realizing it, our eternal puppy had become a senior citizen. That's not to say he was any better behaved. Marley was still up to all his old antics, simply at a more leisurely pace. He still stole food off the children's plates. He still flipped open the lid of the kitchen trash can with his nose and rummaged inside. And when the skies darkened and thunder rumbled, he still panicked and, if alone, turned destructive. One day we arrived home to find Marley in a lather and Connor's mattress splayed open down to the coils. Over the years we had become philosophical about the damage, which had become much less frequent now that we were away from Florida's daily storm patterns. In a dog's life, some plaster would fall, some cushions would open, some rugs would shred. Like any relationship, this one had its cost. They were costs we came to accept and balance against the joy and amusement and protection and companionship he gave us. Marley had earned his place in our family. Like a quirky but beloved uncle, he was what he was. He would never be Lassie or Benji. He would never reach Westminster. We knew that now. We accepted him for the dog he was, 
and loved him all the more for it. You old geezer, I said to him on the side of the road that late winter day, scruffing his neck. Our goal, the cemetery, was still a steep climb ahead. But just as in life, I was figuring out, the destination was less important than the journey. I dropped to one knee, running my hands down his sides, and said, Let's just sit here for a while. When he was ready, we turned back down the hill and poked our way home. Chapter 23 Poultry on Parade That spring, we decided to try our hand at animal husbandry. We own two acres in the country now. It only seemed right to share it with a farm animal or two. Besides, I was editor of Organic Gardening, a magazine that had long celebrated the incorporation of animals and their manure into a healthy, well-balanced garden. In the end, we settled on poultry. For any gardener who had sworn off chemical pesticides and fertilizers, chickens made a lot of sense. They were inexpensive and relatively low maintenance. They needed only a small coop and a few cups of cracked corn each morning to be happy. Not only did they provide fresh eggs, but when let loose to roam, they spent their days studiously scouring the property, eating bugs and grubs, devouring ticks, scratching up the soil like efficient little rototillers, and fertilizing with their high nitrogen droppings as they went. Jenny had become friendly with a mom from school who lived on a farm and said she'd be happy to give us some chicks from the next clutch of eggs to hatch. Just one word of warning, another neighbor who raised chickens for eggs and meat advised, Whatever you do, don't let the kids name them. Once you name them, they're no longer poultry, they're pets. Right, I said. Chicken farming, I knew, had no room for sentimentality. Hens could live 15 years or more, but only produced eggs in their first couple of years. When they stopped laying, it was time for the stewing pot. That was just part of managing a flock. The next evening, I pulled into the driveway from work, and the three kids raced out of the house to greet me, each cradling a newborn chick. Jenny was behind them with a fourth in her hands. Donna had brought the baby birds over that afternoon. They were barely a day old and peered up at me with cocked heads as if to ask, Are you my mama? Patrick was the first to break the news. I named mine Feathers. Mine is Tweety, said Connor. My wick a Wuffy, Colleen chimed in. I shot Jenny a quizzical look. Fluffy, she said. She named her chicken Fluffy. Jenny, I protested. What did we decide? These are farm animals, not pets. Oh, get real, Farmer John, she said. You know as well as I do that you can never hurt one of these. Just look at how cute they are. Jenny, I said, the frustration rising in my voice. By the way, she said, holding up the fourth chick in her hands, meet Shirley. Several weeks after we brought the birds home, something jolted me awake before dawn. I sat up in bed and listened. From downstairs came a weak, sickly call. It was croaky and hoarse, more like a tubercular cough than a proclamation of dominance. It sounded again. cock a doodle doo A few seconds ticked past, and then came an equally sickly but distinct reply. rook rook I shook Jenny, and when she opened her eyes, asked, When Donna brought the chicks over, you did ask her to check to make sure they were hens, right? You mean you can do that? She asked and rolled back over, sound asleep. As it turned out, Donna had not attempted to sex our four chicks, and three of our four laying hens were males. I had thought the constant crowing of our roosters would drive Marley insane. In his younger years, the sweet chirp of a single tiny songbird in the yard would set him off on a frenetic barking jag as he raced from one window to the next, hopping up and down on his hind legs. Three crowing roosters a few steps from his food bowl, however, had no effect on him at all. He didn't seem to even know they were there. Each day the crowing grew louder and stronger. Marley slept right through the racket. 
That's when it first occurred to me that maybe he wasn't just ignoring the crowing. Maybe he couldn't hear it. I walked up behind him one afternoon as he snoozed in the kitchen and said, Marley? Nothing. I said it louder. Marley? Nothing. I clapped my hands. Marley! He lifted his head and looked blankly around, his ears up, trying to figure out what it was his radar had detected. I did it again, clapping loudly and shouting his name. This time he turned his head enough to catch a glimpse of me standing behind him. Oh, it's you! He bounced up, tail wagging, happy and clearly surprised, to see me. My dog, it seemed, was going deaf. It all made sense. In recent months, Marley seemed to simply ignore me in a way he never had before. I would call for him, and he would not so much as glance my way. I would take him outside before turning in for the night, and he would sniff his way across the yard, oblivious to my whistles and calls to get him to turn back. He would be asleep at my feet in the family room when someone would ring the doorbell, and he would not so much as open an eye. Not that he seemed to mind. Retirement suited Marley just fine, and his hearing problems didn't seem to impinge on his leisurely country lifestyle. If anything, deafness proved fortuitous for him, finally giving him a doctor-certified excuse for disobeying. After all, how could he heed a command that he could not hear? As thick-skulled as I always insisted he was, I swear he figured out how to use his deafness to his advantage. Yell for him to come when he had somewhere else he'd rather be going, and he'd strolled blithely away from you, not even glancing guiltily over his shoulder as he once would have, but drop a piece of steak into his bowl, and he would come trotting in from the next room. He still had the ability to detect the dull, satisfying thud of meat on metal. Marley went through life insatiably hungry. Not only did we give him four big scoops of dog chow a day, enough food to sustain an entire family of chihuahuas for a week, but we began freely supplementing his diet with table scraps, against the better advice of every dog guide we had ever read. Table scraps, we knew, simply programmed dogs to prefer human food to dog chow. And, given the choice between a half-eaten hamburger and dry kibble, who could blame them? Table scraps were a recipe for canine obesity, but not in our dog. Marley had many problems, but obesity was not among them. He was like a high-kilowatt electric plant that instantly converted every ounce of available fuel into pure, raw power. Marley was an amazing physical specimen, the kind of dog passers-by stopped to admire. He was huge for a Labrador retriever, 97 pounds of rippled, sinewy brawn with nary an ounce of fat anywhere on him. Each evening after we finished dinner, when it came time to give Marley his meal, I would fill his bowl with chow and then freely toss in any tasty leftovers or scraps I could find. With three young children at the table, Half-eaten food was something we had in plentiful supply. The only foods we kept from him were those we knew to be unhealthy for dogs. Larding Marley's meals with scraps that would otherwise be thrown out made me feel thrifty, waste not, want not, and charitable. When Marley wasn't acting as our household garbage disposal, he was on duty as the family's emergency spill response team. No mess was too big a job for our dog. One of the kids would flip a full bowl of spaghetti and meatballs on the floor, and we'd simply whistle and stand back while old wetback sucked up every last noodle and then licked the floor until it gleamed. Errant peas, dropped celery, runaway rigatoni, spilled applesauce, it didn't matter what it was. If it hit the floor, it was history. To the amazement of our friends, he even woofed down salad greens. One day, I arrived home from work to find the house empty. Jenny and the kids were out somewhere, and I called for Marley but got no response. I found him in the kitchen, his back to me. 
He was standing on his hind legs, his front paws and chest resting on the kitchen table as he gobbled down the remains of a grilled cheese sandwich. My first reaction was to loudly scold him. Instead, I decided to see how close I could get before he realized he had company. I tiptoed up behind him until I was close enough to touch him. As he chewed the crust, he kept glancing at the door that led into the garage, knowing that that was where Jenny and the kids would enter upon their return. The instant the door opened, he would be on the floor under the table, feigning sleep. Apparently, it had not occurred to him that Dad might sneak in through the front door. Oh, Marley, I asked in a normal voice, what do you think you're doing? His tail was wagging languidly, a sign he thought he was alone and getting away with a major food heist. Clearly, he was pleased with himself. I cleared my throat loudly, <clears throat> and he still didn't hear me. I made kissy noises with my mouth. Nothing. He polished off one sandwich, nosed the plate out of the way, and stretched forward to reach the crust left on a second plate. I snapped my fingers twice, and he froze mid-bite, staring at the back door. What was that? Did I hear a car door slam? After a moment, he convinced himself it was nothing, and went back to his purloined snack. That's when I reached out and tapped him once on the butt. I might as well have lit a stick of dynamite. The old dog nearly jumped out of his fur coat. He rocketed backward off the table, and as soon as he saw me, dropped onto the floor, rolling over to expose his belly to me in surrender. Busted! You are so busted! But I didn't have it in me to scold him. He was old. He was deaf. He was beyond reform. Now, as he lay at my feet, begging for forgiveness, I just found it a little sad. I guess secretly I had hoped he'd been faking all along. I built a chicken coop, an A-frame plywood affair with a drawbridge-style gangplank that could be raised at night to keep out predators. Donna kindly took back two of our three roosters and exchanged them for hens from her flock. We now had three girls and one testosterone-pumped guy bird that spent every waking minute doing one of three things. Pursuing sex? having sex, or crowing boastfully about the sex he had just scored. Jenny observed that roosters are what men would be if left to their own devices, with no social conventions to rein in their baser instincts, and I couldn't disagree. I had to admit, I kind of admired the lucky bastard. We let the chickens out each morning to roam the yard, and Marley made a few gallant runs at them, charging ahead, barking for a few dozen paces or so, before losing steam and giving up. It was as though some genetic coating deep inside him was sending an urgent message. You're a retriever. They are birds. Don't you think it might be a good idea to chase them? He just did not have his heart in it. Soon the birds learned the lumbering yellow beast was no threat whatsoever, more a minor annoyance than anything else, and Marley learned to share the yard with these new feathered interlopers. One day I looked up from weeding in the garden to see Marley and the four chickens making their way down the road toward me as if in formation, the birds pecking and Marley sniffing as they went. It was like old friends out for a Sunday stroll. What kind of a self-respecting hunting dog are you? I chastised him. Marley lifted his leg and peed on a tomato plant before hurrying to rejoin his new pals. Chapter 24 The Potty Room A person can learn a few things from an old dog. Jenny and I were not quite middle-aged. Our children were young, our health good, 
and our retirement years still an unfathomable distance off on the horizon. It would have been easy to deny the inevitable creep of age, to pretend it might somehow pass us by. Marley would not afford us the luxury of such denial. As we watched him grow gray and deaf and creaky, there was no ignoring his mortality, or ours. In the brief span of twelve years, Marley had gone from bubbly puppy to awkward adolescent to muscular adult to doddering senior citizen. He aged roughly seven years for every one of ours, putting him in human years on the downward slope to ninety. His once sparkling white teeth had gradually worn down to brown nubs. His breath, always a bit on the fishy side, had taken on the bouquet of a sun-baked dumpster. His digestion was not what it once had been, and he became as gassy as a methane plant. There were days I swore that if I lit a match, the whole house would go up. Marley was able to clear an entire room with his silent, deadly flatulence, which seemed to increase in direct correlation to the number of dinner guests we had in our home. Marley, not again! The children would scream in unison and lead the retreat. Sometimes he drove even himself away. He would be sleeping peacefully when the smell would reach his nostrils. His eyes would pop open and he'd furl his brow as if asking, Good God, who dealt it? And he would stand up and nonchalantly move into the next room. When he wasn't farting, he was outside pooping, or at least thinking about it. His choosiness about where he squatted to defecate had grown to the point of compulsive obsession. Each time I let him out, he took longer and longer to decide on the perfect spot. Back and forth he would promenade, sniffing, pausing, scratching, circling, moving on, the whole while sporting a ridiculous grin on his face. I stood outside, sometimes in the rain, sometimes in the snow, sometimes in the dark of night, often barefoot, occasionally just in my boxer shorts, knowing from experience that I didn't dare leave him unsupervised, lest he decide to meander up the hill to visit the dogs on the next street. Sneaking away became a sport for him. If the opportunity presented itself and he thought he could get away with it, he would sniff and shuffle his way from one bush to the next until he was out of sight. Late one night, I let him out the front door for his final walk before bed. Freezing rain was forming an icy slush on the ground, and I turned around to grab a slicker out of the front closet. When I walked out onto the sidewalk less than a minute later, he was nowhere to be found. I walked out into the yard, whistling and clapping, knowing he couldn't hear me. For twenty minutes, I prowled through our neighbor's yards in the rain, making quite the fashion statement, dressed in boots, raincoat, and boxer shorts. As the minutes passed, my anger turned to worry. I thought of those old men you read about in the newspaper who wander away from nursing homes and are found frozen in the snow three days later. I returned home, walked upstairs, and woke up Jenny. Marley's disappeared. I can't find him anywhere. He's out there in the freezing rain. She was on her feet instantly, pulling on jeans, slipping into a sweater and boots. Together we brought in the search. I could hear her way up the side of the hill, whistling and clucking for him, as I crashed through the woods in the dark, half expecting to find him lying unconscious in a creek bed. Eventually, our paths met up. Anything? Nothing. We were soaked from the rain, and my bare legs were stinging from the cold. Let's go home and get warm, and I'll come back out with the car. We walked down the hill and up the driveway. That's when we saw him, standing beneath the overhang out of the rain and overjoyed to have us back. I could have killed him. Instead, I brought him inside and toweled him off, the unmistakable smell of wet dog filling the kitchen. Exhausted from his late-night jaunt, Marley conked out and did not budge till nearly noon the next day. Marley's eyesight had grown fuzzy, and bunnies could now scamper past a dozen feet in front of him without him noticing. He was shedding his fur in vast quantities, forcing Jenny to vacuum every day 
and still she couldn't keep up with it. One night as I watched television, I dangled my leg off the couch and absently stroked his hip with my bare foot. At the commercial break, I looked down to see a sphere of fur the size of a grapefruit near where I had been rubbing. His hairballs rolled across the wood floors like tumbleweeds on a wind-blown plain. Most worrisome of all were his hips, which had mostly forsaken him. Arthritis had snuck into his joints, weakening them and making them ache. The same dog that once could ride me Bronco-style on his back could now barely pull himself up. He groaned in pain when he lay down and groaned again when he struggled to his feet. I did not realize just how weak his hips had become until one day when I gave his rump a light pat and his hindquarters collapsed beneath him. Down he went. It was painful to watch. Climbing the stairs to the second floor was becoming increasingly difficult for him, but he wouldn't think of sleeping alone on the main floor. Marley loved people, loved resting his chin on the mattress and panning in our faces as we slept, loved jamming his head through the shower curtain for a drink as we bathed, and he wasn't about to stop now. Each night when Jenny and I retired to our bedroom, he would fret at the foot of the stairs, whining, yipping, pacing, tentatively testing the first step with his front paw as he mustered his courage for the ascent that not long before had been effortless. From the top of the stairs, I would beckon. Come on, boy, you can do it. After several minutes of this, he would disappear around the corner in order to get a running start and then come charging up, his front shoulders bearing most of his weight. Sometimes he made it. Sometimes he stalled mid-flight and had to return to the bottom and try again. On his most pitiful attempts, he would lose his footing entirely and slide ingloriously backward down the steps on his belly. He was too big for me to carry, but increasingly I found myself following him up the stairs, lifting his rear end up each step as he hopped forward on his front paws. Because of the difficulty stairs now posed for him, I assumed Marley would try to limit the number of trips he made up and down. That would be giving him far too much credit for common sense. No matter how much trouble he had getting up the stairs, if I returned downstairs, say, to grab a book or turn off the lights, he would be right on my heels, clomping heavily down behind me. Then seconds later, he would have to repeat the torturous climb. This went on not only at night, but all day long, too. I would be reading the newspaper at the kitchen table with Marley curled up at my feet when I would get up for a refill from the coffee pot across the room. Even though I was within sight and would be coming right back, he would lumber with difficulty to his feet and trudge over to be with me. No sooner had he gotten comfortable at my feet by the coffee pot than I would return to the table, where he would again drag himself and settle in. A few minutes later, I would walk into the family room to turn on the stereo, and up again he would struggle, following me in, circling around, and collapsing with a moan beside me, just as I was ready to walk away. So it would go, not only with me, but with Jenny and the kids, too. One evening in the spring of 2002, I took Marley out for a short walk around the yard, the night was cool, in the high forties, and windy. Invigorated by the crisp air, I started to run, and Marley, feeling frisky himself, galloped along beside me, just like in the old days. I even said out loud to him, See, Marl, you still have some of the puppy in you. At the porch stoop, Marley gamely tried to leap up the two steps, but his rear hips collapsed on him as he pushed off, and he found himself awkwardly stuck his front paws on the stoop, his belly resting on the steps, and his butt collapsed flat on the sidewalk. There he sat, trying to get up, but it was no use. He could not lift his rear off the ground. Finally, I grabbed him under the front shoulders and turned him sideways so he could get all four legs on the ground. Then, after a few failed tries, he was able to stand. He backed up, looked apprehensively at the stairs for a few seconds, and loped up and into the house. From that day on, his confidence as a champion stair climber 
was shot. He never attempted those two small steps again without first stopping and fretting. Marley reminded me of life's brevity, of its fleeting joys and missed opportunities. One day you're swimming halfway out into the ocean, convinced this is the day you will catch that seagull. The next, you're barely able to bend down to drink out of your water bowl. Like Patrick Henry and everyone else, I had but one life to live. I kept coming back to the same question. What in God's name was I doing spending it at a gardening magazine? It wasn't that my new job did not have its rewards. I was proud of what I had done with the magazine. But I miss newspapers desperately. I miss the people who read them and the people who write them. I miss being part of the big story of the day and the feeling that I was in my own small way helping to make a difference. I miss the adrenaline surge of writing on deadline and the satisfaction of waking up the next morning to find my inbox filled with emails responding to my words. Mostly, I miss telling stories. I wondered why I had ever walked away from a gig that so perfectly fit my disposition. When a former colleague of mine mentioned in passing that the Philadelphia Inquirer was seeking a metropolitan columnist, I leapt without a second's hesitation. Columnist positions are extremely hard to come by, even at smaller papers. And when a position does open up, it's almost always filled internally, a plum handed to veteran staffers who've proved themselves as reporters. The Inquirer was well-respected, winner of 17 Pulitzer Prizes over the years, and one of the country's great newspapers. I was a fan, and now the Inquirer's editors were asking to meet me. I wouldn't even have to relocate my family to take the job. The office I would be working in was just 45 minutes down the Pennsylvania Turnpike, a tolerable commute. I don't put much stock in miracles, but it all seemed too good to be true like an act of divine intervention. In November 2002, I traded in my gardening togs for a Philadelphia Inquirer press badge. It quite possibly was the happiest day of my life. I was back where I belonged, in a newsroom, as a columnist, once again. I had only been in the new job for a few months when the first big snowstorm of 2003 hit, the flakes began to fall on a Sunday night, and by the time they stopped the next day, a blanket two feet deep covered the ground. The children were off school for three days as our community slowly dug out, and I filed my columns from home. With a snowblower I borrowed from my neighbor, I cleared the driveway and opened a narrow canyon to the front door. Knowing Marley could never climb the sheer walls to get out into the yard, I cleared him his own potty room, as the kids dubbed it, a small plowed space off the front walkway where he could do his business. When I called him outside to try out the new facilities, though, he just stood in the clearing and sniffed the snow suspiciously. He had very particular notions about what constituted a suitable place to answer nature's call, and this clearly was not what he had in mind. He was willing to lift his leg and pee, but that's where he drew the line. Poop right here, smack in front of the picture window? You can't be serious. He turned and with a mighty heave to climb up the slippery porch steps, went back inside. That night after dinner, I brought him out again, and this time Marley no longer could afford the luxury of waiting. Before I could stop him, he somehow clambered up and over the sheer snow wall the snowblower had cut and began making his way across the yard toward a stand of white pines fifty feet away. I couldn't believe it. My arthritic, geriatric dog was off on an alpine trek. Slowly, painfully, he made it to the closest pine tree. Suddenly I saw what he was up to. The dog had a plan. Beneath the dense branches of the pine, the snow was just a few inches deep. The tree acted like an umbrella, and once underneath it, Marley was free to move about and squat comfortably to relieve himself. I had to admit, it was pretty brilliant. He circled and sniffed and scratched in his customary way, trying to locate a worthy shrine for his daily offering. Then, to my amazement, he abandoned the cozy shelter and lunged back into the deep snow, 
en route to the next pine tree. The first spot looked perfect to me, but clearly it was just not up to his sterling standards. With difficulty, he reached the second tree, but again, after considerable circling, found the area beneath its branches unsuitable. So he set off to the third tree, and then the fourth, and the fifth, each time getting farther from the driveway. Finally, he reached the last tree on our property, a big spruce with a dense canopy of branches out near where the kids waited for the school bus. It was here he found the frozen piece of ground he had been looking for, private and barely dusted with snow. He circled a few times and creakily squatted down on his old, shot, arthritis-riddled haunches. There, he finally found relief. Eureka! The next morning, I shoveled a narrow path out to the far spruce tree on the corner of the property for him, and Marley adopted the space as his own personal powder room for the duration of the winter. The crisis had been averted, but bigger questions loomed. How much longer could he continue like this? And at what point would the aches and indignities of old age outstrip the simple contentment he found in each sleepy, lazy day? Chapter 25 Beating the Odds When school let out for the summer, Jenny packed the kids into the minivan and headed to Boston for a week to visit her sister. I stayed behind to work. That left Marley with no one at home to keep him company and let him out. Of the many little embarrassments old age inflicted on him, the one that seemed to bother him most was the diminished control he had over his bowels. He no longer could go more than a few hours between pit stops. When the urge called, he had to go, and if we were not home to let him out, he had no choice but to go inside. It killed him to do it, and we always knew the second we walked into the house when he had had an accident. Instead of greeting us at the door in his exuberant manner, he would be standing far back in the room, his head hanging nearly to the floor, his tail flat between his legs, the shame radiating off him. We never punished him for it. How could we? He was nearly thirteen, about as old as Labs got. With Jenny and the kids away, I knew I would be putting in long days. This was my chance to stay out after work, wandering around the region and exploring the towns and neighborhoods I was now writing about. I would be away from home ten to twelve hours a day. There was no question Marley couldn't be alone that long, or even half that long. We decided to board him at the local kennel we used every summer when we went on vacation. The kennel was attached to a large veterinarian practice that offered professional care, if not the most personal service. Each time we went there, it seemed, we saw a different doctor. We never even learned their names. Unlike our beloved Dr. J in Florida, who knew Marley almost as well as we did, and who truly had become a family friend by the time we left, these were strangers, competent strangers, but strangers nonetheless. Marley didn't seem to mind. I dropped him off on a Sunday evening and left my cell phone number with the front desk. That Tuesday morning, I was near Independence Hall in downtown Philadelphia when my cell phone rang. It was yet another veterinarian whose name I had never heard before. We have an emergency with Marley, she said. Marley's stomach had bloated with food, water, and air, and then, stretched and distended, had flipped over on itself twisting and trapping its contents. With nowhere for the gas and other contents to escape, his stomach had swelled painfully in a life-threatening condition known as gastric dilatation volvulus. It almost always required surgery to correct, she said, and if left untreated could result in death within a few hours. She said she had inserted a tube down his throat and released much of the gas that had built up in his stomach, which relieved the swelling. By manipulating the tube in his stomach, she had worked the twist out of it, or as she put it, unflipped it, and he was now sedated and resting comfortably. That's a good thing, right? I asked cautiously. But only temporary. We got him through the immediate crisis, but once their stomachs twist like that, they almost always will twist again. 
like how almost always. I would say he has a one percent chance that it won't flip again. She said, "One percent, for God's sakes!" I thought he has better odds of getting into Harvard. One percent, that's it. I'm sorry, it's very grave. If his stomach did flip again, and she was telling me it was a virtual certainty, we had two choices. The first was to operate on him. She said she would open him up and attach the stomach to the cavity wall with sutures to prevent it from flipping again. The operation will cost about two thousand dollars, and I have to tell you, it's very invasive. It will be tough going for a dog his age. The recovery would be long and difficult, assuming he made it through the operation at all. Sometimes older dogs like him did not survive the trauma of the surgery. She explained, "If he was four or five years old, I would be saying, 'By all means, let's operate.' But at his age, you have to ask yourself if you really want to put him through that. What's the second option? The second option," she said, hesitating only slightly. Would be putting him to sleep. Oh. I was having trouble processing it all. Five minutes ago, I was walking to the Liberty Bell, assuming Marley was happily relaxing in his kennel run. Now I was being asked to decide whether he should live or die. I had never even heard of the condition she described. Only later would I learn that bloat was fairly common in some breeds of dogs, especially those such as Marley with deep, barrel chests. Dogs who scarf down their entire meal in a few quick gulps, Marley once again, also seem to be at higher risk. The vet on the phone acknowledged Marley's excitement around the other dogs in the kennel could have brought on the attack. He had gulped down his food as usual and was panting and salivating heavily. Worked up by all the other dogs around him, she thought he might have swallowed so much air and saliva that his stomach began to dilate on its long axis, making it vulnerable to twisting. Can't we just wait and see how he does? Maybe it won't twist again. That's what we're doing right now: waiting and watching. If his stomach flips again, I'll need you to make a quick decision. We can't let him suffer. I need to speak with my wife. I told her. I'll call you back. When Jenny answered her cell phone, she was on a crowded tour boat with the kids in the middle of Boston Harbor. I could hear the boat's engine chugging and the guide's voice booming through a loudspeaker in the background. We had a choppy, awkward conversation over a bad connection. Neither of us could hear the other well. I shouted to try to communicate what we were up against. She was only getting snippets. Marley, emergency. Stomach, surgery, put to sleep. There was silence on the other end. Hello, I said. Are you still there? I'm here, Jenny said. Then went quiet again. We both knew this day would come eventually. We just did not think it would be today. Not with her and the kids out of town, where they couldn't even have their goodbyes. Not with me ninety minutes away in downtown Philadelphia with work commitments. By the end of the conversation, through shouts and blurts and pregnant pauses, we decided there was really no decision at all. The vet was right. Marley was fading on all fronts. It would be cruel to put him through a traumatic surgery to simply try to stave off the inevitable. We cannot ignore the high cost either. It seemed obscene, almost immoral, to spend that kind of money on an old dog at the end of his life, when there were unwanted dogs put down every day for lack of a home, and more important, children not getting proper medical attention for lack of financial resources. If this was Marley's time, then it was his time, and we would see to it he went out with dignity and without suffering. We knew it was the right thing. Yet neither of us was ready to lose him. An hour later, Doctor Hopkinson sounded slightly more optimistic. Marley was still holding his own, resting with an intravenous drip in his front leg. She raised his odds to five percent. I don't want you to get your hopes up," she said. "He's a very sick dog." The next morning, the doctor sounded brighter still. He had a good night," she said. 
When I called back at noon, she had removed the IV from his paw and started him on a slurry of rice and meat. He's famished, she reported. By the next call, he was up on his feet. I wouldn't have thought it possible yesterday, but I think you'll be able to take him home tomorrow. The following evening after work, that's just what I did. He looked terrible, weak and skeletal, his eyes milky and crusted with mucus, as if he had been to the other side of death and back, which, in a sense, I guess he had. I must have looked a little ill myself after paying the $800 bill. The doctor said, The whole staff loves Marley. Everyone was rooting for him. I walked him out to the car, my 99 to 1 odds miracle dog, and said, Let's get you home where you belong. From now on, he was to receive four small meals a day and only limited rations of water, a half cup or so in his bowl at a time. In this way, the doctor hoped, his stomach would stay calm and not bloat and twist again. That night, after I got him home and inside, I spread a sleeping bag on the floor in the family room beside him. He was not up to climbing the stairs to the bedroom, and I didn't have the heart to leave him alone and helpless. I knew he would fret all night if he was not at my side. Tomorrow the house would be loud and boisterous and full of life again, for tonight it was just the two of us, Marley and me, lying there with him, his smelly breath in my face, I couldn't help thinking of our first night together all those years ago after I brought him home from the breeder, a tiny puppy whimpering for his mother. I remembered how I dragged his box into the bedroom and the way we had fallen asleep together, my arm dangling over the side of the bed to comfort him. Thirteen years later, here we were, still inseparable. I thought about his puppyhood and adolescence, about the shredded couches and eaten mattresses, about the wild walks along the intracoastal and the cheek-to-jowl dances with the stereo blaring. I thought about the swallowed objects and purloined paychecks and sweet moments of canine human empathy. Mostly, I thought about what a good and loyal companion he had been all these years. What a trip it had been. You really scared me, old man, I whispered as he stretched out beside me and slid his snout beneath my arm to encourage me to keep petting him. It's good to have you home. We fell asleep together, side by side on the floor, his rump half on my sleeping bag, my arm draped across his back. He woke me once in the night, his shoulders flinching, his paws twitching, little baby barks coming from deep in his throat, more like coughs than anything else. He was dreaming. Dreaming, I imagined, that he was young and strong again, and running like there was no tomorrow. Chapter 26 Borrowed Time the scare of that summer should have snapped Jenny and me out of our denial about Marley's advancing age, but we quickly returned to the comfortable assumption that the crisis was a one-time fluke and his eternal march into the sunset could resume once again. Despite all his frailties, he was still the same happy-go-lucky dog. His daily routine included barking at the mailman, visiting the chickens, staring at the bird feeder, and making the rounds of the bathtub faucets to check for any drips of water he could lap up. Several times a day he flipped the lid up on the kitchen trash can to see what goodies he could scavenge. On a daily basis I continued to pry open his jaws and extract from the roof of his mouth all sorts of flotsam from our daily lives, potato skins and muffin wrappers, discarded Kleenex and dental floss, even in old age, some things did not change. As September 11, 2003 approached, I drove across the state to the tiny mining town of Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where United Flight 93 had crashed into an empty field on that infamous morning two years earlier amid a passenger uprising. 
The hijackers who had seized the flight were believed to be heading for Washington, D.C. to crash the plane into the White House or the Capitol, and the passengers who rushed the cockpit almost certainly saved countless lives on the ground. To mark the second anniversary of the attacks, my editors wanted me to visit the site and take my best shot at capturing that sacrifice and the lasting effect it had on the American psyche. I spent the entire day at the crash site, lingering at the impromptu memorial that had risen there. I talked to the steady stream of visitors who showed up to pay their respects, interviewed locals who remembered the force of the explosion, sat with a woman who had lost her daughter in a car accident and who came to the crash site to find solace in communal grief. I documented the many mementos and notes that filled the gravel parking lot. Still, I was not feeling the column. What could I say about this immense tragedy that had not been said already? I went to dinner in town and poured over my notes. After I finished my meatloaf and iced tea, I headed back to the hotel to try to write. Halfway there, on an impulse, I pulled a U-turn and drove back out to the crash site several miles outside town, arriving just as the sun was slipping behind the hillside and the last few visitors were pulling away. I sat out there alone for a long time as sunset turned to dusk and dusk to night. A sharp wind blew down off the hills, and I pulled my windbreaker tight around me. Towering overhead, a giant American flag snapped in the breeze, its colors glowing almost iridescent in the last smoldering light. Only then did the emotion of this sacred place envelop me, and the magnitude of what happened in the sky above this lonely field begin to sink in. I looked out on the spot where the plane hit the earth, and then up at the flag, and I felt tears stinging my eyes. For the first time in my life, I took the time to count the stripes. Seven red, six white. I counted the stars, fifty of them, on a field of blue. It meant more to us now, this American flag. To a new generation, it stood once again for valor and sacrifice. I knew what I needed to write. I shoved my hands into my pockets and walked out to the edge of the gravel lot where I stared into the growing blackness. Standing out there in the dark, I felt many different things. One of them was pride in my fellow Americans, ordinary people who rose to the moment, knowing it was their last. One was humility, for I was alive and untouched by the horrors of that day, free to continue my happy life as a husband and father and writer. In the lonely blackness, I could almost taste the finiteness of life, and thus its preciousness. I was reminded of what should be obvious, but too often is not, that each day, each hour and minute, is worth cherishing. I felt something else as well, an amazement at the boundless capacity of the human heart. At once big enough to absorb a tragedy of this magnitude, yet still find room for the little moments of personal pain and heartache that are part of any life. And in my case, one of those little moments was my failing dog. With a tinge of shame, I realized that even amid the colossus of heartbreak that was Flight 93, I could still feel the sharp pang of the loss I knew was coming. Marley was living on borrowed time, that much was clear. Another health crisis could come any day, and when it did, I would not fight the inevitable. Any invasive medical procedure at this stage in his life would be cruel, something Jenny and I would be doing more for our sake than his. We loved that crazy old dog, loved him despite everything, or perhaps because of everything. But I could see now the time was near for us to let him go. I got back in the car and returned to my hotel room. The next morning, my column filed. I called home from the hotel. Jenny said, 
I just want you to know that Marley really misses you. He's driving us all bonkers. The night before, unable to find me, Marley had paced and sniffed the entire house over and over, she said, poking through every room, looking behind doors and in closets. He struggled to get upstairs, and not finding me there, came back down and began his search all over again. He was really out of sorts, she said. He even braved the steep descent into the basement where, until the slippery wooden stairs put it off limits to him, Marley had happily kept me company for long hours in my workshop, snoozing at my feet as I built things, the sawdust floating down and covering his fur like a soft snowfall. Once down there, he couldn't get back up the stairs, and he stood yipping and whining until Jenny and the kids came to his rescue holding him beneath the shoulders and hips, and boosting him up step by step. The next morning, Jenny went downstairs to make breakfast. A couple of hours passed before it dawned on her that Marley still had not shown his face, which was highly unusual. She found him sleeping soundly on the floor, tight against my side of the bed. Then she saw why. When she had gotten up, she had inadvertently pushed her pillows, she sleeps with three of them, over to my side of the bed beneath the covers, forming a large lump where I usually slept. With his Mr. Magoo eyesight, Marley could be forgiven for mistaking a pile of feathers for his master. He absolutely thought you were in there, she said. I could just tell he did. He was convinced you were sleeping in. Chapter 27 the Big Meadow. Winter arrived early that year. Like the children, I anticipated the first snowfall, but with a quiet sense of dread, wondering how Marley could make it through another tough winter. One blustery Sunday night in mid-December, when the children had finished their homework, Jenny started the popcorn on the stove and declared a family movie night. I got the fire humming as the kids queued up the video. I lay down on the floor and propped my head on a pillow, more watching the fire than the movie. Marley couldn't resist this opportunity. His favorite human was at ground level, utterly defenseless. Soon he was pressed up against me, grinding his head into my ribs. The minute I reached out to pet him, it was all over. He pushed himself up on his paws, shook hard, showering me in loose fur, and stared down at me, his billowing jowls hanging immediately over my face. When I started to laugh, he took this as a green light to advance, and before I quite knew what was happening, he had straddled my chest with his front paws and, in one big free fall, collapsed on top of me in a heap. Ah! I screamed under his weight. Full frontal lab attack! The kid squealed. Marley could not believe his good fortune. I wasn't even trying to get him off me. He squirmed, he drooled, he licked me all over the face and nuzzled my neck. I could barely breathe under his weight, and after a few minutes I slid him half off me, where he remained through most of the movie, his head, shoulder, and one paw resting on my chest, the rest of him pressed against my side. I didn't say so to anyone in the room, but I found myself clinging to the moment, knowing there would not be too many more like it. Marley was in the quiet dusk of a long and eventful life. Looking back on it later, I would recognize that night in front of the fire for what it was, our farewell party. Four days later, we packed the minivan in preparation for a family vacation to Disney World in Florida. It would be the children's first Christmas away from home, and they were wild with excitement. That evening, in preparation for an early morning departure, Jenny delivered Marley to the veterinarian's office, where she had arranged for him to spend our week away in the intensive care unit where the doctors and workers could keep their eyes on him around the clock and where he would not be riled by the other dogs. After his close call on their watch the previous summer, they were happy to give him the Cadillac digs and extra attention at no extra cost. Ridiculing the whole Disney experience is a favorite sport, 
but the whole family had a wonderful time, even naysayer dad. We spent much of the long drive back recounting the pros and cons of each ride, each swim, each moment. We were halfway through Maryland, just four hours from home, when my cell phone rang. It was one of the workers from the veterinarian's office. Marley was acting lethargic, she said, and his hips were worse than usual. She said the vet wanted our permission to give him a steroid shot and pain medication. Sure, I said, keep him comfortable, and we'd be there to pick him up the next day. When Jenny arrived to take him home the following afternoon, December 29th, Marley looked tired and a little out of sorts, but not visibly ill. But within a half hour of getting him home, he was retching, trying to clear thick mucus from his throat. Jenny let him out into the front yard, and he simply lay on the frozen ground and could not or would not budge. She called me at work in a panic. I can't get him back inside, she said. He's lying out there in the cold, and he won't get up. I left immediately, and by the time I arrived home 45 minutes later, she had managed to get him to his feet and back into the house. I found him sprawled on the dining room floor, distressed and clearly not himself. I knelt down beside him and rubbed his snout. No reaction. He did not try to gum my wrist, did not want to play, did not even lift his head. His eyes were far away, and his tail lay limp on the floor. After several minutes, Marley slowly stood up on shaky legs and tried to retch again, but nothing would come out. That's when I noticed his stomach. It looked bigger than usual, and it was hard to the touch. My heart sank. I knew what this meant. I called the veterinarian's office. The receptionist said, The doctor says to bring him right in. Jenny and I did not have to say a word to each other. We both understood that the moment had arrived. We braced the kids, telling them Marley had to go to the hospital, and the doctors were going to try to make him better, but that he was very sick. As I was getting ready to go, I looked in, and Jenny and the kids were huddled around him as he lay on the floor, so clearly in distress, making their goodbyes. They each got to pet him and have a few last moments with him. The children remained bullishly optimistic that this dog, who had been a constant part of their lives, would soon be back, good as new. "'Get all better, Marley,' Colleen said in her little voice." With Jenny's help, I got him into the back of my car. She gave him a last quick hug, and I drove off, one hand on the wheel, and the other stretched behind me so I could stroke his head and shoulders. Oh, Marley, I just kept saying. In the parking lot of the animal hospital, I helped him out of the car, and he stopped to sniff a tree where the other dogs all pee, still curious despite how ill he felt. I gave him a minute, knowing this might be his last time in his beloved outdoors, then tugged gently at his choker chain and led him into the lobby. Just inside the front door, he decided he had gone far enough and gingerly let himself down on the tile floor. When the Tex and I were unable to get him back to his feet, they brought out a stretcher, slid him onto it, and disappeared with him behind the counter, heading for the examining area. A few minutes later, the vet, a young woman I had never met before, came out and led me into an exam room where she put a pair of x-ray films up on a light board. She showed me how his stomach had bloated to twice its normal size. On the film, near where the stomach meets the intestines, she traced two fist-sized dark spots, which she said indicated a twist. Just as with the last time, she said she would sedate him and insert a tube into his stomach to release the gas causing the bloating. She would then use the tube to manually feel for the back of the stomach. It's a long shot, she said, but I'm going to try to use the tube to massage his stomach back into place. It was exactly the same 1% gamble Dr. Hopkinson had given over the summer. It had worked once. It could work again. 
I remained silently optimistic. Okay, I said. Please give it your best shot. A half hour later, she emerged with a grim face. She had tried three times and was unable to open the blockage. She had given him more sedatives in the hope they might relax his stomach muscles. When none of that worked, she had inserted a catheter through his ribs, a last-ditch attempt to clear the blockage, also without luck. At this point, she said, our only real option is to go into surgery. She paused, as if gauging whether I was ready to talk about the inevitable, and then said, or the most humane thing might be to put him to sleep. Jenny and I had been through this decision five months earlier and had already made the hard choice. My visit to Shanksville had only solidified my resolve not to subject Marley to any more suffering. Yet standing in the waiting room, the hour upon me once again, I stood frozen. The doctor sensed my agony and discussed the complications that could likely be expected in operating on a dog of Marley's age. Another thing troubling her, she said, was a bloody residue that had come out on the catheter, indicating problems with the stomach wall. Who knows what we might find when we get in there, she said. I told her I wanted to step outside to call my wife. On the cell phone in the parking lot, I told Jenny that they had tried everything short of surgery to no avail. We sat silently on the phone for a long moment before she said, I love you, John. I love you too, Jenny. I walked back inside and asked the doctor if I could have a couple of minutes alone with him. She warned me that he was heavily sedated. Take all the time you need, she said. I found him unconscious on the stretcher on the floor, an ivy shunt in his forearm. I got down on my knees and ran my fingers through his fur the way he liked. I ran my hand down his back. I lifted each floppy ear in my hands, those crazy ears that had caused him so many problems over the years and cost us a king's ransom, and felt their weight. I pulled his lip up and looked at his lousy, worn-out teeth. I picked up a front paw and cupped it in my hand. Then I dropped my forehead against his and sat there for a long time, as if I could telegraph a message through our two skulls, from my brain to his. I wanted to make him understand some things. You know all that stuff we've always said about you? What a total pain you are? Don't believe it. Don't believe it for a minute, Marley. He needed to know that, and something more, too. There was something I had never told him, that no one ever had. I wanted him to hear it before he went. Marley, I said, you are a great dog. I found the doctor waiting at the front counter. I'm ready, I said. My voice was cracking, which surprised me because I had really believed I'd braced myself months earlier for this moment. I knew if I said another word, I would break down, and so I just nodded and signed as she handed me release forms. When the paperwork was completed, I followed her back to the unconscious Marley, and I knelt in front of him again, my hands cradling his head as she prepared a syringe and inserted it into the shunt. Are you okay? she asked. I nodded, and she pushed the plunger. His jaw shuddered ever so slightly. She listened to his heart and said it had slowed way down, but not stopped. He was a big dog. She prepared a second syringe and again pushed the plunger. A minute later, she listened again and said, He's gone. She left me alone with him, and I gently lifted one of his eyelids. She was right. Marley was gone. I walked out to the front desk and paid the bill. A few minutes later, she and an assistant wheeled out a cart with a large black bag on it and helped me lift it into the back seat. The doctor shook my hand, told me how sorry she was, 
She had done her best, she said. It was his time, I said, then thanked her and drove away. In the car on the way home, I started to cry, something I almost never do, not even at funerals. It only lasted a few minutes. By the time I pulled into the driveway, I was dry-eyed again. I left Marley in the car and went inside where Jenny was sitting up waiting. The children were all in bed asleep. We would tell them in the morning. We fell into each other's arms and both started weeping. Later, we went outside and together lifted the heavy black bag out of the car and into the garden cart, which I rolled into the garage for the night. Chapter 28 Beneath the Cherry Trees Sleep came fitfully that night, and an hour before dawn I slid out of bed and dressed quietly so as not to wake Jenny. In the kitchen I drank a glass of water, coffee could wait, and walked out into a light slushy drizzle. I grabbed a shovel and pickaxe and walked to the pea patch, which hugged the white pines where Marley had sought potty refuge the previous winter. It was here I had decided to lay him to rest. The temperature was in the mid-thirties and the ground blessedly unfrozen. In the half-dark, I began to dig. At the forty-five-minute mark, I struck water. The hole began to fill and fill. Despite the work I had invested in it, my heart was pounding like I had just run a marathon. I abandoned the location and scouted the yard, stopping where the lawn meets the woods at the bottom of the hill. Between two big native cherry trees, their branches arching above me in the gray light of dawn like an open-air cathedral, I sunk my shovel. These were the same trees Marley and I had narrowly missed on our wild toboggan ride, and I said out loud, This feels right. Digging went easily, and I soon had a novel hole, roughly two by three feet around and four feet deep. I went inside and found all three kids up, sniffling quietly. Jenny had just told them. Seeing them grieving, their first up-close experience with death deeply affected me. I told them it was okay to cry, and that owning a dog always ended with this sadness, because dogs just don't live as long as people do. I told them how Marley was sleeping when they gave him the shot, and that he didn't feel a thing. He just drifted off and was gone. Colleen was upset that she didn't have a chance to say a real goodbye to him. She thought he would be coming home. I told her I had said goodbye for all of us. Connor, our budding author, showed me something he had made for Marley to go in the grave with him. It was a drawing of a big red heart beneath which he had written. To Marley, I hope you know how much I loved you all my life. You were always there when I needed you. Through life or death, I will always love you. Your brother, Connor Richard Grogan. Then Colleen drew a picture of a girl with a big yellow dog, and beneath it, with spelling help from her brother, she wrote, P.S. I will never forget you. I went out alone and wheeled Marley's body down the hill, where I cut an armful of soft pine boughs that I laid on the floor of the hull. I lifted the heavy body bag off the cart and down into the hole as gently as I could, though there was really no graceful way to do it. I got into the hull, opened the bag to see him one last time, and positioned him in a comfortable, natural way, just as he might be lying in front of the fireplace, curled up, head tucked around to his side. Okay, big guy, this is it, I said. I closed the bag up and returned to the house to get Jenny and the kids. As a family, we walked down to the grave. Connor and Colleen had sealed their notes back to back in a plastic bag, and I placed it right beside Marley's head. Patrick used his jackknife to cut five pine boughs, one for each of us. One by one, we dropped them in the hole, their scent rising around us. We paused for a moment, then all together, as if we had rehearsed it, said, Marley, we love you. 
I picked up the shovel and tossed the first scoop of dirt in. It slapped heavily on the plastic, making an ugly sound, and Jenny began to weep. I kept shoveling. The kid stood watching in silence. When the hole was half filled, I took a break and we all walked up to the house where we sat around the kitchen table and told funny Marley stories. One minute tears were welling in our eyes, the next we were laughing. We described all the things he had destroyed and the thousands of dollars he had cost us. We could laugh about it now. To make the kids feel better, I told them something I did not quite believe. Marley's spirit is up in dog heaven now, I said. He's in a giant golden meadow, running free, and his hips are good again, and his hearing is back, and his eyesight is sharp, and he has all his teeth. He's back in his prime, chasing rabbits all day long, Jenny added, and having endless screen doors to crash through. The image of him barging his way oafishly through heaven got a laugh out of everyone. The morning was slipping away, and I still needed to go to work. I went back down to his grave alone and finished filling the hole, gently, respectfully, using my boot to tamp down the loose earth. When the hole was flush with the ground, I placed two large rocks from the woods on top of it, then went inside, took a hot shower, and drove to the office. In the days immediately after we buried Marley, the whole family went silent. The animal that was the amusing target of so many hours of conversation and stories over the years had become a taboo topic. We were trying to return our lives to normal, and speaking of him only made it harder. Colleen in particular could not bear to hear his name or see his photo. Tears would well in her eyes, and she would clench her fist and say angrily, I don't want to talk about him. I resumed my schedule, driving to work, writing my column, coming home again. Every night for 13 years he had waited for me at the door. Walking in now at the end of the day, was the most painful part of all. One morning I went to put my shoes on, and inside them, covering the insoles, lay a carpet of marley fur, picked up by my socks from walking on the floors, and gradually deposited inside the shoes. I just sat and looked at it, actually petted it with my two fingers, and smiled. I held it up to show Jenny and said, We're not getting rid of him that easy. She laughed, but that evening in our bedroom, Jenny, who had not said much all week, blurted out, I miss him. I mean, I really, really miss him. I ache inside miss him. I know, I said. I do, too. I wanted to write a farewell column to Marley, but I was afraid all my emotion would pour out into a gushy, maudlin piece of self-indulgence that would only humiliate me. I knew I wanted to portray him as he was and not as some impossibly perfect reincarnation of old Yeller or Rin Tin Tin, as if there were any danger of that. So many people remake their pets in death, turning them into supernatural, noble beasts that in life did everything for their masters except fry eggs for breakfast. I wanted to be honest. Marley was a funny, bigger-than-life, pain-in-the-ass who never quite got the hang of the whole chain-of-command thing. Honestly, he might well have been the world's worst-behaved dog, yet he intuitively grasped from the start what it meant to be man's best friend. During the week after his death, I walked around with a dull ache inside. It was actually physical, not unlike a stomach virus. I was lethargic, unmotivated. I couldn't even muster the energy to indulge my hobbies, playing guitar, woodworking, reading. I felt out of sorts, not sure what to do with myself. I ended up going to bed early most nights, at 9.30, 10 o'clock. That weekend, I took a long walk through the woods, and by the time I arrived at work on Monday, I knew what I wanted to say about the dog that touched my life the one I would never forget. 
I began the column by describing my walk down the hill with the shovel at dawn, and how odd it was to be outdoors without Marley, who for thirteen years had made it his business to be at my side for any excursion. And now, here I was alone, I wrote, digging him this hole. I gave a lot of thought to how I should describe him, and this is what I settled on. No one ever called him a great dog, or even a good dog. He was as wild as a banshee and as strong as a bull. He crashed joyously through life with a gusto most often associated with natural disasters. He's the only dog I've ever known to get expelled from obedience school. I continued, Marley was a chewer of couches, a slasher of screens, a slinger of drool, a tipper of trash cans. As for brains, let me just say, he chased his tail till the day he died, apparently convinced he was on the verge of a major canine breakthrough. There was more to him than that, however, and I described his intuition and empathy, his gentleness with children, his pure heart. What I really wanted to say was how this animal had touched our souls and taught us some of the most important lessons of our lives. A person can learn a lot from a dog, even a loopy one like ours, I wrote. Marley taught me about living each day with unbridled exuberance and joy, about seizing the moment and following your heart. He taught me to appreciate the simple things, a walk in the woods, a fresh snowfall, a nap in a shaft of winter sunlight. And as he grew old and achy, he taught me about optimism in the face of adversity. Mostly, he taught me about friendship and selflessness and, above all else, unwavering loyalty. It was an amazing concept that I was only now, in the wake of his death, fully absorbing. Marley as mentor, as teacher and role model. Was it possible for a dog any dog, but especially a nutty, wildly uncontrollable one like ours, to point humans to the things that really mattered in life? I believed it was. Loyalty, courage, devotion, simplicity, joy, and the things that did not matter, too. A dog has no use for fancy cars or big homes or designer clothes. Status symbols mean nothing to him. A waterlogged stick will do just fine. A dog judges others not by their color or creed or class, but by who they are inside. A dog doesn't care if you are rich or poor, educated or illiterate, clever or dull. Give him your heart, and he will give you his. It was really quite simple. And yet we humans, so much wiser and more sophisticated, have always had trouble figuring out what really counts and what does not. As I wrote that farewell column to Marley, I realized it was all right there in front of us, if only we opened our eyes. Sometimes it took a dog with bad breath, worse manners, and pure intentions to help us see. I finished my column turned it in to my editor, and drove home for the night, feeling somehow lighter, almost buoyant, as though a weight I did not even know I had been carrying was lifted from me. Chapter 29 The Bad Dog Club When I arrived at work the next morning, the red message light on my telephone was blinking. I punched in my access code and received a recorded warning I had never heard before. Your mailbox is full, the voice said. Please delete all unneeded messages. I logged onto my computer and opened my email. Same story. The opening screen was filled with new messages, and so was the next screen, and the one after that, and after that too. The morning email was a ritual for me a visceral, if inexact, barometer of the impact that day's column had made. Some columns brought as few as five or ten responses, and on those days I knew I had not connected. Others brought several dozen, a good day. A few brought even more. 
but this morning there were hundreds, far more than anything I had received before. The headers at the top of the email said things like, deepest condolences, about your loss, or simply, Marley. Animal lovers are a special breed of human, generous of spirit, full of empathy, perhaps a little prone to sentimentality, and with hearts as big as a cloudless sky. Most who wrote and called simply wanted to express their sympathies, to tell me they too had been down this road and knew what my family was going through. Others had dogs whose lives were drawing to their inevitable ends. They dreaded what they knew was coming, just as we had dreaded it, too. One couple wrote, We fully understand, and we mourn for your loss of Marley, and for our loss of Rusty. They'll always be missed, never truly replaced. From Connie, It's just the most amazing thing to love a dog, isn't it? It makes our relationships with people seem as boring as a bowl of oatmeal. When the messages finally stopped coming several days later, I counted them up. Nearly 800 people, animal lovers all, had been moved to contact me. It was an incredible outpouring, and what a catharsis it was for me. By the time I had plowed through them all and answered as many as I could, I felt better as though I was part of a giant cyber support group. My private morning had become a public therapy session, and in this crowd there was no shame in admitting a real, piercing grief for something as seemingly inconsequential as an old, smelly dog. My correspondents wrote and called for another reason, too. They wanted to dispute the central premise of my report, the part in which I insisted Marley was the world's worst-behaved animal. Excuse me, the typical response went, but yours couldn't have been the world's worst dog, because mine was. To make their case, they regaled me with detailed accounts of their pet's woeful behavior. I heard about shredded curtains, stolen lingerie, devoured birthday cakes, trashed auto interiors, great escapes, even a swallowed diamond engagement ring, which made Marley's taste for gold chains seem positively lowbrow by comparison. My inbox resembled a television talk show, bad dogs and the people who love them, with the willing victims lining up to proudly brag, not about how wonderful their dogs were, but about just how awful. Oddly enough, most of the horror stories involved large, loopy retrievers, just like mine. We weren't alone after all. Larry the Lab swallowed his mistress's bra and then burped it up in one piece ten days later. Gypsy, another Lab with adventurous taste, devoured a jealousy window. Jason, a retriever Irish setter mix, downed a five-foot vacuum cleaner hose interior reinforcing wire and all, his owner Mike reported, adding, But I loved that beast. Phoebe, a lab mix, was kicked out of two different boarding kennels and told never to return, owner Amy wrote. It seems she was the gang leader in breaking out of not only her cage, but doing the favor for two other dogs, too. They then helped themselves to all kinds of snacks during the overnight hours. Tim reported his yellow lab, Ralph, was every bit as much a food thief as Marley, only smarter. One day before going out, Tim placed a large chocolate centerpiece on top of the refrigerator where it would be safely out of Ralph's reach. The dog, his owner reported, pawed open the cupboard drawers, then used them as stairs to climb onto the counter where he could balance on his hind legs and reach the chocolate which was gone without a trace when his master returned home. Despite the chocolate overdose, Ralph showed no ill effects. Another time, Tim wrote, Ralph opened the refrigerator and emptied its contents, including things in jars. Nancy clipped my column to save because Marley reminded her so much of her retriever, Gracie. I left the article on the kitchen table and turned to put away the scissors, Nancy wrote. When I turned back, sure enough, Gracie had eaten the column. Wow, I was feeling better by the minute. 
Marley no longer sounded all that terrible. If nothing else, he certainly had plenty of company in the Bad Dog Club. I brought several of the messages home to share with Jenny, who laughed for the first time since Marley's death. My new friends in the secret brotherhood of dysfunctional dog owners had helped us more than they ever would know. The days turned into weeks, and winter melted into spring. Daffodils pushed up through the earth and bloomed around Marley's grave. Gradually, life without our dog became more comfortable. Days would float by without me even thinking of him, and then some little cue, one of his hairs on my sweater, the rattle of his choker chain as I reached into my drawer for a pair of socks, would bring him abruptly back. As time passed, the recollections were more pleasant than painful. Long-forgotten moments flashed in my head with vivid clarity, like clips being rerun from old home videos. The way Lisa, the stabbing victim, had leaned over and kissed Marley on the snout after she got out of the hospital. The way he held mangoes in his front paws as he nibbled out the flesh. The way he snapped at the baby's diapers with that look of narcotic bliss on his face. Little moments hardly worth remembering. And yet, here they were, randomly playing out on my mental movie screen at the least likely times and places. Most of them made me smile. A few made me bite my lip and pause. He was a central player in some of the happiest chapters of our lives. Chapters of young love and new beginnings, of budding careers and tiny babies, of heady successes and crushing disappointments, of discovery and freedom and self-realization. He came into our lives just as we were trying to figure out what they would become. He joined us as we grappled with what every couple must eventually confront, the sometimes painful process of forging from two distinct pasts one shared future. He became part of our melded fabric, a tightly woven and inseparable strand in the weave that was us. Just as we had helped shape him into the family pet he would become, he helped to shape us as well, as a couple, as parents, as animal lovers, as adults. Despite everything, all the disappointments and unmet expectations, Marley had given us a gift at once priceless and free. He taught us the art of unqualified love how to give it, how to accept it. Where there is that, most of the other pieces fall into place. No doubt about it, life without a dog was easier and immensely simpler. We could take a weekend jaunt without arranging boarding. We could go out to dinner without worrying what family heirloom was in jeopardy. The kids could eat without having to guard their plates. The trash can didn't have to go up on the kitchen counter when we left. Once again, we could sit back and enjoy in peace the wondrous show of a good lightning storm. I especially liked the freedom of moving around the house without a giant yellow magnet glued to my heels. Still, as a family, we were not quite whole. One morning in late summer, I came down for breakfast and Jenny handed me a section of the newspaper folded over to expose an inside page. You're not going to believe this, she said. Once a week, our local paper featured a dog from a rescue shelter that needed a home. The profile always featured a photograph of the dog, its name, and a brief description, written as if the dog were speaking in the first person, making its own best case. It was a gimmick the shelter people used to make the animals seem charming and adorable. We always found the doggy resumes amusing, if for no other reason than the effort made to put the best shine on unwanted animals that had already struck out at least once. On this day, staring up from the page at me was a face I instantly recognized. Our Marley. Or at least a dog that could have been his identical twin. He was a big male yellow lab with an anvil head, 
furrowed brow and floppy ears cocked back at a comical angle. He stared directly into the camera lens with a quivering intensity that made you just know that seconds after the picture was snapped, he had knocked the photographer to the ground and tried to swallow the camera. Beneath the photo was the name Lucky. I read his sales pitch aloud. Full of zip, I would do well in a home that is quiet while I am learning how to control my energy level. I have not had an easy life, so my new family will need to be patient with me and continue to teach me my doggy manners. My God, I exclaimed, it's him. He's back from the dead. Reincarnation, Jenny said. Full of zip? Problem controlling energy? Working on doggy manners? Patience required? We were well familiar with those euphemisms, having used them ourselves. Our mentally unbalanced dog was back, young and strong again, and wilder than ever. We both stood there staring at the newspaper, not saying anything. I guess we could go look at him, I finally said. Just for the fun of it, Jenny added. Right, just out of curiosity. What's the harm of looking? No harm at all, I agreed. Well then, she said, why not? What do we have to lose? Hello, this is Cherry Jones, Tony Award-winning actress and narrator of The Little House on the Prairie audiobooks. As an audiobook listener, you know the pleasure of being captivated by a well-told story. You may not know that children who listen to audiobooks enjoy academic benefits as well. Hearing stories read aloud helps children reinforce important fundamental elements of reading readiness and reading comprehension, two key elements of overall success in school. When children listen to recorded stories, they hear and learn new vocabulary, and they practice active listening skills. Children can also listen up. Advanced readers can find challenging and complex stories, Delayed readers can listen and enjoy the story as a whole before breaking it down into smaller pieces. For all children, hearing a good book encourages a lifelong love of literature and reading. So, when you consider what to listen to next, why not also think about the pint-sized listeners in your life and select from one of the many available children's audiobooks? We hope you've enjoyed this program from Harper Audio. To order additional cassettes or CDs, or to receive a complete catalog of Harper Audio and Cadman titles, please call us at 1-800-331-3761. You might also try our website, www.harperaudio.com. Thank you.